half miles. They're being blocked. People can't get from here to there, so they're just having to walk around trying to find a way out of this place because of all the, uh, the road blockages because of the emergency situation over here on this side of the river. And of course, uh, it's a situation where Metro is still running, but uh, airports are closed, all airports around the country. And also there has been a considerable rush hour as much of the government has shut down and people have left the city. Sam, we have breaking news though. We want to interrupt you for just a minute. The National Guard, Troop 372 out of the district, please report to duty. Your services are sorely needed. We also have information about a United flight that has been missing. We understand it has now crashed. We do not know there. We do not know where, rather. United has just confirmed that for us, though. And we understand that, obviously, thousands of you in the area are waiting for your loved ones to come home. We want to bring you up to date on what's going on with the transportation situation. First of all, all train service in and out of Union Station has been suspended until further notice. Also, we are receiving reports that people are making their way out of the district. And at this point, it's safe to say that all of the roads leading out were in, in one of those situations where it's sort of like the rush hour during one of the winter snows where all of the lanes are being directed out of the city. Sometimes at some intersections, police are ordering the traffic to continue on, but yeah, at other intersections, effect. we are telling you to remain calm because that is about the only way that everyone will get to and from. We want to check in right now with ABC 7 News, Nancy Weiner with more on the transportation situation. Nancy? Good morning, Dell. Well, we have been here at the corner of Independence Avenue at the Ellipse for many hours now, and for most of the time, the traffic has looked like this, basically at a standstill in both directions. Right now, you do see a little bit of traffic moving in the westbound direction, but traffic been very, very heavy for hours. I want to take you on a little tour of our location. The Ellipse has been closed for about the past hour and a half. When Secret Service showed up, we saw a number of officers showed up. They donned flat jackets, and they told everyone who was standing on the ellipse to get off of it. Oh, past us, you can see the White House, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it from our cameras, but there has been a vastly noted increase in security on the White House grounds, both on the South Lawn and on the roof of the White House. Now, when this all first happened, hundreds of people began gathering on the ellipse, both tourists and people who had been evacuated from their buildings. They were coming up to ask us, asking us if we knew what was going on. And at times, dozens of people were actually gathered around our monitors. As you can imagine, a lot of tourists here on the mall, a number of people we spoke to who are from New York City, who wanted to know what was going on with their loved ones there. Now, as far as traffic is concerned, we do have some information to tell you about if you are trying to get out of town. Right now, the 14th Street Bridge is closed, and afternoon traffic batters have... All, all inbound bridges are closed, and outbound are open. That is the latest information that we are getting right now. Of course, there is a, a, quite, a number of, quite a lot of people trying to get out of the district right now. What we can also tell you is that there is an afternoon traffic pattern in effect on the Rock Creek Parkway, which means that all lanes are going northbound. D.C. police right now are suggesting that people who want to get out of town take the southeast-southwest freeway. Canal Road also one way outbound right now. And as I said, the inbound lanes on bridges are closed. Outbound is open. And as you mentioned, Union Station is closed as well. And of course, 395 near the Pentagon closed also. That's the latest from here, reporting live from the Ellipse. I'm Nancy Weiner, ABC 7 News. Nancy, we also want to uh, thank you very much, but we also want to remind our audience that there is something you can do. We have received word from several area hospitals now, and indeed the Red Cross, that they are concerned now about blood shortages. So if you want to do something, if you feel like you're helpless at home, and you want to know what can I do besides watch television, you can go out and you can donate blood at this point, because obviously, based on the simple numbers alone, there are 20,000 people who work in Inside the Pentagon, casualties could be, and, and I emphasize once again at this point, could be large. And another uh, breaking news to tell you about all federal offices are now closed, federal courthouses rather, are closed, and offices in Virginia, in Delaware, in Maryland, in Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Also, word from D.C. police do not call 911 in the city. Do not call 911. They are overloaded. The number to call right now, 311. Number of schools also closed down in our area. Let's go to Greta Cruz in our newsroom now. Okay, thank you very much, Carol and Dell. 
Uh, before we get to the schools, I just want to mention something. Nancy Weiner was talking about transportation. As far as metro goes, we are told the metro, the subways are running. However, the following stations are closed. Pentagon Station, Union Station, and the National Airport stations are closed. Uh, the trains are running through, but they're not stopping. Also, the yellow line from Huntington is switching routes to run through Arlington Cemetery out to the stadium armory. As for the bus ser service on Metro, we are told it is running, but of course traffic is clogged as people try to get out of the city, so there are delays and it is a mess. Let's get on to the schools now. These keep changing. We do have them that we can run down for you. Uh, here we go. Par uh, Arlington County Public Schools are open. However, if parents want to pick their kids up early, they may go to the school and do so. Prince George's County Public Schools will be closing two hours early today. D.C. Public Schools are open. However, the officials have asked parents to please try and go pick up your children as soon as possible. Montgomery County Schools closing one and a half hours early. Edison Friendship Public Charter School closing at 1230. Charles County Public Schools are open. Closing normal times, Loudoun County the same, and Alexandria schools also open as well. As moving on now to university closings, American University is closed. The University of Maryland College Park is open. However, the University College campus is closed. George Washington University is closed. Catholic University is closed. UDC is closed. Georgetown Law School, we are told, is now closed. And that is it as far as we have. These things will be changing throughout the day. A number of the schools I should mention, even though they are still open, the public schools, they have canceled evening and afternoon activities. So you will want to check with that. Yeah, and I can Thank imagine you, many parents want their kids out of schools, but absolutely calm is the word of the day right now. Right. Thank you, Greta. And we want to also bring you up to date and to give you that number again from American Airlines. Undoubtedly, many of you are at home. You're watching and you're wondering about the loved ones who may have been on one of those flights. This is the information number that American Airlines has given out. It is 1-800-245-0999. We know of four planes that appear to have been involved at this point in this terrorist attack. One was an American Airlines Flight 11, a Boeing 767 from Boston to LA. The flight had 81 passengers on board, nine flight attendants, and two pilots. Also involved was Flight 77, that is a Boeing 757, that operated here out of Washington Dulles to Los Angeles with 58 passengers on board, four flight attendants, and two pilots. That's 156 people on board those two planes. Yeah, the others involved are United Flights, United, uh, United Flight 43 going from Newark to San Francisco, also United Flight 175. Boston to L.A., we believe that uh, that has now crashed, but we do not know where. And, of course, there's a fifth plane involved that crashed into the Pentagon, a smaller plane. We have ABC7 news crews out throughout the region. We are efforting information on the situation at local hospitals. We are efforting the information that is unfolding at the Pentagon and also with regards to the national security of Washington, D.C. itself. As that information becomes available, we will re-interrupt ABC News. But right now, back to ABC News and Peter Jennings. Engaged in a war now with the, with the Israeli government uh, has also... Uh, reacted very quickly to this today to express. Uh, I, to be honest, I haven't heard what he said, but so let's hear what he said now. This is the Palestinian president, Yasser Arafat. First of all, I am offering my con condolences, the condolences of uh, the Palestinian people to the uh, to the American president, uh, President Bush, to his government. To the American people for this terrible act. We are completely shocked, completely shocked. Unbelievable. Now, that's the Palestinian president, chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, Yasser Arafat, who, as I think everybody who watches the news or reads the news these days understands, is in a a, 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 a very, very bitter war with the Israelis um, and in, in which uh, terrorism uh, has been a factor. Palestinians see what the Israelis do to them as terrorism. Certainly the Israelis and much of the world see the Palestinian and other suicide bombers who've attacked inside Israel uh, to be terrorism of the most gruesome order. No question about that. And so we should not be surprised, as on previous circumstances, to see Chairman Arafat um, expressing his condolences, but other Palestinians 
who believe the United States is responsible for what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, or at least complicit, and is certainly supplying the Israelis' arms, will be happy to see this attack on the United States today. So take a look at a scene from Jerusalem not too long ago in which there is some celebration that the powerful United States has been harmed, has been seen to be vulnerable, has been hurt, I suppose, in the broadest sense of the word. And, and the people who go off to do this sort of thing, both in the Middle East now, you must remember that a vast majority of the, uh, vast majority of the population of the Middle East now in, in all countries is under 21, much of it under 15, certainly under 17, and, and the kind of tensity and intention, if one presumes this, this terrorism, one shouldn't, this terrorism has come, had its genesis or had its root somewhere in the Middle East, um, or at least in people who are opposed, uh, have, uh, have, uh, are just filled, brimming, brimming with anger at the United States. And we are now becoming more experienced with the notion that there are young men, for the most part, uh, who are prepared to uh, blow themselves up along with everybody else in terms if they can be if they can be a service to the cause and it, it, it and and they believe and they believe as to some people believe about Islam that they will by sacrificing themselves go on to another place it's an unfair comment on Islam uh, in some in, in some respects but it is certainly a motivating factor the, the hatred of the United States and the hatred of the United States is a patron of Israel. Whether you're, from, whether you're from Afghanistan or whether you're from Iran, Iraq, or inside the Palestinian territories, it's so intense at some levels and has become more intense in recent months that nobody will be, a great many people will not be surprised at this attack today, though, like everybody else, will be amazed at the magnitude and success of it. John McCarthy at the Pentagon. John. Peter, we are uh, standing outside the Pentagon at this point. It has been already a long morning for rescue workers and police here. Uh, one eyewitness I talked to who was on this busy highway outside the Pentagon this morning said he saw an airplane coming directly over his head. It was an American Airlines plane. He could see the number on the plane. He could almost see the passengers inside as it went along the highway, started clipping off the uh, high wires and the different light poles along the highway and slammed directly into the side of the Pentagon. As we said earlier, Peter, the aircraft penetrated deep inside the Pentagon. It is uh, organized in rings from the E ring on the outside. It penetrated all the way into the A ring in the inner part of the Pentagon. Uh, after it burned for a number of minutes, a part of the building collapsed. By the time rescue workers could get in there, the destruction was just terrific. So John, do you have any sense of the casualties? Uh, we don't have any sense, Peter, except the size of the medical operation that has been set up here is enormous. Uh, they are anticipating the casualties. Certainly the injured will be in the hundreds. Uh, I certainly don't want to speculate on those killed. And John, it, it, it's a little hard to get, to, to get a sense of the size sometimes for the picture. Can you describe maybe in feet or in yards how big a, how big a penetration this is? The roof has collapsed, Peter. There is a chasm in the side of the Pentagon that is probably 200 or 300 feet across. Um, from the roof of the Pentagon, there is this huge V shape that has collapsed. You can see deep inside the Pentagon from the street now. This is into the inner courtyard of the Pentagon itself. It's in the innermost ring of the Pentagon, Peter. Uh, I have not been able to get into the courtyard, but I was told that the penetration was all the way into the deepest ring of the Pentagon. And, John, it, it, the office building, the Pentagon, is about, what, six stories high? It's uh, five stories mm -hmm. above ground, Peter, and several stories below. Uh, clearly, the damage uh, is primarily above ground, but also some of those in the lower offices. I was sitting in the Pentagon when the uh, attack happened. I was on the opposite side of the building. It shook the entire building. It was very clear that something terrible had happened. Uh, there was chaos immediately after the attack, Peter. Secretary of Defense, I walked out with the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, the Marine Corps Commandant couldn't get out the door because security had locked it. Uh, it was chaos. Okay, John, thank and the fires are still, are still burning at the moment, we believe? They are still burning. They are mostly oil fires, it appears, Peter. 
Uh, the fire hoses have been on the, uh, the various fires for the last several hours, so they're beginning to put them out, but obviously there is still heavy gray smoke coming out of that portion of the Pentagon that was so terribly damaged. John, there are a couple of aircraft at least around the country today which are still unaccounted for. You gave a very clear description earlier of how this aircraft had approached the Pentagon, but did anybody able to identify it as an aircraft associated with an airline? Absolutely, Peter. The eyewitness I talked to looked up and said it was an American Airlines plane. I saw it clear as could be. It went right over the top of my car and clipped a pole right in front of where my car was. Thank you very much, John McCarthy. I actually think that you may have said that earlier, and I simply, I, I simply lost it in terms, uh, just lost it. And so we now know that it was from at least one eyewitness there. It was an American Airlines aircraft, which which, uh, which crashed into the Pentagon. So we, let me just bring you, try to get some grasp on the airplane. We have two United flights, a 757, which was on its way from New York to San Francisco, which crashed um, near Pittsburgh. We have a United flight, which crashed from Boston to Los Angeles, United 175. And we do not know where that aircraft has crashed or been crashed as of now. And we have these two American flights, uh, one from Boston to Los Angeles, um, which is a 767 with 81 passengers and 11 crew on board, talking about almost 100 people on American Flight 11. And American Flight 77, which was, which was scheduled from Washington to Los Angeles, uh, with 58 passengers and six crew members on board. And John Miller and I have been sitting here looking at each other about where these flights were going. And there's several ways to speculate about it, but you came up with one very interesting on from a, from a forensic standpoint if you if you look operationally uh, to, to crash these flights it would have been just as simple to get on the the Washington shuttle or the New York shuttle mm -hmm. and crash one into the Trade Center and the other in the Pentagon the choice of flights here Newark to San Francisco Boston to LA Dulles to LA uh, excuse me John I apologize let me get to come back just because we have the New York governor here sure governor George Pataki the governor of New York I believe is on the telephone or somewhere governor Pataki do you hear me yes Peter I hear you fine well why don't you first start off sir and give us your appraisal of the day so well far. it's just uh, it's just a horrific scene and uh, everybody's pulling together we're activating the state emergency forces but uh, our hearts and prayers are with uh, the victims and the families of those victims and we have to, at this point, just focus on trying to help as many people whose lives are at risk as possible and dealing with those who have been injured. Do you have some sense of the magnitude of casualties? Uh, we don't want to quantify a number, but obviously it's a horrific incident that, uh, uh, that really is, is just an, a, an incredible outrage against the people of New York and the people of America. Uh, but uh, at this point, our focus is on trying to make sure that those whose lives are still at risk are as protected and those who have been injured are treated as quickly and as well as possible. Governor, do you believe that thousands of people have been killed? Uh, I don't want to use a number, Peter. At this point, the goal is, uh, is simply to try to help as many people as possible. We're working closely with the city, with our National Guard forces coming in to help relieve the, the city police and fire. Uh, obviously, it's a situation that uh, just cries out for uh, people to, to be horrified. And uh, But what we have to do at this point is focus on uh, helping those who are at risk, helping those who have been injured, making sure there's an orderly removal from lower Manhattan. And, and that is our focus at this point. Governor, have you, have you, are you in a position to go to the scene? Are you in a position to go to lower Manhattan? Do you think you should? Would you like to? Uh, or are you, are you locked down? No, I'm, a, I'm in the city, uh, but the important thing is to be able to stay in contact with the White House, with City Hall, with our statewide emergency services. We've gotten uh, offers of support from all the surrounding states with their emergency services, and uh, the critical thing right now is to be able to coordinate to make sure that the response is the strongest and the, the most compassionate it can be for the people whose lives are still at risk. And we're mobilizing National Guard units from across the state. We're getting help from the surrounding states and coordinating with the city, and that's what, we're do that's what we have to do at this point. And Governor, what have you done? about the other so-called high-profile target potential targets in New York City like the UN and the bridges and things like uh, this are they all locked are they all evacuated uh, and locked down UN, now? UN's evacuated the tunnels have been closed the the, the uh, George Washington bridge is open under security for emergency services coming in and uh, people going out we've shut down most of the mass transit Grand Central is open under very tight security but people who pass through the security are uh, have limited service to the to the northern suburbs and we're doing 
doing the same thing on Long Island. But uh, the important thing now is to provide as much help as quickly and as effectively to those whose lives are at risk or those who have been injured. And we're working with the city and the federal officials to make sure that happens. Do you believe that New York City is now under control? New York City has been under attack. Uh, and until we get through this, uh, we just have to continue to respond as, as strongly as we can. And are you in a, in, a, in a profile now? Are you in a position where you actually think there's, there's a potential for more? Uh, we just don't know. That's why we have to not only help those who have been injured, but also take every security step we can to try to prevent further incidents. We just don't know, Peter. Okay. Governor Pataki, thank you very much. Governor George Pataki of New York who is in New York City, um, which of course is where he probably belongs at a, at a moment like this. Downtown Manhattan is saying simply that the National Guard has been called in, the tunnels are closed, the George Washington Bridge, which is across, uh, which goes across the Hudson River um, from, uh, from the west side of Manhattan into New Jersey. Just remember a large segment of the, or large, many thousands of people from New Jersey work in New York and there's tremendous commerce back and forth on a daily basis. That has all been brought to a help. It's interesting to recall, John Miller, that the attack on the Trade Towers in 93 was launched from New Jersey, or at least the operational headquarters of the people who attacked the Trade Center were in New Jersey. Correct. Uh, and the, uh, the building of the bomb and uh, the original conspiracy was all carried out in towns right across the river. In mm -hmm. fact, the conspirators uh, later admitted that they watched from New Jersey to see if the buildings would in fact fall, and they didn't. They this did. time they did. They did today. And Governor Pataki trying, as politicians again must on occasions like this, trying to express uh, the horror and the commitment that the political establishment feels to those people who have died and those people who need to be rescued. You know, it's an answer to every question about whether or not something was locked down or something. He came back every time that their priority now is to try to help those people who are in, deep, in some cases still desperate trouble. Uh, George Stephanopoulos. Um, one of our senior reporters is downtown. Hey, George, where have you been? What have you seen? What do you think? Well, Peter, I'm going to give you kind of a pool report from several of our correspondents down here of basically what happened down here in downtown New York between 9.45 and 10.45 when the two explosions and the collapse of the World Trade Center happened. Uh, at the time, I was actually in the subway heading towards the World Trade Center right around Franklin Street, and after the first explosion, the subway station started to fill with smoke. The subway cars started to fill with smoke, and the subways actually stopped. Uh, they then diverted us around the World Trade Center to Park Place, which is one, one stop beyond the World Trade Center. We, we got to that train station at around 1035, Peter, and it was a scene unlike I've ever seen before in my entire life. As we tried to get out of the subway station and walk up into the street, it was pitch black, midnight black, snowing soot all down through downtown Manhattan. This was about two blocks from the World Trade Center. You couldn't see a foot in front of your face at that time. We then worked our way back uptown. All of the firefighters and police officials and National Guard are now evacuating everyone out of lower, lower Manhattan. They're going east towards Brooklyn and north, which is where we are now, up on Canal Street. I should add as well, Peter, we had one of our reporters was, down, was downtown and had a, a sight line of the World Trade Center around 948, which is around the time I believe the first tower collapsed, Gloria Rivera, and she saw two, then three, then four people jump out of the top floors of the World Trade Center. She was with a firefighter who said, they're not falling, they're jumping. Watch their arms waving, and they counted a dozen people jump off the top floors. Uh, do you want to continue, George? Well, I've just right now, they, as I said, they are evacuating everyone else out. But just to give you another sense, Peter, the, all over lower Manhattan, the, the sidewalks, the streets are covered with about a quarter to half inch of dust, of soot, uh, as if it were Pompeii. Most people are pretty calm right now. They're evacuating slowly as the firefighters come in. Um, but, but it really was one of the most frightening, horrific scenes I've ever seen uh, in my life. Thanks, George, very much. Uh, come back any time with a report. I just, as you were concluding there, watching these guys go up that escalator, and if it's in the World Trade Center, we assume that we know that their cameraman got out, but we don't know about anybody else because, uh, you know, within an hour and something of the time these two attacks had occurred, these two buildings had completely disappeared, and you begin increasingly to see more dramatic footage. George, George Stephanopoulos made a reference to Pompeii on the 
on the, near Naples on the west coast of Italy, which was, you know, buried by a volcano. Uh, and, and you get exactly that same sense of freezing stuff in soot and dirt, um, as might have occurred by a volcano. Uh, Jim Kalstrom, with whom we're long familiar, former official of the FBI in the New York office, uh, is on the air, very deeply involved in the flight TWA 800 in investigation. Um, Jim, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, what do you think? Peter? I'm listening, Jim. I yes. just say, what do you think? I mean, just start and I'll... Well, uh, my first thought is with the tremendous casualties and the, uh, the death toll is just uh, overwhelming. It's, uh, it's a day that 50 years from now our children, if we're still teaching history, will, will be taught about when uh, we, w we went to war on American soil with terrorism. Uh, Jim, if you had a chance uh, to talk to your more active colleagues in the FBI at the moment about, about what they're doing at the moment, wh whether they're able to, I mean, it seems the hardest thing at the moment is to make an appraisal of all this. It just happened and it's just, in some respects, it's happened and it's happened, right? Uh, Peter, you're right. I mean, it happened. It's shocking, but in some ways it isn't shocking. I mean, we've had, you know, the uh, hatred of America played out uh, at the Trade Center in 93. Uh, they tried to take the Trade Center down. We've mm -hmm. had the hatred played out in the USS Cole, the bombings of our embassies in Africa, the bombings of the barracks in Saudi Arabia. So. Now it's being played out big time here in the United States. Jim, what, 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 is the, what, is the, what is the principal goal of the FBI at a moment like this, when, when all of the emergency services are brought to bear in all of these locations? What's the FBI actually doing at the moment? I think the first concern of the FBI right now, right this second, is, is there going to be something else happening in the next five minutes, 30 minutes, hour, 12 hours? Simultaneous with that, uh, who did it? Uh, where are they? What do we know? What's the intelligence base? Tell us. Why didn't we see this coming? Uh, where do we go from here? What kind of articulate, defined information can we give the National Command Authority so that we can bring the necessary, mm. massive retaliation necessary uh, without a lot of collateral damage? Mm. Well, Jim, it's, thank you very much for checking in with us, and, uh, and please do at any time if you have news. That photo, that, as Jim was talking, Jim Kallstrom, the uh, the former director of the FBI here and a major force in the investigation of TWA 800, uh, which blew up off the south coast of uh, Long Island. Um, and the principal uh, operator in the first uh, World Trade Center bombing. A uh, key investigator. Right. Um, but it's interesting, uh, forgive me, no offense intended him, he doesn't have much to say either today because in some respects there isn't much to say except the, except the horror of it. But as we were looking at just a moment ago, listening to George Stephanopoulos talking to our reporters who saw the, who witnessed the horrifying uh, jump of some people from the top of the trade towers, it was, you just saw a hint of the, of the, just ahead of this little piece of video here before, you saw a hint of what people were enduring at the top of the trade uh, towers before they collapsed as a result of the intensity of the fire. And we've seen it before in other places around the world. Fire starts in a place, people Often, ironically, nothing would have made any difference today. Do the wrong thing, they get trapped in an open window by fire coming into their room, and finally, and finally, they're finally they just jump, uh, simply because the, if they don't jump, they're probably going to be burned, burned alive. Um, but as we have heard from, it's interesting that Governor Pataki is so nervous, and I don't blame him for a second, wanting to stay away from the magnitude of the casualties here today. But as John McKenzie reported from, from the fire department downtown, we got 200 fire department officials, 200 firefighters missing. I don't know whether or not this is a firefighter uh, who's been brought, but you see in every case um, people getting uh, oxygen um, because what uh, it isn't collapse, if it isn't collapse that kills in some cases like this, it is the deadly smoke. Anybody who's been involved in a fire knows the deadly smoke which suffocates people um, in a circumstance like this. But we are only getting touches and it doesn't even have the chaos associated with it in many cases. <clears throat> We're just getting touches now 
of what has happened in these variety of places. The Pentagon are being kept quite logically, I think, back at some distance. Um, and, and in downtown, what's happened is that camera crews were downtown. I fear, to be perfectly honest, for some of the camera crews who work uh, nothing braver than a cameraman either, who goes right in when something has happened and may indeed have been at some of those places. Um, and it certainly takes time for video uh, to get back from a location like this so that we get a you know, widening appreciation of what has happened. Um, but as I said, it's very hard to try to get some grasp now on the, on the number of casualties. So we can do, <clears throat> in some cases, not more than just tell you how this is in terms of the whole country. The North American Air Defense Command, NORAD, um, is on the highest state of alert. And you had just made references earlier in the morning how the United States and, and Canada have cooperated in trying to keep the airports locked down, lest there was another aircraft on the air. But John, talk to me about this for a second, and then we'll come to this business about fuel. Sure. Um, you know, the, the North American Air Defense Command was a great factor in our lives in the 1960s. In the Cold War, yes. Exactly. And during the Cold War, it's up along, it's along, uh, up along the, the Northwest Territories and some of the independent areas of, of the North. Nobody thinks about it anymore, and here it is on a state of alert today. No, but you factor that in, and evincing so many images uh, that Americans are uncomfortable with, the idea that there's a no-fly zone in New York City, in Manhattan, being patrolled by F-16s with instructions to shoot down any errant aircraft, that the same is true in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, that military people um, and doctors and military vehicles are coming to aid, mm -hmm. that the National Guard is uh, on alert. You know, the kind of images that used to only exist in the fantasies of seven days in May, mm -hmm. where, you know, the army would take to the streets, um, which has not happened yet. They've offered assistance mm -hmm. and, and military logistical assistance. But that kind of thing that Americans are so uncomfortable with uh, unfolding here. Uh, and I realize, by the way, just as you mentioned it, <clears throat> something else is very important at the moment. And again, I don't mean to say this in melodramatic terms. Where is the president of the United States? Yeah, the president of the United States led, I know we don't know where he is, but pretty soon the country needs to know where he is. And it seems to, I think, for me anyway, I apologize. Uh, president needs to take nice. He left Florida a couple of hours ago. Um, maybe our people in Washington are clearly listening and, and checking this as, as best they can. But one of the important factors at the moment is that the political leadership in the country um, be present, as Governor Pataki was. Governor uh, Mayor Giuliani of New York you know, made an appearance on the street and was caught on where is everybody else, but Governor Pataki came out and, and basically told the citizenry of New York in a variety of different ways, I assume, just exactly what they're trying to do. Now, here's a, here's a bulletin about the president's whereabouts. The, Bush, the president is about to make a statement at Barksdale Air Force Base shortly. Barksdale Air Force Base is in Louisiana. So, if this is accurate, and we'll check with Claire Shipman and our other reporters at the White House and John Cochran, if he can, in, in Florida at the moment, who's with the president today. The president's not coming back to Washington at the moment. We'll leave that for just a second. We'll talk a little more about this business of the aircraft and the fuel. We're trying to figure out why, or why would a plane going from Newark to San Francisco, Boston, Los Angeles be involved in this? It could have been any plane, though, right? It could have been, but when you consider the advantage to a terrorist, here you have a transnational flight it's going to be a larger aircraft in each case. But, and this is the key, because we had speculated earlier, was there some additional explosives laden in these planes to, to cause these incredibly large explosions? It appears who's ever planned this has picked cross-country flights that would have the maximum amount of fuel you could carry on a domestic flight. Flights going from one end of the country to the other. The kind of jet that if you slammed into a building would ensure the maximum uh, fire and explosion possible from any flight that you could have chosen. Again, Newark to San Francisco, Boston to L.A., Dulles to Los Angeles, uh, Washington to L.A., Boston to L.A. Um, the planes that are being looked at in this, uh, in this attack today mm -hmm. were apparently, or you could speculate, chosen for, to give the terrorists the very biggest bang uh, for their effort. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting point you make because, again, our assumptions tend to go when we see huge explosions like this. None of us understanding visually the power of explosives, that, that there were explosives on board, and so you're quite right. They may indeed have, it may indeed have been the aircraft explosion. I mean, John Nance could help us with this, but when you hear the, the amount of fuel, um, very flammable uh, aeronautical fuel that's loaded onto a plane for a 3,000-mile trip or something, 
um, that's going to give you quite an explosion. Uh, flight 800, which was an international flight, uh, okay. to those who saw it, was an incredible ex explosion. John, if you'd sit, sit at your station for a second, I'm just going to go and try to check one piece of information. And in, the, in that period of time, we're going to try to give you a little better sense of, of, uh, of what's... Of the, of, the, of the disaster at the Trade Towers today. Here, here's something we've compiled, and we compile it as we go along. I was standing next to One World Trade Center, and then all of a sudden I heard rumbling, and we all started running away from it. The glass, like, blew out and threw me onto the sidewalk, and I, I couldn't see for, like, 20 seconds. And then I started seeing vaguely the street and I, I just started walking and I started my eyesight came back I see you're you're bloody you have dust all over you yeah it was bad it was like a dust storm or something like I couldn't see anything how badly are you hurt I have no idea as soon as you got hit I was thrown to a window so I was very lucky to get out there's a lot of people that didn't get out there's a lot of people coming down the stairs burnt up it's, it's, it's bad. So we just come out of Tower One. We're walking towards Broadway. They're saying, move along, move along, move along. I looked up as soon as we got across the street. I looked up. I saw the building start, the tower start to buckle. I just t turned and ran, ducked down, put a jacket over my head. Three or four of us huddled together, and uh, it was just black everywhere. Were you covered? Were you hit with debris? No, 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 no. But I mean, I was ducked behind a subway cover. So I put a, you know, with the jacket over, the three of us, you know, all of us huddled together. There was, you know, dust and whatnot everywhere, but it was... The second building has just come down. The second, everyone's being asked to get down. Come down. Can't even look at it. Because all I can see are people. I don't see a building, I see people. People hurt. Children without mothers and fathers tonight. <laughs> if you're just joining us, you probably already know the World Trade Center towers, the Twin Tower New York landmarks have collapsed and are gone. The Pentagon has been hit by a, a airplane, a series of hijackings apparently today um, at the root of this. What we know is hundreds, if not thousands, are injured. Uh, no count on the deceased yet and that the investigation, a massive investigation, is just beginning to unfold. But John, I, the re I stepped aside there, among other things, the moment to try to get some sort of sense from people who talk to, because as soon as this happens, people begin to think about a response. We don't expect a response to come in, in the immediate future by any means, but I was just talking to Charlie Gibson uh, from Good Morning America, and, and he'd been thinking about the same thing, that the response to this from the United States is going to have to be massive. They have to accomplish something in some way because so much of the response to terrorism before by a large nation such as this, which is not impotent, but very limited in, in its capacity to operate at this kind of level. You were mentioning earlier the attacks against Osama bin Laden's training camps in Afghanistan. In retrospect, they spent, as you pointed out, more than a million dollars per cruise missile. I forgot how many they sent. No, they didn't get anything. They didn't get anything. They didn't do anything. So it's a very, it's an enormous challenge for a, for a powerful nation to uh, to to respond in an, in an effective way. And the Pentagon is still burning. And today, the World Trade Center towers have gone. Uh, Diane Sawyer is is down uh, in Times Square at the moment, and among other things, I think has been trying to get some grasp of the number of casualties involved. It must be very difficult, Diane. It's impossible, Peter, no matter how many people you call. And of course, no matter what the facts we get now, one can only imagine what the facts will be later. I want to give you a sense of what it's like here in Times Square right now. Because if you look outside, we have hundreds upon Roger. hundreds upon hundreds of people standing outside, just stopping still, a kind of respectful witness looking up at the screens where we're broadcasting the pictures. They can't hear the sound. They are simply looking at the wordless horror and standing to show, in a way, respect. And I want to show you something else, because people have been sent home from Times Square and across the way, the construction workers who were building the Toys R Us building next door to us just hung their signs outside. God bless America and pray for families and victims. And we can only, of course, add to that that 
as crisply as we try to report what's happening here today, we join them. And this is not just another story, even for reporters who have been trained to do this for so long. A few things to add since this morning. We were on the air, of course, live when suddenly we get word of that first explosion at the World Trade Center, the first building. And initially, of course, we didn't know if it was an accident. We didn't know what had happened. And then we were on the air live when the second plane came in and the second plane hit. And I want to show you now. This is what we were seeing live on the air. And as you've expressed before, Peter, the combination of disbelief and horror and simple prayer for somebody to save the people who were inside that building is all anybody can do as an entire network is broadcasting live something so unimaginable. I have talked, as you all have, and as George Stephanopoulos reported, to the people who were inside as these scenes were taking place. We now see the first collapse, which of course took place about 10 a.m. Eastern time. And then it would be about 28 minutes later that we would see the second collapse of the second building. And while we're watching the scene, each person desperate, desperate to stop this tape and go and do something. All we can do is relive the horror each time we see it. I have talked to people who are inside the building, one of them Fran Martin, who is the aunt of someone who works here at ABC, and she was saying that the first experience inside the building was that earthquake-like feeling a number of people have mentioned. And then something else, in an eerie, silent, kind of mournful foliage, you saw paper just wafting out in all directions. And it was so mysterious to everyone. They couldn't imagine what had happened. The paper was scattering. And we've now read some three miles out, way across the river, the paper from those floors. As they came down the stairs, we're told that people were remarkably calm, were remarkably respectful of each other as they were making their way down, even though a number of them had lived through that bombing eight years ago. A number of them remembered what it was when the bomb went off in the basement of the World Trade Center. And of course, as we now know, if the cyanide gas had not vaporized in those bombs, that it would have been a cataclysm even beyond what was experienced then. So they could all relive it as they were making their way down. Now we're watching the scenes as the building is collapsing and people are running from it People are covered with this kind of spectral suit from the building's collapse itself. I want to point out again, and you've talked about it too, Peter, all the firefighters were immediately called on duty. All the firefighters immediately raced in from wherever they were to help out, all the emergency medical service personnel. This was a great display of human concern and human consideration. And you've mentioned before, we have this report that 200 firefighters are now missing, and yet they have done everything they can. Every hospital is open, every hand is on deck, every doctor is standing by in the city of New York with um, all this courage and struggle and still heartbreak out there in the streets right now. So that's it from Times Square, Peter. Thank you very much, Diane. I remember uh, working uh, with Diane on the Millennium broadcast on New Year's Eve 2000. Diane had such a joyful time in, in Times Square. It is, uh, whatever you think of New York in general, it is a place where people from around the world gather to express themselves. And so we'll go back there on, on occasion to, to get some, you really get some sense of the world in Times Square. And President Bush has been on the phone uh, today to a variety of world leaders. Um, clearly discussing this with them at the highest possible level. And perhaps they're all as confused as the rest of us are as to what has happened, who perpetrated these acts of terrorism in the United States, and what is to be done in response. Though this is perhaps, we're only four hours since this actually happened, and perhaps it is not quite the time to begin to think about the precision of a response, but a response will be required of some magnitude that will mean something from the United States if one is able to, ever able to pin down exactly who the perpetrators were. 
Uh, we told you that the president was in Florida this morning, where he'd intended to talk about education today and was coming back to Washington. Um, he's made it as far as Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, where he landed um, about an hour and a bit ago, um, just before noon Eastern time, where he's made a statement to the cameras, which we haven't got our hands on yet, but the president uh, said that the president uh, said that freedom had been attacked, but freedom will be defended. And the president is in touch with his national security team. Anne Compton, ABC's Anne Compton, who covers the White House for us for many years from us, tells us that jet fighters, uh, jet fighters accompanied Air Force One and that as best we can tell, uh, the Air, Air Force One was flying at a particularly high altitude. There are no planes taking off or landing in, or taking off in the United States at the moment with the, with the exception of Air, Swan, Air Force One, though the Federal Aviation Administration says at the moment that 50 known aircraft, this is actually a few minutes old, 50 known aircraft are all in the sky uh, within approximately 50 miles of their destination. So you can feel across the country that aircraft that were in flight are beginning to settle down. They were ordered to settle down by the FAA and to land at the nearest possible airport. And so that has begun to work out. Now, in, in Washington, I think Claire Shipman uh, at, the, at the White House or near it has some further information about the president. Yes, Claire. Well, that's right, Peter. What, essentially, what we've learned is what he told the pool cameras a few minutes ago, and we're hopefully going to see in just a few minutes, but he said that the he and this government have taken steps to ensure the functioning of the United States government, that the U.S. military is on high alert at home and abroad. He said he has taken all appropriate security measures to protect Americans. He says freedom itself has been attacked and freedom will be protected. And finally, he also said he will hunt down and punish those responsible for this. Again, we're hoping to see him in person, but as you mentioned, it looks as though this may be the secure place that they've decided on for, um, for the president, at least temporarily, Barksdale Air Force Base in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. I'd be really curious, Claire, and I realize how difficult it is at the moment, whether or not there's not pressure, political pressure in Washington from the members of the president's own staff and cabinet for him to, to, to show up soon. Uh, in front of the country and assure them beyond his statement that freedom has been attacked and freedom will be defended, of course, because it wasn't defended this morning, well, I think whether or not the president will be seen in command in a more vigorous way. I think you're absolutely right, and I'm sure it's a delicate balance right now between the Secret Service and those who are trying to protect the president, keeping him out of sight and someplace secure, and, and his political advisors who would clearly like to see him make a statement. You saw how quickly he did it this morning, as brief as it was, and certainly a piece of tape that we're going to see in a, in a few minutes, we hope, um, is, not, is not what they would like to see the president uh, doing right now. They would like to see him making something of a more formal statement. But again, it could be a number of hours before the president is back in Washington and prepared to, to talk to us from that forum. Okay, thanks very much, Claire. We'll come back to you anytime you, anytime you want. And again, none of us should be surprised at what's happening. First of all, Secret Service is a huge, powerful, authoritative organization which takes the, the uh, president's safety and other members of the senior political leadership with deep and profound seriousness, but they have enormous power. And so if you're talking between a senior political official and the president's secret service official of equal stature at the moment, who's going to win that argument at the moment? And this is particularly true in a situation which continues to unfold because while the devastation, the, the, uh, the, perhaps the grand or the greatest devastation has occurred in New York City tomorrow morning, it's, this morning it's also occurred in outside Washington at, at the Pentagon and and the the tension is there all across the country because not only were the United Nations and various government buildings evacuated here in New York City but the Sears Tower in Chicago the tallest skyscrapers in Boston and Cleveland and Minneapolis and the Space Needle in Seattle so the uh, the psychological effect on people in the country is huge it may indeed be settling down after several hours but the president and his response to this is also part of the psychological package because the country looks to the president on occasions like this to be reassuring to the nation. Some presidents do it well, and some presidents don't. But ABC's Ann Compton is with the president at the moment and we have her on the telephone. Annie. 
Peter, it has been a frightening couple of hours for President Bush. We took off in Air Force One from Florida, where he first got word of this. And we literally, Peter, have been flying at well over 40,000 feet uh, west. The White House unable to tell us where we were headed or how long it would take. There were jet fighters off the wing just out of our sight until we landed. And the president has spent the time on board the aircraft talking not only to world leaders, but to the vice president, uh, to his cabinet. He even checked in with Mrs. Bush, uh, trying to get more information. We were high enough so that the Air Force was actually able to get some television signal. Uh, we don't know much about what's gone on on the ground, but he has been able to see some of it on a very fuzzy uh, television picture. We landed here at Barksdale Air Force Base. This is near Shreveport, Louisiana at about 11.45 Eastern Time. We were not allowed to use cell phones or give you any indication of where we were until local people noticed the plane on the ground. The president has just made a statement, Peter, a very emotional one, saying that freedom has been attacked, but freedom will be defended, saying that America's military is on its highest state of alert. World leaders have been uh, assured that the U.S. will do whatever it takes to protect America and Americans. Frankly, Peter, I thought the president not only looked grim, very solemn, but his eyes looked somewhat red. Annie, let me ask you a couple of questions, if I, if I may. First of all, the president was on a, on a education trip, ostensibly, in Florida today. How much of the national security team was with him? Uh, this is actually a skeleton team with him on a short, uh, it was a trip that lasted only about 24 hours. He was just making his last appearance before returning to Washington. And Carl Rove, one of his senior counselors, is with him. Uh, and his press secretary, Ari Fleischer, but none of the national security apparatus, such as Condoleezza Rice, who would ordinarily travel with the president on a more substantive trip. But on Air Force One, of course, he has the full resources of communications. Uh, but he does not have the full team with him. Well, let's talk about this for a second, because when the president took off from Florida and went immediately to 40,000 feet, and I believe actually got a fighter escort for part of the war, it reminds one a little bit of what it was like in the Cold War, because the Cold War, there was always a provision that the senior members of the government that included could in fact run the country from a command center in the sky. Is Ab that basically what's happening this morning? Absolutely. In fact, the U.S. used to have five aircraft, now Air Force One. Let me know if we're being taken out of here. Uh, we may be scrambled out of here. Okay. Are we leaving? Okay. Peter, the, we are leaving. And Where I are you going, Annie? Peter, I have no idea. They have not told us. They have kept us. Uh, uh, we don't even know whether we'll be able to see the president or travel with him, but we are told that he's been traveling. He will continue. They are still quite worried about his own security. Off you go, and Anne, thanks very much for Thank a you. very, very full report on, on the state of, and, and perhaps even a little bit of the, of the mental condition of the president at, at the moment. And we cannot state it often enough. Uh, the country looks to him, and so he may have stopped at Barksdale Air Force Base in, in, in Louisiana, which is just where Arkansas and Texas and Louisiana all, all come together uh, at an Air Force Base uh, out of the way, and he may be safe at 40,000 feet in, in, in Air Force One, but before long, uh, the country is going to expect him to be back in Washington to send, if not only a message, not just a message to those of us in the nation, who look to the president for some sense of political national civility, but also to the other parts of the world where these enemies of the United States, with whom, we, whom we've talked quite a lot about today, at the moment must surely think they have the United States on the run to some extent. And while the Taliban, the political leadership, military, pol political, military, religious leadership in, in Afghanistan said this morning that, that they condemned this and had nothing to do with it, and it could not have been Osama bin Laden, because he wasn't sophisticated enough to do it. It had to be a country or a government, certainly. And while the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, Yasser Arafat, came out and put as much distance as they could between th them and, and the Palestinian people, this active in the Palestinian people, the president needs to be on station to talk it. As does the mayor of New York, and Mayor Giuliani is with us at the moment. Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? I can, Peter. Mr. Mayor, I saw you several times on the street today, and it, it looked like you were deeply sharing the horror that all of us feel. But I'd really appreciate, aside from, on top of your sentiments about all this, give us some sense of what's going on. What, what is going on now is a massive uh, rescue effort. We have thousands of police officers and firefighters in all of Manhattan trying to rescue as many people as we possibly can. Uh, 
there are still a lot of people there that are injured, hurt, dazed, and we're trying to get them out, and we're mobilizing all of our fire, police, and emergency resources to do that. The governor has alerted the National Guard, and they're being deployed to come and relieve us early to later this afternoon. And uh, the urban search and rescue teams are uh, coming here from from around the country to also assist us. But until then, which means until probably 2, 3, 4 o'clock this afternoon, our police department, our fire department, and our emergency people are being stretched to the limit. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure we've also lost a significant number of them. Now you, you're, you're, you're reluctant, I assume, to put any other name attached to the casualties except significant. Do you believe it's hundreds or thousands? I, I, I really don't. I really, I really don't want to say right now, Peter. I, I think it's going to be hor a horrible number. I, I saw people jumping out of the World Trade Center. I saw some of the firefighters who I know going in, into the building. So, and we were in a building in which we were trapped for about. 10, 15 minutes. Are you talking about the... Did you go immediately to the Office of Emergency Management? No, I, I went down to scene, and we set up uh, headquarters at 75 Barclay Street, which was right there with the police commissioner, the fire commissioner, mm -hmm. the head of emergency management. And we were operating out of there when we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. And it did collapse before we could actually get out of the building. So we were trapped in the building for 10, 15 minutes and finally found an exit and got out walk north and took a lot of people with us. My question is, the Office of Emergency Management headquarters into which you put enormous effort for coordination in a disaster like this, has it been damaged? Is oh, it yes. still operating? It's it, gone? It, it, it's, in, uh, it's been uh, damaged. I don't know how badly. And right now, that whole area of Manhattan, including the police department, which is another area we would operate from, City Hall, is another area we would operate from, have been closed off. So we've moved to a uh, secure location in Midtown Manhattan where we're operating city government. Is, is it fair to say, do you think, that all of your drills for dealing with terrorism and disaster are going according to plan, or has this been of such uh, of magnitude that we've just all been caught totally off balance? Oh, there's no question we were all caught totally off balance. No, no, one, no, one, no one could possibly expect uh, large airplanes to crash into the, you know, the World Trade Center uh, the way this happened. I think having said that, as I watched what the police officers and the firefighters were doing, I think they're going to save the maximum number of lives you could possibly save in a situation like this. I mean, they are they, they, the emergency efforts that, that they've been going through over the last two, two and a half hours are uh, no, nothing short of uh, inspiring. And when the National Guard comes in to say, did you say to take over or offer some relief, what can the National Guard do that you cannot do at a city level? Oh, at this point, what they can do is re relieve men who are going to be exhausted physically mm -hmm. and, emo and emotionally. Now, just if you would, because I know how busy you are, just give us some sense of what you thought at the time about all this. I thought that uh, I would never live to see anything like this. I, di I didn't think any anything like this was, was possible. When I first arrived there, I rushed down there from midtown Manhattan, and I saw the first building that had been crashed open. And... Uh, when you look at it, it takes you a minute to really comprehend that it act this is actually happening. Uh, and, and to see people jumping from the top of the World Trade Center. I, mean, you, there, I, I don't think I've ever had a nightmare that's worse than this. And we want to break in locally here in Washington to also bring you up to date on what's been going on here in the nation's capital as a result of this horrific sequence of events here in the United States. I'm Kathleen Matthews. And I'm Del Walters. We are receiving some numbers right now of the number of injuries that are taking place as a result of what happened at the Pentagon this morning. You're looking at videotape right now. It happened at approximately 10 o'clock this morning and then at about 11.15 the facade of the Pentagon collapsed. We know now that 26 people have been admitted to Virginia Hospital Center. We do not know the nature of their injuries or the severity of their injuries. In addition, we are being told another seven people have been taken to Washington Hospital Center with burns. That's right. We want to give you a phone number because I think there are a lot of folks who are very concerned that maybe they know passengers who were on board any one of these flights that has been crashed into a building as a result of these terrorist attacks. American Airlines actually uh, has put out this number that you can call one 800 
245-0999. I guess that's a general number for both for any of the airlines that might have been involved in this. 1-800-245-0999. Bill, very difficult still to get information out of places like the Pentagon because, of course, most federal buildings, all federal buildings in the area, including the Pentagon, have been evacuated as a result of this. There have been reports of people who died in that Pentagon attack, but we have no confirmation of that at this point. And we also know that one of the planes involved was a flight that originated out of Dulles. It was a American Airlines Flight 77, a Boeing 6, 757. There were 58 passengers on board. We don't have information yet as to the names of those passengers, but you saw the American Airlines number. That is the number that you call if you are seeking information with regards to that particular plane. We believe that that was one of the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center in New York. It originated out of Dulles. Now, all of the airports across the country have been shut down. You saw National Airport there. They were shut down right away. Dulles, we understand, will remain closed until 11 o'clock tomorrow. There is no air, no air transport going on at all in the United States or Canada. We want to bring you up to date now on some closings that have been going on, obviously, because this has really shut down right. the Washington area. It is a long list. We're going to read them for you in case you're listening, but they are on your screen as well. Arlington County Schools will be open. Prince George's County Schools closing two hours early, so you need to make arrangements to pick up your loved ones. D.C. Public Schools at this hour, even though we understand it is still being debated, remain open. Montgomery County Schools will be closing an hour and a half early. Edison Friendship Public Charter School closing at 12:30. Okay, we want to move now to Charles County, uh, Loudoun County, and Alexandria. These further out, of course, from the nation's capital, and all of those remain open. In terms of private schools throughout the area, we understand many have been closed, and you need to check with your local school. Generally, they do follow a specific policy that coordinates with the uh, public schools. Now, here are the university closings. American University is closed. The University of Maryland in College Park is open. The University College campus is closed. George Washington University is closed. Catholic University is closed. And UDC is closed. And this perhaps goes without mention, but uh, DC schools, and, and I'm sure this goes for, for the other school systems as well, are saying that if you are concerned about the safety of your loved ones, by all means go and pick them up. Uh, my wife picked up our children, so it's understandable that everybody is shaken by what has happened today. It has never happened before. You saw the other closings there. Also, we have some metro closings. The metro station at Union Station, at the Pentagon, understandably, and at National Airport are all closed. The yellow line will be switching routes to uh, necessitate and to facilitate the evacuation of the district that is taking place as all federal government buildings have been ordered closed by order of the president himself. This is an incident that's been compared to, to Pearl Harbor already. Uh, I was talking to a congressman on Capitol Hill who said Washington will never be the same. Obviously, this is of great concern also to families and to children and something that families need to talk about and try to calm uh, their families and their children about. The mayor is actually going to be holding a press conference. It was scheduled for 1 o'clock, but because of all the gridlock downtown, it's been postponed a bit. As soon as that news conference, which will bring us up to date on what's happening in the city itself, uh, comes about, we will bring that to you if we can live and understand as we continue our coverage we are going to break in and out of coverage of ABC but just a reminder we survived Oklahoma City we survived Columbine we will survive this as well and we will try and help you through it thanks very much for joining us we'll join you probably every half hour meantime we go back to Peter Jennings to try to appraise the number of casualties that have been uh, that, that, have been, that have occurred in the World Trade Centers in their related area. But bear in mind that, what, about 50,000, what did I say, Nancy, 50,000 people work in the, in the trade towers, 80,000 people perhaps work in the adjoining areas. We've seen them in flight. Um, and we have seen not one but two towers absolutely collapse upon themselves. And, and elsewhere in the country, we're still uncertain. There's still an unknown number of aircraft uh, who've been ordered to land that haven't managed to get down to the ground. We're not absolutely certain that there are any aircraft on, on, on missions, if you will, uh, which are unaccounted for, despite the fact there was a report some time ago that the aircraft outside, which crashed outside Pittsburgh, may have been on its way to Camp David. I emphasize that that's reporting um, of which we're absolutely not very sure at all. But ABC's Barry Serafin is at the Capitol at the moment, and we've been told for some time that the Senate leadership there was going to be sent to a secure location. Do you have a current status report, Barry? Well, Peter, we're not sure exactly what we're seeing here, but a few minutes ago, about 10 minutes ago, a military helicopter 
landed here behind me on the west lawn of the White House. And then a large group of people were seen to walk out to it, get on board, and fly right above us, over the mall in the direction of the Pentagon, perhaps. Uh, my guess, and it's only a guess at this point, is that these were members of the Senate leadership and the House leadership, and perhaps members of the intelligence committees on their way to a briefing to try to figure out what in the world is going on today. Uh, sir, uh, were you able to walk up around the hill? No, Peter, uh, we, like everybody else, have been kind of pushed off of the hill. They've got a cordon for blocks now around the Capitol. In effect, they've sanitized that area. So we're about uh, four blocks from the foot of the hill here. And, and do you have any sense of, uh, of an, was there a sense of anticipation there? People sort of waiting for something to happen at the Capitol? Well, uh, there is every time uh, any kind of aircraft shows itself, and there haven't been many, there have been a few government helicopters moving around. All eyes turn to the sky, as you might imagine. Precisely, Barry. Thanks very much. Barry Serafin, who's up at the, up at the Capitol. Um, one, of the things that, one of the things that is absolutely certain at the moment, which is to say that the chain of command in the country is very much in place. So you can just imagine yourself in some other country at the moment anticipating, trying to anticipate, maybe even exhilarating at what's happening in the United States uh, at the moment and trying to, having some belief that you've disrupted everything. President's at 40,000 feet, just about to take off from Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. We don't know where he's going, but I have to assume he's going to go to Washington. Cannot have the president being seen to be running around the country. By the way, the baseball games have all been uh, postponed today. The entire Major League Baseball schedule has been postponed uh, for today as much as a mark of mourning and sadness for what happened in a variety of locations today. U.S. Uh, earlier on evacuated uh, embassies around the world. They're all quite familiar with that because on any number of occasions in the course of a year, you hear us say on the news that the State Department of the Pentagon has ordered a worldwide alert because something is going to happen or potentially going to happen to some kind of terrorist attack that's going to occur in some part of the world. The most recent uh, terrorist alert, ironically, was in Asia uh, over last weekend. Uh, in Japan and in South Korea, American embassies were put on alert because somebody somewhere in the military, uh, sorry, in the intelligence establishment believed there was some potential for an attack. And it's something government has to do. It's something government has to do. Government has no choice, it argues. A lot of times you'll hear people saying, well, they've put up a state of alert again and, and nothing happened. And so they just do it all the time. And it's very hard on Americans traveling overseas to be somewhere where there's a state of alert. But as John McCarthy are, uh, who covers the military establishment for us points out is something government is obliged to do, lest something ever happen, and and there had not been an alert. Jack, John, are you there? John McKenzie? John McCarthy? John, Mc John McCarthy's here. Yeah, here. John, I'm sorry, I was you. I was obviously talking, but not uh, not John McKenzie. Um, this is this this is uh, I guess what one notices more than else today. This was a place where there was no terrorism alert. Nobody, I gather, that you've talked today seemed to know anything. One of the things that they have been studying so scrupulously over the last several months is how Osama bin Laden and other terrorist groups operate, Peter. They felt that they had some ability to monitor critical communications from these groups. Uh, I think it's going to be proved that the groups have learned some very important and deadly lessons uh, from past terrorist events and the way the U.S. has been able to monitor them. It seems quite clear in this instance uh, that they bypassed the normal methods of communicating and were able to organize this very complex operation in a way that basically escaped American detection. But John, I, I'm sorry, but I think a lot of Americans will hear you talking and, and, and be reminded that how often the government tells us how much more sophisticated it is and how much better able they are to monitor all this. They are able to better monitor it, Peter, but every time, and you and I know this because we have had conversations with high-ranking government officials about how much detail we put on the air. Uh, every time the news media puts on these details, it helps the terrorists to understand the way that our government goes about monitoring their communications. Uh, oftentimes, those communications intercepts are very sophisticated, but the terrorists are clearly adjusted. John, I wonder, by the way, on a, you know, on a slightly different subject in terms of today's disaster, whether you've picked up reports of U.S. aircraft carriers being sent to New York Harbor 
to help in some way, maybe even to be floating platforms? Uh, I have not picked that up, Peter, but basically I'm standing on a highway at this yeah, point, that, so that, I'm, I'm not exactly plugged in. I, I appreciate that, John, and we benefit tremendously from your knowledge, so thanks very much. Come back at us when you, when you, when you think of something else you'd like to, to contribute. Um, we talk about the, you know, the United States and Canada cooperated today in closing down the airports, a reminder to us that all Canadian airports, or most Canadian airports, at least major Canadian airports, are very close to the U.S. border. Uh, we learned just a short while ago that Israel today, the United States and Israeli relationships so very close, um, closed all of its airspace to foreign aircraft today and evacuated many of its embassies and missions overseas. <clears throat> in, in terms of the war against terrorism, the United States and Israel are seen by the terrorists and the potential terrorists and the people who would do one harm as partners in this. And so it's perfectly natural for the Israelis to be doubly and trebly on a state of alert today. We've now managed to get the tape of President Bush speaking at Barksdale Air Force in Louisiana on his way from Florida to, as you heard Ann Compton say, somewhere. We assume Washington. And here's what the president had to say when he was in Louisiana. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my Cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status and we have taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens, and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested, but make no mistake. We will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. Well, the president could not have spoken more accurately in that final remark there. A great nation is being tested. And the president reassures the nation and anybody else in the world who will hear this that the nation will pass the test. And there is no doubt about that, I think. In the United States of America, as horrible as this these incidents are and as tragic as Oklahoma City was um, the great strength of the nation you know is always there I, I recognize that's one man's opinion and doesn't uh, doesn't account for the individual shock of individual families or the or intelligence or military establishments which have all suffered a grievous blow today in in one way or the other but it does say, I think, what people in most parts of the world believe, that as horrible as this is for the United States and its citizens, uh, the United States continues to be unquestionably the leadership of the world and the example in the world of freedom and democracy, uh, however much one may criticize it, ourselves included, on any given occasion or incident. It's interesting that in Oklahoma today, Governor Keating ordered all state office buildings closed and the Oklahoma City Police created a one-block perimeter around the jail where Terry Nichols is housed. 
So again, you have an example of how people's minds work immediately. Was somebody going to try to spring Terry Nichols from jail or, or was someone going to attack the jail in which Terry Nichols is housed, but in the wake of Oklahoma City and based on what's happened this morning, nobody should be surprised. Um, in, and the Associated Press has done a really good service here by checking with every state in the country so far. You know, as you watch this on the east coast of the United States, think about that in California, all airports were closed. Places like Knott's Berry Farm were closed today. The Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles was closed. The Library Tower, all closed. And the State Emergency, convened, State Emergency Committee convened, naturally, under Governor Davis to see that there was heightened security to all of the state buildings. In, in Florida, you know what happened. Walt Disney World was evacuated, closed its parks and shopping and entertainment complex. You're talking about the effect that this incident has all across the country. Airports were closed everywhere across the country, as we know, in, including in Georgia and Illinois, where the Sears Tower was also shut down in Chicago. And all state government buildings in Chicago and in, in Springfield, the Capitol, were closed down. Indiana, all the federal offices were put on alert. In Kentucky, where the southern governors were about to have their um, full scope of their annual fall conference, it was canceled. And obviously the governors of Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Louisiana, Mississippi all went home to their respective capitals because of this. In Louisiana, where the president has just left, the upper floors of the Capitol building were closed, the offshore oil port uh, which handles the super tankers in the Gulf of Mexico, suspended operations. And we've said several times this morning that when you think about terrorism, you think about oil supplies. And so that was fairly natural. In Michigan, the tunnel between Detroit and Windsor, Ontario, was closed to car traffic. And we do know from other reporting that security was increased at all of the border crossings between U.S. and Canada and between the U.S. and Mexico. But in all the states where there are military bases, including North Carolina, uh, all of the military bases prepared for a possible change in status. And you heard Governor Pataki of New York say a short while ago that uh, the National Guard from uh, various surrounding states will be brought in here to give some sense of, some sense of relief um, for the New York City fire and police department who must just be going through a hellish experience at the moment. John Miller, first of, of all, you've been on the phone for a little while. Tell me what you got. Well, uh, uh, as things have developed at the scene, there have been a number of things that have happened. First of all, nobody in city government can right now put a, a number, um, even a ballpark estimate on the number of injured and dead. What they've done uh, to try and deal with the large numbers they have is literally brought in students from NYU Medical School to help in the massive triage effort down there. The nearest hospital, uh, Beekman Downtown Hospital, uh, has lost steam power as a result of the explosion, which means they can't sterilize anything. So they've essentially become a MASH center uh, and are feeding people out to other area hospitals. Another reason to get the National Guard in here quickly because they come equipped. Right. Um, another thing, uh, as New York City hospitals became overwhelmed, ferry boats began to shuttle victims across the river to New Jersey, to hospitals in Jersey City and Bayonne. We saw, by the way, some ferry boats on the Hudson River a little while ago. So that was them ferrying casualties across exactly. to New Jersey on the other side. Um, to... I, I spoke to uh, some police officers that I know, police officers um, who used to work for me in the police department, who were at the scene, who gave the most incredible uh, descriptions. First of all, police headquarters has been evacuated. There's a tiny skeleton crew there. It's considered uh, a possible secondary target. They've moved police operations to another location, which we've been asked not to disclose, so that that doesn't become a possible target. Um, the police commissioner is there now trying to get together enough information uh, with the mayor and his people to, to actually brief us. Police precincts, and this is something eerie, Peter. We've touched on this before about a, t a city, an American city in a free country going into lockdown. The 75 police precincts in New York have been sealed off in a one-block radius to traffic and pedestrians. Um, All of which, I have to tell you, is alarming but seems common sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, mm -hmm. on, on a day like today, uh, when nothing seems normal, such incredible things actually seem prudent. One of, the, uh, one of the officers I spoke to on the telephone who was there when the first building collapsed said he was standing across the street. He was assigned to find a, a senior FBI official 
um, to get a briefing for um, the top command and that the building fell. He said, I, I, I ducked behind a truck and I closed my eyes and hit the deck. He said, I waited 30 seconds thinking that was enough. Then I opened my eyes and it was night. It was complete blackness. He said, I began to crawl and crawl for more than a block. And then I picked myself up off the street, but I still couldn't see. He said, a kid who was outside um, the major dust actually saw him struggling for sight, went in there and pulled him out and brought him into the church at Barclay Street where he washed his eyes out with holy water to try and regain his vision. Um, he was covered with dust and soot. These are the kind of human descriptions of the stories of, of people who were there at Ground Zero when the first building fell. Um, pressing for some kind of numbers, uh, they said, all we have is prelim preliminaries and they're too small. He said, uh, the Port Authority believes they may have between, between 10 and 20 cops involved in the building in the rescues that are unaccounted for. The fire department, and this may be a low ball number also, between 80 and 100 firefighters. Early, uh, an, earlier report, an earlier report said there were 200 firefighters unaccounted for. Unaccounted for uh, at this time, um, and between 12 and 20 New York City police officers. Again, soft numbers, um, but unfortunately, the estimates are that uh, rather than going down, they may go up. That's the fear. This is, this is one of, this is the occasion, not one of those occasions. This is the occasion when a member of the police department, the fire department, or the military has got to respond only to the training. You just go into, you just go into automatic and you do what you're trained to be do. It was amazing to me, uh, listening to the police radio traffic today, um, even as momentous disasters unfolded. I mean, the unspeakable. The collapsing of the Twin Towers, one after another, um, that while there was a high pitch to a lot of the voices and a little screaming and yelling, uh, the rapidity which, with which calm was restored on the radio and they went back to uh, sending orders and continuing operations and acting in a logical manner, uh, you really do revert to your training as a second nature. As you look at this and you listen to John Miller, and I thank you, John, for that. No one is better plugged into the police and firefighting apparatus in New York City than John Miller. He not only been a reporter for most of his adult life, but he worked, from, worked for the police department in New York for a while before he had the good sense to come back to journalism. And he is totally plugged in. But even, and, and when he talks about soft numbers here, it's because as you look at this disaster scene, that's a live car picture. That is a live picture. 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, four and a half hours after this actually occurred, and you're looking at the smoke and the dust still emerging from these, from the edges of these canyons in lower Manhattan, and the magnitude of trying to deal with these people, to deal with these people, extends to moving them across the Hudson River in ferry boats, the ubiquitous ferry boat in New York harbors, not as necessary as they were in the days of greater ship travel to the New Jersey side, and the Canadian Television Network, our partner, one of our partner television networks in Canada, is now reporting that American burn victims, victims from here, I'm not sure whether it's the Pentagon or here, but I suspect it's from here, being transported as far away as Canada to Canadian hospitals there. And there you get some sense of how uh, difficult it is to get a real grasp of how enormous this is, other than to say as the mayor of New York and the governor of New York State both said to us a short while ago, I just don't want to touch the casualty figures as of now. Pierre Thomas, who's been with us for much of the morning, also reports from the FBI. And we may never know much more about one of the aircraft than this, that at least one of the planes this morning, we haven't got no more details than that, was able to communicate that it had been hijacked in some cockpits in some of the aircraft now being in Cuba's commercial service, there's a button you can hit that sends a code to your headquarters that says you've been, that says you've been hijacked, so you don't have to try to tell the hijacker that you're actually talking to headquarters. But that's as much as we know about one of the several aircraft today which were involved in attacks on the United States. Now, Diane Sawyer at Times Square um, has been trying, I know as best she can, to get some handle on casualties vis-a-vis -vis the people are pouring into hospitals. Diane? Right, Peter, here's all I know, and it's kind of postscript what John Miller was saying earlier with Beekman Hospital, the closest hospital, as he said, has been relatively out of commission, but St. Vincent's Hospital, which is perimeter, 25 major hospitals in New York, this is one of the next closest, told us just minutes ago they had 184 <laughs> hospitalized 
two dead. Now, again, we know that these figures are going to be changing almost minute by minute, so this is very early. But at this time, uh, and by now we're talking just minutes ago, 184 hospitalized, two dead. They said to us again, though, remember, remember that where the World Trade Centers used to be, there is now a mountain of rubble. We are talking 200,000 tons of steel. 425,000 cubic yards of concrete and 43,600 windows with all the glass in them now just lying on the ground. So the excavation has only begun, but 184 right now from St. Vincent's. Thanks, Diane, very much. And I, I must tell you, I feel a little embarrassed about trying to focus on casualties in numerical terms only because it will ultimately give us some sense of the magnitude of this attack on top of the buildings themselves being brought to the ground and similarly true at the Pentagon. So it, it, it we're not, nobody feels gruesome or uh, it's, not, it's not about the gruesomeness of the casualty figures. It is simply trying to get some sense of the magnitude in human terms rather than the physical terms, which so much of us in the country saw just before our eyes. Before I talked to John and to Diane, we were I was just running there briefly through various different parts of the country where the ripple effect of these attacks uh, were felt in Las Vegas, for, for example. This is back to the Associated Press report, which they did a really good job pulling the country together. The security was increased at all of casinos on the Strip in Las Vegas, because if you think about it, for, for many for the enemies of the United States, uh, that kind of excess and is, uh, is seen as a symbol of the United States as well. The only place we could find all of the federal buildings open so far was in Vermont, where the federal buildings in Montpelier and Burlington were both open. And, you know, they have an atomic energy plant up there. And it was placed on a height, a uh, state of heightened security as well. Uh, whereas in Nebraska, uh, you'll see the first of probably many examples of this in the, in the hours and days ahead. State employees were asked if they would give blood because blood will be needed. There is a blood shortage in the United States, as we've heard time and again from the Red Cross. Um, it's almost at a, a state of crisis in terms of blood collection in the United States at the moment. And so, on a, and what do you need in a time like this? You need blood and you need plasma for all the people who have been, who have been hurt and damaged. And so that's important. And in Nebraska, uh, state employees were, were responding to requests for blood donations and at the Air Force bases out there, and then uh, the security was heightened. And at churches all over the country, at churches all over the country, they're beginning to have these services, which will become part of the national fabric in the next couple of days as people pray for the victims and the hope, those we hope are survivors of this. Terry Moran is at the White House, which is his normal beat. He didn't go with the president to Florida today. It's often the case that the president's doing a purely political trip. We ask him to stay home to give us a broader sense of things. Well, Terry, what's the state of the White House as of now? Well, Peter, the White House has pretty much been evacuated altogether. Just before it was evacuated, we are told that the national security team was taken to the secure situation room in there, but they are the only people in there. White House staff, most of the White House staff was told to go home. And the president, as you've heard, flew to Louisiana and is now en route. Uh, we don't know where. As he said, he is trying to make sure that the country knows that the government is still running. We've seen around town motorcades assembling outside the various cabinet departments. And we've just seen recently some traffic into the White House. So there is uh, some government activity, but uh, mm. without the president at the moment. Uh, Terry, there's a very small collection, very small collection of reporters and camera team, camera team on board the President Air Force One at the moment. I think the only reporter on board um, is Ann Compton, am I correct? Or certainly the only television reporter on board? Well, actually, Ann is in the radio seat today. The pool, as it's called, is flying with the President. Today, CBS News is the pool. It alternates every day. Right. Uh, this pool will travel with him wherever he goes, and he made that statement that we saw earlier to the pool. Uh, the rest of the press who was accompanying the president to Florida, we are told, is now on a bus because of the air traffic shutdown from Florida back to Washington. Uh, Terry, I wonder if from your perspective of our White House correspondent, whether you agree with me and certainly our political director, I think, who says that how the president now spends his time today, what he is seen to do is absolutely vital, not, not just to the country, but to him. 
Well, it's critical time for him. He said that the nation is being tested, the new president is being tested as well. But he has other restrictions on what he can do. That political mission he has to reassure the country and to show that he is leading it is actually secondary or even tertiary. The first thing is he has to keep himself safe. The Secret Service is going to insist that he be secured. And then second, he must remain in efficient strategic communication with United States forces around the world. That's undoubtedly why they took him to Barksdale Air Force Base in Shreveport. But you're absolutely right. The main thing he has to do for most Americans is communicate to them that he's in charge, that he intends to take control of this situation, and as he said, hunt down the people who are responsible for it and punish them. Terry, I know you want to go back to your reporting. Is there anything else you want to add at the moment? Well, Peter, it's just that this whole complex, which is usually a buzz with activity, which is uh, really a, uh, an office for hundreds of people, is now silent for the most part and an armed camp. And that is a very striking thing for all of us who go to work there every day. And, and what I notice is you're, you're to the south of the South Lawn. You're on the southern side of the White House. We very often see you broadcasting from the other side of the White House. Why are you way down where you are? Well, we've been cleared out of the North Lawn, which is where we normally broadcast from, and we are now, as you can see, south of the south ellipse of the White House. I can tell you that the evacuation of the White House itself, which has happened before with bomb threats and suspicious cars and packages, today did not proceed as orderly as it has. Uh, I was told by one of the White House staffers that their security official came in and said everybody should leave in an orderly fashion, and about a minute later, an agent ran in and said, just run, get out. Okay, thanks very much, Terry. We'll come back to you. But uh, you get some sense from Terry Moran standing there, locked dramatically out of the out of the area with which he is so familiar. We saw some pictures earlier today. I'm here we get them up again for people who have just joined us of people leaving the White House uh, early on. First, the White House police walking out fairly casually, and then as the tension began to build and the awareness of what was going on began to be heightened, they, people began to run outside of the White House. This is a place supposed to be, you know, quite extraordinarily secure. And he was, I think, more than anything else, this concern that... that I'm Del Walters, live in the ABC7 newsroom. You're looking at live pictures right now of the Pentagon. And as of seven minutes ago, at 1.37, D.C. Mayor Anthony Williams, actually around 1.30 Eastern time, declared a state of emergency in the District of Columbia. He indicated that 100 police officers will be manning key intersections and that the National Guard is being mobilized at this point. We want to bring you up to date right now on what's happening in the nation's capital. Of course, all of this comes after an attack on the Pentagon at about 10 o'clock this this morning we have pictures of that earlier today the Pentagon evacuated after a plane flew into the heliport entrance of the Pentagon landing in the uh, in the central courtyard there major damage at the Pentagon as a result very quickly not only the Pentagon was evacuated but also our US Capitol building the White House as you heard Terry Moran saying earlier all federal buildings including the State Department now all monuments and museums have closed culminating now in the mayor talking about this being a state of, the mer of emergency here in the nation's capital. This is the injury update. Uh, at this hour, the efforts to fight the fire f at the Pentagon continue. The Virginia Hospital Center is reporting that there are 26 people that have been taken there with injuries, no word yet on the severity of the injuries. The Washington Hospital Center says that seven people have been injured there. They say that most of those who have been brought to the Washington Hospital Center were burned. George Washington Hospital Center says they have two patients in the emergency room. Both of them are said not to have life-threatening injuries. Well, this attack has obviously precipitated a certain level of chaos downtown as not only federal buildings have closed, but also a lot of private office buildings and schools closing uh, around the area. And so we want to show uh, the mayor earlier when he was speaking about why he thinks Washington should be in a state of emergency. Here's the mayor. The heinous terrorist acts committed this morning are the acts of cowards. Like all of you, uh, all of us in the district are saddened by the loss of lives these acts have caused. Let us keep all the victims and their families in our thoughts and in our prayers. I'd like to reassure the citizens of the District of Columbia that all of our emergency agencies are fully deployed to meet any emergencies that might arise. I ask your cooperation and full support during this critical period. Our first priority is to be able to respond effectively to the emergency situations as they arise. To that end, and to ensure that we have the highest level of preparedness, 
I have declared a state of emergency in the District of Columbia so that emergency vehicles can move throughout our neighborhoods and so that in the event of an incident here in the district, we are fully prepared. I'm also communicating regularly with the White House and have the full support of our federal emergency agencies as well as the cooperation of the D.C. National Guard. We want to bring you up to date on the situation. One of the emergencies here involves the donation of blood. The Red Cross says that the donations and the blood supplies are low. The number you can call if you wish to give blood is there on the screen. It is 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. Again, 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. And also, you're being told not to call 911 in the district. Instead, use the number 311. The mayor also said stay out of the city if you can. If you have to come to pick up family members or children, do that. But if you are able to, you should stay out of the city. We'll be back. We have to be on a war footing. Uh, we And uh, Senator Hagel has said that we've got to start securing our borders, locking down our airports, uh, revisiting the way we protect our public institutions. What about that? I hope that's not true. Uh, I would say it another way. I would say we've come face to face with the new reality, a reality that we knew existed and we knew was possible, a reality that has happened in varying degrees in other countries. But if, in fact, in order to respond to that reality, we have to alter our civil liberties, change the way we function, then we have truly lost the war. The war is one that allows us, to, the way to conduct the war is to demonstrate our institutions are functioning, that your civil liberties, your civil rights, your ability to be free and walk and move around, in fact, are not fundamentally altered. Anybody who's willing to strap dynamite to their body or have a suicide kamikaze mission, you'll never fundamentally be able to stop. It doesn't matter what you do. There are a lot of things we can do, though, to diminish significantly the possibility of this happening again without um, change in our character as a nation. Well, it's an amazing scene here, Peter. The skies are clear. There are usually planes in the sky. The skies are clear over the Capitol. Uh, the streets are completely empty. There is still smoke rising up from the Pentagon where the plane hit the Pentagon earlier. Uh, and as you can see, the members of Congress are all trying to grapple with what to, what to do next. Uh, Senator Biden, of course, is going to be receiving all kinds of security Linda, briefings. Linda, I have a question, and, uh, if I may. Yes, yes, Senator, yes Peter, I, go, go I, ahead. I have a question for the Senator. I apologize if I you. The senator is the chairman of the intelligence, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee, so he is party to all of the information in the intelligence community. Was the intelligence community so taken up with the idea of chemical and biological warfare against the United States that they didn't pay enough attention to this possibility? Well, they clearly understood this was a possibility. The problem has been we have been focusing, in my view, um, I, I don't want to second guess anybody here. Look, the prospect of a chemical, biological, pathogen, probability is real. Uh, some of us, literally as recently as yesterday, I spoke to the National Press Club and talked about the fact that it's just as easy to fly from National Airport into the White House as it is to, uh, you know, do, do the same thing in New York. I mean, look, we know all these possibilities exist. Um, and one of the things we have to do is we have to get our priorities straight in terms of what the real threats are that face us and use the assets we have to begin to deal with those threats. Um, what I don't want everybody to think is this is some worldwide conspiracy where there's tens of thousands of people who are part of this army that attacked us. This is a group of people who are very well organized, obviously are relatively well funded, and we have to figure out how their network has worked, but we have to penetrate it. But it's not, this is not, we, we can't, Peter, just say we're going to focus only on this kind of incident and not on chemical and not on biological and not on pathogens, not on anthrax. This, in a sense, is the most god-awful wake-up call we've ever had Senator, let me to ask how you one, we have to redirect our resources. Let me ask you one more question, then. I didn't realize you could hear me. At the Pentagon and the State Department, you already hear people doing what they almost always do in an instance like this. This is so sophisticated, it must be Osama bin Laden. Maybe so, but is the United States too focused on one man? The tendency in these circumstances is to be too focused on one man, one idea, one prospect. I think that we should be calm those of us who hold high public office, just calm down a little bit, collect our thoughts, collect the information, and in a methodical way, analyze what we know happened and what we can derive from that. I think it's much too early for us to make those kinds of judgments. The first thing is what the president is doing. He called for calm, he's getting in the airplane, he's coming back to Washington, D.C., and I applaud him for that. 
and we should be back up and running as quickly as we can. Uh, and I, I think we should do that. Th this cannot be dealt with overnight. It's an incredible tragedy. But it's the new threat of the 21st century that we are now facing. And we're going to find a way to deal with it. This nation is too big, too strong, too united, too, too much a, a power in terms of our cohesion and our values to let this break us apart. And it won't happen. It won't many th happen. Many thanks, Senator. And Linda, do you want to add something, Linda Douglas? Well, I just want to say that this is the beginning of what will clearly be an enormous, a profound debate here in the Capitol. The, the dynamics of the debate in this country, as I've discovered in talking to members of Congress, have been fundamentally altered now. And here you're hearing a discussion of whether we should lock down, open up, and how we tackle this, and what our priorities are, and how we protect ourselves. So uh, it's, I, I've had just astonishing conversations with members of Congress, Peter, and uh, there's a very grave feeling here right now in the Capitol. Okay. Linda, thank you very much, and thank you, Senator Biden, as well. We'll have Linda Douglas available to us all the time, thank goodness, and Senator Biden says um, one of the most profound things about all this, which we've said several times this morning, which the terrorist wins when he or she manages to alter the behavior of, of a people or has or infringes on such on the way of life in a country that the country, a democratic country particularly, alters its way of life because that's a step up for the terrorist in question because it raises the whole question of civil liberties and access and freedom of movement. And Pierre Thomas has just come back to join us. You've had this tremendous argument from covers the Justice Department for us. You had this tremendous argument in Washington as to whether or not that street out to Pennsylvania Avenue outside the Washington, outside the White House should be open again to vehicular traffic or kept closed. I mean, it's, Paris is already winning in that one regard. Absolutely. And members of Congress and members of the D.C. delegation in particular have been arguing to reopen Pennsylvania Avenue. The Secret Service has been adamant. You cannot reopen it. Open, Oklahoma City showed the nation what can happen with a car bomb. Peter, I just got off the phone with uh, a very senior FBI official. And he talked about uh, the feeling of uh, people being stunned at the FBI. The FBI Director Robert Mueller, uh, the Deputy Director Tom Picard are at the Special Operations Center. They are communicating with the various field offices. And two bits of information. One, they said that there was communication from one of the planes noting that they had been hijacked. And I had a rather, rather interesting conversation about that. He said, the problem is that there's no system in place once the plane <coughs> notifies that it mm. has been hijacked. No system in place to stop an ongoing attack. He said, think about it. If we had had time to notify the military, the military would have had to make a, make a decision, do we shoot the plane out of the sky? Well, both of you have to help me. You and John Miller have to help me on this because they put this device in the cockpits so that notably airlines would know if one of the aircraft had been hijacked. But nobody really, I mean, I'm sure people did think, but not many people thought hijacks were going to lead to using these aircraft as full-scale kamikaze flights uh, against public buildings. In the other. I don't remember either one of you the last, if ever before, there's been a, the use of a civilian aircraft to attack a public installation in any country in the world. I may be wrong on that. You know, it's, it's certainly something so rare that I can't conjure one up. Uh, two things come to mind. One, in the, um, in, in or about 1980 or 81, a man with a, a gripe flew a plane in circles around the United Nations building, threatening to crash it into the building if his demands weren't met. And police helicopters went up, police hostage negotiators began to talk with him, and they literally talked him and his, and his plane down in LaGuardia Airport. Mm -hmm. Two, in 1994 or five, um, on the day of the signing of the crime bill, ironically, uh, a man crashed his plane into the White House. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I remember as a police official attending the signing of the crime bill with this plane sticking out of um, the White House's doorway um, under a shroud. So you've had those, but certainly nothing approaching this scale and certainly nothing approaching this scale with passengers involved. I mean, uh, you have the, the crash of Egypt Air Flight 990, where U.S. officials believe that the co-pilot potentially crashed it into the ocean, but again, not into a target. Um, on the phone with us at the moment is the former National Security Advisor in the Clinton Administration, Sandy Berger, who's now an independent consultant with a company that consults between the U.S. and foreign countries. 
Mr. Berger, do you hear me? Yes, I do, Peter. Hey, Sandy. Uh, I have one question for you, because it isn't so long ago that you were in and or adjacent to the White House. This could have been on the Clinton watch as well as it could have been on the Bush watch. What would be the first thing you would have done? Well, uh, you know, the, 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 the first responsibility here, obviously, is to uh, uh, the people who are trapped in these buildings. This is first and foremost... Uh, uh, an undertaking here of, of relief and rescue. But that's not the job uh, of the National Security Advisor. Well, what is the National is, Security Advisor? It is, it is, uh, this may involve the National Guard. It may involve other elements. Uh, uh, and you have to, you, you, that, that obviously has to be our first priority. Second, uh, uh, securing, uh, as, the, as, as clearly the, the government has done, uh, other facilities that may be, may be targets. Um, uh, and then, uh, uh, looking at uh, can, what I, is can I just interrupt you again? I is there a co is there a book for this? Is there a book of rules, or do you just have to think? Oh boy, we better lock down this. We better lock down that. Well, I, you know, th this th we we have suffered a a massive and coordinated uh, attack here, Peter, uh, beyond the scale of anything we have seen before, and be qualitatively different than anything we have seen before, and and. The United States, we, we will determine who is responsible for this. The, the footprint here, so to speak, is, is large enough that, that we will know who is responsible, and America uh, will respond. But we need to do it uh, with determination and also with, with steadiness. Uh, um, we, have to, we have to determine who is responsible, uh, what, why this could happen without detection from so many different locations within the United States, uh, and then uh, 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 respond accordingly. All right, let me ask you this, because you, 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 you've raised the issue. With all of the resources available to American intelligence agencies, not to mention your cooperation with foreign intelligence agencies, you've just said the footprint is large enough we're going to find somebody. What on earth do you mean? Well, we're talking about uh, uh, a number of planes. We've obviously had... had this operation happened relatively simultaneously. It's a sophisticated operation, um, and um, uh, uh, there, there's no question in my mind that we will be able to. We will determine who is responsible, and we will respond in a in a substantial and firm uh, uh, way. This has been uh, a brutal attack against the United States, Mr. Berger. You know better than I do that in the past we sometimes assign blame to people because it's important, but we don't always know who to blame. So can I ask you if you just see any clue this morning, if in your job as National Security Advisor, you see any clue you would have done anything to begin to try to find out who might be responsible for this? Well, I think, you know, I think it is, it, it, be, we have to be careful here not to, jo to jump to, to, to uh, firm conclusions. Uh, we did that after Oklahoma City. We did that after the World Trade Center bombing. They were both wrong. But there are certain elements here, suicide bombings, um, which, which do have the character of uh, radical militants from abroad. Uh, I think that's certainly where uh, I, I know... Uh, uh, the intelligence community is, is uh, focused uh, uh, intensely. I have, one, I have one last question for you, and it's really just a feeling question. You are now an independent consultant uh, helping American businesses do government, do business overseas, or helping other, you know, get through the American bureaucracy. When you talk to your friends and contacts overseas, will they see the United States as weakened by this? Well, I think it's a, it, it, it depends very much, Peter, on how we react as a country. We have suffered a, a grievous attack. Um, but if America here has to respond uh, with uh, steely determination, but also with steadiness, um, and uh, that means, first of all, uh, dealing with the victims, dealing with security, finding out who's responsible, and taking whatever action is necessary and appropriate. It also means uh, continuing uh, 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 to, to expect and demand the highest level of cooperation from the rest of the world in going after this kind of uh, terrorist threat. This is not just an attack on the United States. It's an attack on the civilized world. And it ought to be seen as an attack uh, on our European friends, on our Middle East friends, 
uh, and, and on others. And the response here cannot simply be an American uh, airstrike response. somewhere. In other words, you can't just mount an airstrike against somebody. It won't be satisfying, right? It may well, be satisfying, I, I, it won't be I satisfactory. Would certainly, you don't rule out military, a military component mm -hmm. of this, but you also have to get to the root of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sandy Berger, thank you very much. Former National Security Advisor in the Clinton administration, one of the most important uh, members of the foreign policy establishment in the Clinton administration, now an independent uh, consultant, as people in government tend to do when they leave government. Um, it's been hard this morning as we continue to look at the smoke and the dust drift up from a crime scene, as John Miller called it, which we cannot feel in any intimate way on television, only through our reporters and through getting closer in and talking to the cops and the firefighters and the survivors. But we will in time get in there. But in the meantime, we've been trying very hard to figure out all of these airplanes. Because uh, we have a couple of air... We've got four significant aircraft today which have been involved in disasters and we've asked Lynn Schur, one of our reporters, to try to nail down what we know and what we don't know. Lynn, are you there? I am, Peter. Um, as you point out, it was airplanes that were the weapons of destruction today, not bombs, passenger planes. We actually know very little for sure about what happened, but we do have some details. Um, and bear with me because the, the information keeps changing. But I want to start with the only one that horribly we actually did see happen. And this, of course, was the plane that crashed into World Trade Center number two. Um, that, of course, was the South Tower. That's it on the right. Now, all, and there's the flame from it. That what, you, what you're seeing is the North Tower. Behind it, there's a second identical tower, as you know. That plane crashed right into it. All morning, we have been told uh, by American Airlines, among others, that that flight, that airplane, was actually American Airlines Flight 77 um, going out of uh, Dulles to Los Angeles. Uh, we were told 58 passengers, four flight attendants, two pilots on that plane. It was hijacked at 9.03, I'm sorry, it was hijacked right after takeoff, crashed into the tower. Um, at 9.03 a.m. Let me stop you right there, Lynn, because that, I just, I've had different information, so I'm going to rely on you here. You now believe that American Airlines Flight 77, which took off for Dulles on its way to Los Angeles, crashed into the trade towers, not into the Pentagon. We were told that originally. What I'm about to tell you is that the FBI is now saying that that's the one uh, that went into the Pentagon. Um, uh, the FBI spokesperson is saying that the flight that went into World Trade T uh, Center Tower Number 2, that South Tower, was in fact the United <laughs> Airlines 175, a Boeing 767 that left Boston for LAX, departed at 7.58 a.m. this morning, 56 passengers, two pilots, seven flight attendants. This is confusing. I apologize. We are getting two different answers to our questions. Uh, what I can tell you that appears to be accurate is that the plane that crashed into the north tower of the World Trade Center at 8.45 a.m. was, in fact, American <laughs> Airlines Flight 11, American 1-1, going from Boston to LAX, 7.59 a.m. departure, hijacked right after takeoff, 81 passengers, nine flight attendants, two pilots. We know of one other aircraft involved in today's episode, Peter, United Airlines flight number 93. This was another Boeing, Boeing 757, left Newark at 8.01 this morning on en route to San Francisco, 38 passengers, two pilots, five flight attendants. It went down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, which is near Johnstown, which is just southeast of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I believe we have some video of that crash site right there. Um, and that's where this flight went down. We are waiting for a press conference from the airlines to try to um, uh, make some of this clear to us. But right now, that is all the information we have on those four planes. Can I just absolutely confirm, because I'm trying to make it even clearer for people, or you did a sure. much better job than I did. This is from the FBI spokesperson you're talking about, right? What I'm telling you is that the FBI spokesperson has said United Airlines 175 from Boston to LAX is the one that went into the World Trade Tower number two, the South Tower. The FBI is also telling us that it is American 77 from Dulles to LAX uh, into Los Angeles Airport 
um, that uh, went okay. into the Pentagon. Okay, thank you very much. So what we have now in terms of the trade towers, we have one American Airlines aircraft, one United Airlines aircraft, which hit the two trade towers. We have a second American Airlines aircraft, which goes into the Pentagon. And we have a third aircraft, United Airlines, which we have no idea about either whether it was on a mission or, or for what reason it crashed, crashing southeast of Pittsburgh uh, today. But three major aircraft today carrying considerable numbers of passengers and crew on board are all down, at least three of which, at least three of which appear to have been involved in a coordinated attack on the United States. I should also tell you that abcnews.com um, has, has uh, plays an important role in our life all the time, but it's very important at, at a moment like this and has a good many offerings up at the moment. Uh, including a continuous reporting of, of, of the work we're doing here on television and they're doing on, on, on their own. Uh, there's a reader messenger board up there as always and that very often provides information. Uh, it has a lot of reporting on the status of air travel and the FAA response, most of which I think we've reported here, but if you want to get it locked into your mind, you can go to abcnews.com. And then there is a lot of reporting, as there always is, at abcnews.com about the ramifications of this. Um, to individuals, to communities, and to the country as a whole. Tony Cordesman is in Washington at the moment. And Tony, since I talked to you last, I'm not sure how we break into Peter Jennings right now as you're looking at a live picture of the Pentagon, which is still burning. And we want to bring you up to date on the local situation here in Washington after this terrorist attack hits our nation's capital. Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Matthews. And I'm Maureen Bunyan. And uh, here is what we have, the latest that we have for you. Just a few minutes ago, Mayor Anthony Williams of the district declared that the district is in a state of emergency. He said he did this in order to prepare the city for any possible, any possible future terrorist attacks. Uh, let's go to to uh, his uh, press conference to hear what he had to say. We're, we're uh, declaring a state of emergency in order to put everyone on alert, in order to uh, uh, ensure that we have the highest level of preparedness. Obviously, if something were to happen, God forbid, and we pray, pray that it won't, uh, we will be fully prepared uh, to then execute uh, the necessary contingency plans. Mayor Williams declaring a state of emergency in the city. Also, he told us that 100 police and National Guardsmen have been dispatched for traffic control at major intersections throughout the city. And he said people should stay out of our city. If you don't have to come into Washington, D.C. today, it is not the day to do so. Now, this attack on the uh, Pentagon obviously comes in a sequence of uh, horrible terrorist attacks. And we want to bring you up to date on the planes that are believed to be involved in both the attacks on the uh, Twin Towers up in New York City and here uh, in Washington at the Pentagon. First of all, the FBI is apparently confirming that it was an American Airlines Flight 77, a Boeing 7057, en route from Dulles here in the Washington area uh, to Los Angeles that is the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. However, American Airlines is not confirming the location of where American Airlines Flight 77 is. In addition, we have United Airlines, that's United Airlines Flight uh, 93, and United Airlines Flight 175. 175 was a Boeing 767. That flight was bound from Boston to Los Angeles, carrying 56 passengers, two pilots, and seven flight attendants. We cannot tell you uh, from the airlines where that plane has crashed. And there you see Flight 93, United Airlines. That is the plane that crashed southeast of Pittsburgh. It was en route from Newark, New Jersey, to San Francisco. And finally, that other flight, uh, American Airlines Flight 11, you see there, that was a Boeing. 767 and that is the plane that was en route from Boston to Los Angeles. Now American and United are not confirming where these particular planes crashed. And Kathleen, uh, let's uh, look at what the traffic situation is like around the district at this moment. At this moment, all bridges into the district are closed. You cannot come into the city on one of those bridges, Memorial Bridge, Wilson Bridge, Chain Bridge, of course. All roads are open, however, for people who are trying to leave the city uh, to go home. And uh, D.C. government workers have been sent home. All workers in federal buildings have been sent home, so there is traffic on the streets. Union Station is open, but there are no trains operating between Washington and New York City. Now, especially since one of those flights did originate here at Dulles Airport, we want to give you a telephone number if you have concerns about knowing somebody who might have been on board that flight or any of the other ones that we just showed you. For passenger information, this is the number you can call. It's 
1-800-245-0999. Call that number only if you believe that you do know somebody who was on board and you need to get that information. And uh, we'll have more on this uh, very tragic situation for you as the afternoon continues. We now rejoin ABC at Peter Jennings. You make very good points and you therefore assume that there is a lot of money involved in an operation like this. I think that's a dangerous assumption, Peter. Okay. We always use these phrases, $100 million or $10 million. What it requires is a lot of political commitment, ideological commitment. It isn't something three people can do. It is potentially something that perhaps 30 or 40 can do. It is possible that only one major cell of some terrorist organization is involved. But I think we also have to ask another question now, and that is whether some state that hosted this movement knew about it and assisted. Because there are elements of sophistication which raise that prospect. Stay with us for a second, Tony, because Vince Canestraro, who also talks on the subject of uh, terrorism and does more than talk on the subject of terrorism for us, is also here at the moment. Vince, do you want to make some comments about this? <clears throat> Yeah, Peter, I think that uh, Tony makes some good points about the complexity and the, and the sophistication of the operation. But I think also uh, we have to see what kind of organizations in the past have been willing to do uh, such a coordinated attack. Why, and, uh, why, is, that, why is that a clue? Because it's a, it's a pattern. We see people who committed suicide in these operations. So that points us away from a secular organization to a religiously oriented group. Uh, we've seen a, a pattern uh, of planning against five U.S. airliners in uh, 1993 with Ramzi Youssef when his safe site was uh, uh, inspected in Manila in 93. Uh, the FBI found evidence that he had been planning to hijack and blow up in flight five United airliners uh, flying out of the Far East. Now, that was a very ambitious operation, and I don't think anyone mm -hmm. believed that he could actually uh, have done it. But here we are some, some eight years later, uh, and we see a coordinated operation in three planes hijacked and uh, blown up uh, against targets, in obviously suicide operations, bringing a lot of other people with them. Uh, so it, that tends, us, it tends to point us towards a religiously organized uh, group, uh, perhaps towards al-Qaeda, but again, with some state support. We've seen these groups evolve in their professionalism over the last several years. Uh, we go from... Uh, can I, uh, Vince, can I just sure. interrupt you for one sure. second, just to try to keep you on the straight and narrow here? <laughs> it may be a reach to blame. It may be a reach to blame a religious organization. I, mm -hmm. I, I agree that uh, we've come to accept the notion that uh, some members of uh, some people who, who worship Islam uh, in the Middle East have found a better life giving themselves up as we say, but aren't you sort of already directing and creating something of a mindset about an investigation that's more complicated than that? Oh, oh certainly, and uh, there's no question that uh, this group, whatever it was, had some professional support, perhaps from mm -hmm. a military and a state. Uh, the explosives, the, uh, the way you would uh, fly an aircraft, uh, but it does point towards a group that has members who are willing to kill themselves uh, in carrying out a punishing act against the United States. And there are only a few groups like that that we know of. Secular, radical Palestinian groups traditionally don't do this kind of thing. Right. Uh, we haven't seen that. The ones that we've seen that carried out suicide bombings tend to be Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Al-Qaeda, and of course Hezbollah. And uh, so you've got basically a handful of potential suspects. Uh, none of this proves anything, of course, but it does tend to focus mm. an investigation. Let me ask you both, you, Vince, and then Tony Cordesman, second. Just on the basis of history and on the basis of your own individual expertise, what do you think the chances are of the United States finding out who did this? First of all, you, Vince. I think that there's a fairly good chance of finding out who did this because the people who did this are going to brag, uh, they're going to talk, they're going to try and claim credit in a way that doesn't bring attention directly to them. But they will talk to other people and some of our intelligence resources will pick this up and that will, uh, that will lead us in a certain direction. And then they will go back uh, to the database of 
threat warnings that they've had uh, in the recent past. The U.S. has had a worldwide terrorism alert for some time that was just renewed yesterday, but again, the focus of those threats was abroad, U.S. installations abroad. They'll go back and see whether or not some of their intelligence operations that were picking up these threats may have been the recipient of deception. Uh, in other words, the group that may have done this may have been broadcasting deceptive information that we thought was legitimate threat mm -hmm. information against a foreign installation while they were really planning to do this kind of an operation. Thanks very much, Vince Canestrano. I'll go to Tony okay. Curtis right away, but I just want to remind people, if you watch the news yesterday, you noticed that you recall that we reported that a man named Ahmed Massoud, who was the last independent militia leader, not member of the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, was, we believe, killed. There's still some debate about whether he's dead or not, but certainly was attacked uh, by his enemies, one of, them, one of them disguised as a television cameraman. And the United States was very open to admit that what, you what the United States lost when, uh, when Massoud was killed yesterday was access into Afghanistan for U.S. intelligence operatives. And so I turn out to Tony Cordesman for a quick comment on how quickly, how easily, how complicated, how difficult how impossible might it be to find out who, who did this? Peter, let's consider several realities. We never found and punished the people who blew up the Marine Corps barracks. In Beirut. That's right. right. We have never really addressed who led the attack on al Kober, and the people who've been punished were at the lowest possible level. Those are the civilian and military barracks in Saudi Arabia. That's right. And when we go back to Libya and what happened to Pan Am 103, one person has been imprisoned. We have never mm. gone beyond attacking low-level people in an incident of this magnitude to attack the leaders mm. and the core of the group with success. But we have never before really mm. encountered things so serious that we are on the edge of war. And, the, and in, in the case of Pan Am 103, the United States alternated between blaming Syria for supporting the operation and or Libya, which supported the operation. So you're really reaffirming how complicated this is. More than that, Peter, I think the key element is that if any state is involved in this in any way, if it knew this was going to happen or it shelters a movement once we identify it, we find ourselves with mm -hmm. issues about war and peace, which we have never before encountered in terrorism. Well. You certainly put your finger on, on, on one more part. I'd like you to hold that, Tony, for a second, because nothing could be more, in some respects, potentially dangerous at the moment. But let's not lose focus for today. Um, we'll come back to Tony Cordesman and talk about American reaction to the rest of this world. But in the meantime, we have a disaster here in New York City, uh, which is a national disaster. And we have a disaster in Washington because there's been an attack on the nation's military establishment. And we have at least one major plane crash in Pennsylvania today, which we believe is related, but in its own way is a national disaster, as the crash of a major airliner often is. And I want to go to, before we get carried away by theory on terrorism, no offense to my colleagues, let's go back to lower Manhattan, where Bob Jamison is with George Stephanopoulos. And Bob has been visiting hospitals in the last little while, and so I think the two of you together can bring us up to date on the scene. George, if I might, I'll start first, because I've just returned from St. Vincent's Hospital, which, Peter, is a little more than a mile from the World Trade Center and is a principal destination today for those who were injured in this disaster. And as one measure of how large it is, by midday, there were about 200 people, 18 of them critically injured, who were brought to St. Vincent's, which is about 20 more than were injured, uh, than were brought to St. Vincent's after the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. The injuries that the doctors are reporting are not principally uh, respiratory injuries, which was the case in 1993, but these are largely crushing injuries. And Peter, five hours after the first plane went into the World Trade Center, ambulances are still arriving regularly at St. Vincent's. They are conducting triage, you know, classifying the degree of injury outside on the sidewalk in front of St. Vincent's and they don't have a clear idea of how many more injured 
may go there as well as the other hospitals in New York and now we hear some in New Jersey. And Peter that's in part because we've just got a report from John McKenzie out in the field who talked to William Hull the head of the uh, Port Authority who said that formal search and rescue operations haven't even begun yet. The bulk of the, the effort right now by the police and the fire department and others is simply to establish the integrity, the safety of the World Trade Center building. Second, what was what's left on the site of the World Trade Center. Secondly, Peter, they reported that there is a staggering number of firefighters still on the site, up to 200 that they can't account for yet. They were able to talk to one firefighter on the scene, though, who said that their biggest problem now is not having fire hydrants to put out these small pockets of fires that are, that are cropping up all across the site. And secondly, Peter, there's a problem now with broken gas lines, which they fear could ignite further explosions. Uh, George, can Peter, I just... If I might add, yeah, go ahead, Bob. I, I, just to add one thing, uh, I was struck by something at St. Vincent's. The Red Cross, as you may know, has put out a plea for blood donors, mm. particularly those with uh, the less common types of blood, such as O. But even before that plea went out, thousands of people spontaneously showed up at St. Vincent's. Thousands of people. And many of them told us, this is what we think we can do to help. We can't do anything else. Sitting at home watching on television won't help at this point. Well, Bob, you're quite right. And in fact, there's you, no reason you would have heard us. But we mentioned a short while ago that blood donors in Nebraska, uh, one of their first instincts, were people in Nebraska, one of their first instincts was to go and respond to a request for blood donations. Because as you've just pointed out, and we've said before, there's a critical shortage of blood in the United States. And we've heard from the Red Cross any number of times in the last year or so that, that the country needs blood and it's not going to be available. And so it is, it is reassuring to hear in New York City people doing that instinctively. Bob, let me ask you both, and start with you and then George. My sense of the recovery, uh, if that's the word for it, of this phase of what's going on down there is to deal with people who are injured who are clearly not in or under the World Trade Towers. Am I right? Yes, I think that's correct. And a large number of them, in one way or another, uh, are some of the emergency and rescue people. And then the next step, as we have seen in other disasters, will be to see who else there is. And, and George, we've all, you know, we've been, we've seen buildings collapsed. It sometimes takes days to discover um, people under collapsed buildings, and we now have a circumstance. Do we have any idea how many people got out before the building collapsed? We don't, do we? Not a, not a very good idea, Peter. We do know that there was some warning. As I said earlier, we spoke to some of the security guards who were on the site, and they did have some warning. There was a feeling that the second building was going to collapse, so the evacuation did begin from people as high up as in the 82nd and 86th floors, but we don't know how many were able to get out. And we do know, Peter, from at least one of the security guards, that they, they were nowhere near complete. They, had nowhere, they hadn't come even close to completing the evacuation. But and, we don't have numbers. And Peter, the, the adding to, a little bit to the confusion, uh, the collapse of the North Tower mm. may have affected other buildings around sure. there, as well as uh, the collapse of the Millennium Hotel. Well, thank you both very much, and, and both of you come back at any time that you, uh, that you want, uh, want and can or contribute to this. We can tell you that the military, thank you both very much, Bob Jamison and George Stephanopoulos. Thank you. Um, we can tell you that the military, uh, the governor said earlier, the governor of New York, that the National Guard was going to come in, and there's National Guard on station in some parts of the city anyway, is, is setting up a temporary morgue on the piers in New York City near West 57th Street. Uh, which is where people often take off to go and have a tour of New York City uh, from the air um, and uh, close by where the famous Circle Line leaves so people can take a tour around the island of Manhattan and see what it looks like. And none of that traffic is permitted today. The only traffic we have seen on the Hudson River has been, as has been pointed out to us several times, John Miller particularly, pointing out that ferries are taking wounded across the river, across the Hudson River to New Jersey. ABC Cynthia McFadden is on the phone at the moment. She is from uh, calling us from Bellevue Hospital, which is over on the east side of Manhattan, quite some distance from this. Sylvia, do you hear me? Cynthia, do you hear me? I do, Peter. Can you tell uh, us what's going on there? Yeah, we've been able to get into the Disaster Command Center, which is located here at Bellevue. As you say, it's about 20 or 30 blocks north and east of the actual site of the Twin Towers. But this is where the city puts its resources for, to prepare for an emergency. They rehearse here, practice here for disasters, and today uh, 
we were allowed uh, in the first uh, first group of journalists to go inside and see where they were running the disaster relief from. Let me paint a picture for you, if, if I might, of the room. It's about a 30 by 15 room, about 10 people crowded around a conference table, mm. uh, about 15 phone lines coming into the room. Uh, the mayor's office, emergency services, police and fire, all of those efforts being coordinated through this room. Uh, it was surprisingly calm, surprisingly quiet. Uh, it is located in the heart of the emergency room here at Bellevue Hospital, Peter, and the emergency room itself is busy. They've had about 140 to 150 people come through Bellevue so far. Um, we've also had the opportunity to talk to the director of the hospital here and to the man who heads up the emergency room. I can tell you a little bit about the injuries if, you're, if, if you'd like. Please do. Um, because this is a, fur a hospital further away, they're getting the less seriously injured, although, having said that, of the 140 or 50 people, 40 of them are classified in serious condition. Two were dead on arrival. They have one baby who is being treated. Three to five operating rooms are currently um, uh, going uh, with the, what the doctor characterized as extremely serious surgeries. Uh, the doctor running the operation here said that they have sent a team of physicians closer to the site and they're going to be setting up tent hospitals closer to the site to help some of the uh, enormous uh, flow of injuries. Nobody made it here to this hospital until about two hours after the blast. And uh, they believe, I've, I've been listening to the coverage, they, they believe that it's not going to be for another many more hours until they feel the full brunt of this over here. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia, very much. Come back to us, please. <clears throat> Uh, when you uh, when you when you get even better handle of this, we've talked a little bit about the blood shortage, which, as I said, is a national issue. But in New York City, there is uh, there are supplies of blood so far. People did respond very quickly and lined up ready to give blood at some of the blood centers here. There is a supply of O type blood. Um, o negative appears, as best we can understand from the people who are collecting it, is the most important kind of blood needed at the moment because it's the universal donor meaning anyone can actually get it. Now, there's a slight bit more of information, uh, like all information today, reasonably suspect at the outset, but uh, the Associated Press is reporting that this airliner, this United, Air United Airlines uh, jet, which crashed in Pennsylvania, which is a um, American Airlines, my apologies, United Airlines Flight 93. I don't quite know exactly what aircraft it was, a 767, I think. Um, which we assessed uncertain about, did not know why it, it had crashed, whether it was part of this overall operation this morning. The AP is now quoting a man um, who minutes earlier, saying he was a passenger on the plane, told an emergency dispatcher in a cell phone call that we are being hijacked, we are being hijacked treat that as you do all the information we give you today as being uh, preliminary at best, sometimes wrong. I think we've been pretty good about it today and, and certainly confused because listening to the mayor, listening to uh, the governor of the state, both of whom we talked to, listening to the senator in charge of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, listening to all of our analysts, listening to everybody, uh, the country is still very much in the middle of, if not immediate post event chaos, certainly in terms of trauma and trying to get a handle on what the hell's been going on here. And as we've said before, when you look at the television pictures of the Trade Center collapsed upon itself, these are buildings 110 stories high and where thousands and thousands and thousands of people work. And I know on occasion we can run the images of it to the point of offensiveness I hope we're not there, but this is what it looked like when one of the trade towers just appeared to either peel away or collapse on itself, but from top to bottom, 110 stories to the bottom. First one, the southern tower, tower one or tower two, it doesn't matter what, just one tower and then the other, and then the other tower sometime later, which John Miller said the cops picked up very quickly, it was looking weak and bending or, or leaning in one particular direction, indicating that when those two aircraft, one hitting one tower, the other hitting an hour, another, had, had, 
had had been in had gone straight into those towers with such force that even at the midpoint of the building or in that case two-thirds up something had happened to so totally weaken the infrastructure that this was like peeling a banana except that it was full of people or had many many people in it I think we have Senator John McCain on the phone from Washington am I right senator yes Peter how are you I'm well sir thank you I'm not well none of us are well yeah. you know yeah. that yes what's on your mind well, um, I, I think that this uh, act, obviously, is one which would constitute an act of war. I believe that the American people could, should remain calm and rally behind our president, and I am confident that our military and our president will find out the perpetrators of this outrage, and uh, we will not only punish those responsible, but ensure that uh, something like this never happens again. And clearly, we need to look at our intelligence capabilities. I don't mean for one second, Senator, to, to belittle the necessary thing you must say today, which is we'll find those who are responsible and we'll punish them, because Tony Cordesman has just pointed out very effectively how often we don't find the people and we don't get to punish them. But you say it an act of war. Yes. Um, do you believe that if another country is somehow the patron of an individual or a group of individuals who has done this, we should go to war with that country? Absolutely, because they have uh, committed uh, atrocity on a scale that's unprecedented uh, in history that I know of. Uh, uh, everybody's talking about a second Pearl Harbor. At least that was an attack on military targets, uh, not on the civilian community. Um, this is an unspeakable outrage, and clearly uh, we can and must uh, find out who uh, perpetrated it. And I, mm. Tony Cordesman and I, I have great respect for him, but I believe that we have the capability to find it out. And we need to improve our intelligence capabilities, particularly in the area of human intelligence. We have wonderful satellite capabilities and technical capabilities. In the late 70s and early 80s, we, mm. for all intents and purposes, dismantled our human intelligence mm. capability, which divines motives. And that's something technical intelligence has cannot do well I think we those of us who cover intelligence in any way senator know that human intelligence or human as they call it in the trade has been very difficult yes. particularly in places like Afghanistan so just assume for a second well no don't assume anything but are you desperately yes. frustrated at the moment in some respects because this was sort of in, in many ways this was bound to happen in some measure and we may not be able to get at the perpetrators um, no, I, I, I think that one of the, among many other things, uh, the, obviously sorrow is the overriding emotion, but uh, also I don't think our lives will ever be the same again in some respect, especially those who use airliners with some frequency. There's always been questions and studies and tests of our airport security systems, and they've always found breaches in them. Obviously, that's going to have to be addressed, and that's going to be very inconvenient for Americans. But at the same time, uh, we also have to reevaluate the importance of uh, of making sure that uh, that these anyone who wants to try it is incapable of doing so but the best way to address it obviously is going to the source you, you, your 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 democratic colleague senator biden said a while ago the terrorist wins again when it when it alters american lifestyle i, I assume you believe the same thing oh absolutely absolutely and uh, uh the the, the things that have been inflicted on the American people uh, is, you know, I mean, it, it, it staggers the imagination. And yet I believe that the best thing that we can do as Americans is remain calm, rally behind the President of the United States, and know with, with confidence that we will take whatever steps are necessary to prevent this from happening again. I don't think that there's any reason for Americans to feel a sense of panic. Okay. Thank you, Senator McCain, very much Thank indeed. You. Thank appreciate you. your time. Senator John McCain of Arizona, who uh, knows a lot about violence, and uh, many people in the country will think knows a lot about leadership uh, as well, former presidential candidate, often talking about doing it, or often considered to be doing it again. Claire Shipman is in Washington. Claire, um, where's Mr. Bush? Well, Peter, we have a little bit of news on that front. As you know, he is in the air again on his way somewhere from Shreveport, Louisiana. We have been told by sources that he will not be coming to Washington. He is going to make another stop at an undisclosed secure location so that 
He can talk to people from there on the ground. His security team can assess just how safe it is back here in Washington. As you mentioned earlier, that there must be great political pressure for him to get back to Washington. These sources confirm just that. The political team wants him back home. He wants to come back home. His security team does not feel it is safe right now. They do think, though, and they're guessing right now, that he might be able to get back at some point this evening. But again, he's got at least one more stop. Another interesting point along well, one, those lines. Uh, hold on, hold on. One, one more stop. One more stop between Shreveport and Washington. He's on his way now, we're told, to, to another undisclosed location that his security team considers secure. They won't tell us where it is, obviously. But we know. So, in other words, this one more stop is another security stop dictated by the Secret Service? Indeed it is. And we would be guessing if we talked about another Air Force base or something of the kind. But they have a number of stops. And I'm told this one is not anywhere in the direction of Washington, that they have a number of places they can take him. Let me ask you this. Have you heard any mention whatsoever of the possibility the president will come to New York? No, there was a rumor to that effect earlier, Peter, but that was shot down, and, and my sources tell me he is not going anywhere near New York right now. That situation would create chaos that New York just doesn't need at, that point, at this point. Absolutely. Um, they've also told us that their full security plan is in effect. They do have the House and Senate leadership out of town. Condoleezza Rice is the only senior official remaining at the White House, and she will remain at the White House to try to coordinate efforts from there. Mrs. Bush has also been spirited away. She was on Capitol Hill this morning, set to address Congress. She's been taken to an undisclosed location. Peter. Now, uh, there was some mention that the, and again, but there was some mention of the fact that the, the United Airlines aircraft that crashed east to southeast of Pittsburgh may have been, in fact, going in the direction of Camp David. Had you heard that? I heard that, as you did. Um, my security sources don't know anything about that, okay. so we haven't been able to confirm anything along okay. those okay. lines. Then we'll leave it alone. Claire, thanks very much. We'll come back to you. Some of you know where the president uh, is going to go next. It seems a little bit strange. Uh, Pierre Thomas, work on the phones on the FBI. What have you got, Pierre? Well, one of the first things that they are focused on, obviously, is the injured, but the next priority is to get to Dulles International Airport, which they are, and Boston Logan. They are going to talk to the Boston uh, United and American airline officials. They are trying to get a sense of who was on the plane. Early on, they're very limited in what they can do. They're trying to assess the situation, but one of the first things they can try to do is try to get a sense of who was on the plane, try to begin to check out aliases, and that might lead them in some investigative direction. But they're very limited in the early stages in terms of what they can do. Hello, I'm Del Walters in the ABC7 studios. We're going to rejoin ABC in just a second, but we wanted to bring you up to date on the second prong and what has been now a two-pronged terrorist attack here, and that being the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. You were looking live at a picture there where at this hour the flames still continue to burn. Joining Dell, I'm Kathleen Matthews, and we want to take you back several hours to about 10 o'clock this morning when a plane crashed into the Pentagon. And as you can see, damage and destruction there caused by that plane. While we are not getting confirmation from American Airlines as to what plane that was, apparently FBI sources have been telling ABC News that the plane that crashed into the Pentagon was American Airlines Flight 77. That was a Boeing 757 that actually took off from Dulles Airport and was en route to Los Angeles. Now we understand that plane, the airlines are confirming that that plane was carrying 58 passengers, four flight attendants, and two pilots. Now again, the airlines will not confirm where, where that airplane has crashed, but FBI sources have told ABC News that that American Airlines fly, flight is the one that crashed into the Pentagon. We're going to update you on the injuries in a second, but first we want to bring you up to date on a phone number that we've been given by the Pentagon. If you are a Pentagon employee who evacuated the building, they want to hear from you. They're trying to get an accounting as to who may or may not be inside the building. The number that you can call is there on your screen. It is 1-877-663-6772. Again, that is the number for Pentagon employees, Pentagon personnel who may have evacuated the building this morning so that they can get an idea as just to how many people inside the Pentagon at this hour they still are searching for. It's been four and a half hours since that plane crashed into the Pentagon and the uh, injury list is climbing. Here's the very latest. Virginia Hospital Center is reporting that they have received 30 injured people. Washington Hospital Center is reporting they have received five critical uh, uh, pa uh, patients. A lot of these are burn victims. And George Washington Hospital is confirming that they have two 
from the Pentagon attack who were in their emergency room. Now, we understand that there are at least 75 people who've been injured who are still on the ground at the Pentagon, and because they cannot bring aircraft into that area to medevac them out, they're unable to fly them to local hospitals, and so they're setting up a triage unit there at the Pentagon to be able to treat those, pas those patients. And now on to the situation in the district. A little more than an hour ago at about 1.30 Eastern time, D.C. Mayor Anthony Williams declared a state of emergency in the district. He said that if you don't have business in the city, please don't come. Emergency personnel are overwhelmed. Here's a little bit of what he said. We're uh, declaring a state of emergency in order to put everyone on alert, in order to uh, ensure that we have the highest level of preparedness. Obviously, if something were to happen, God forbid, and we pray, pray that it won't, uh, we will be fully prepared uh, to then execute uh, the necessary contingency plans. And to that extent, the mayor also promised that there will be live news conferences that will take place at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 5 o'clock. We will let you know the details of those news conferences. Well, emergency personnel have been dispatched to try to take control of the traffic situation, which has been mayhem in downtown Washington. As a result, a lot of buildings closing. And this is the latest situation out in Virginia. Route 50, 66, 29, and GW Parkway are now closed inbound. So any of those inbound routes are now closed. Uh, medical personnel only allowed on those routes on the inbound roads. Uh, medical personnel only allowed also on Canal Road, which is now one way outbound. Rock Creek Parkway, all lanes northbound. In other words, they've reverted to a uh, rush hour situation where all of the, uh, the roads are now outbound to take people out of the city to try to uh, bring control to that, uh, that chaos down. Downtown. Again, we are four and a half hours into what has been a two-pronged terrorist attack, one taking place in New York, the other here in Washington. ABC is working with us. We are working with them to try and get you as much information as we possibly can. We're going to go back now to ABC's live coverage of the events that are unfolding. For the national tragedy that has occurred today, all Major League Baseball games for today have been canceled. The PGA Tour has canceled uh, the beginning of tournaments on Thursday. And whether they will be further delayed is uncertain. Major League Soccer postponed all of the games it had scheduled for tomorrow night. And the National Football League says it is mulling over whether to postpone this weekend's schedule. Obviously, the effects of this are going to reverberate for many days, many weeks, many months. Yep. And uh, so there are those kinds of cancellations uh, being discussed. Okay, thanks, uh, Charlie. Go ahead. I, 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 thanks. I just, as we count, want to go to uh, try to bring it back together for people who, a lot of people have been not with us all day. The thousands and millions of people may have been glued to their televisions, impossible not to. But ABC's John Donvan has been following the events of the last few hours, and he has managed to put together, I suppose we could call it a chronology or a timeline, if you will. But here is some sense of what happened from the beginning. We want to tell you what we know as we know it, but we just got a report in that there's been some sort of explosion at the first the thing World any Trade television Center camera saw this morning was City. this just before One nine o'clock, roughly 15 minutes earlier, an American Airlines jet hijacked from Boston had crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. There were 92 people on board. It does not appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my God. Oh my God. That looks like a second plane. As just I didn't see a plane go in. That, that Minutes later, the second plane, the second tower. The fireball ate up the aircraft. It was a United Airlines flight, a 767 from Boston to Los Angeles. There had been 65 people on board. I was happened to look on the first tower, and I actually saw people waving where the first plane crashed through, and then it was unbelievable seeing this second jet come crashing into the second tower. It's, what is going on? New York City was staggered. As soon as you got hit, I was thrown to a window. So I was very lucky. We're going to interrupt this. We'll come back to this, I promise you, to go to a news conference being held by the mayor of New York, Rudolph Giuliani. And then, uh, Governor, thank you very, thank you, very much for your assistance and your help and your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for your leadership through this crisis. This is uh, a vicious attack upon New York. It's an attack upon America. It's an attack upon the whole concept of freedom and our way of life. Uh, and we cannot let these at attacks succeed. 
Uh, first step has to be to make sure we do everything in our power to protect the people and to save the lives of those who, whose lives are still at risk and to help those who have been injured. And I want to commend the mayor and I want to thank my colleagues from Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and the federal government have all offered and made ready uh, support to help us uh, deal with this ongoing crisis. Uh, the people of New York are uh, not only the, the freest and most diverse people in the world, we're also, I believe, the most capable of rising to meet the challenges of this type of attack. And right now we want New Yorkers to uh, remain calm, to go about their business, to appreciate the fact that everything to provide for their safety is being done, to appreciate that everything that can be done to provide for the health and the needs of the people who are still at risk is being done, and that we will continue to work to make sure that we get through this uh, as strongly and quickly as possible. I want to thank the uh, federal administration. Secretary Thompson has been on the phone with me a number of times, as well as the president, uh, for what they are offering and prepared to do. Uh, and we're just uh, confident that, uh, uh, well, this is a horrible attack, and one that uh, is despicable and uh, really unthinkable in its magnitude. We will get through this, uh, and we will continue to have a great and free country, state, and society. Do we know the number of casualties at this point, sir? I don't, I don't think we, we really want to speculate about that. The number of casualties will be more than any, any of us can bear, ultimately. And I don't think we want to speculate on the number of casualties. The effort now has to be to save as many people as possible. And I don't, think, I don't think we will know the answer to that until sometime tomorrow or the next Were there day. large numbers of firefighters? There are a large number of firefighters and police officers who are uh, in harm's way. And we don't know how, ma how many we've lost. But there's no doubt we've lost, we've lost some firefighters and police officers. Do you know anything about the cause of the explosions that brought the two buildings down yet? Was it caused by the planes or by something else? We, be we, we, believe, we believe that it was caused by the after effects of the, of the planes hitting the, the, the buildings. We don't, we don't know of an additional explosion after that. Could you tell us, do you expect any further attacks on New York? Is there anything to indicate that there could be more bombs, more planes out there? I know originally there was a report that eight planes had been hijacked, four have only been accounted for. What about the remaining four? And is there any possibility that there could be bombs on the ground planted by some... We have no specific in information to that effect. Obviously, the city is now closed. The airspace around the city is closed. Uh, and we are on heightened alert. But we have no specific information suggesting any further attack. Are there two major warships coming into the port of New York? I think to give the people of New York confidence, to show that the federal government is standing with us, and and to uh, just to make certain that nothing further happens. This has been a very, very difficult and traumatic day for the people of the United States and the people of the city. And I think that it's, a, it's an act that shows that the federal government is going to do everything they can to support us and help us. Can you give us an idea of the extent of the, um, the rescue effort that's going on right now in Lower Manhattan, the scope of this, thing, uh, this operation? There, there are over 1,000 rescue workers, probably about 2,000 that are deployed, trying to get into the buildings, trying to find people, trying to search for people. The governor and I spoke a couple of hours ago. The governor has deployed the National Guard to relieve them because our, our people are going to need reinforcements pretty pretty soon but right now they don't want to leave because they're searching they're searching for innocent citizens and they're searching for some of their some of their brothers and sisters are you finding survivors yes they we have um, we have some numbers that we can give you we have 1500 people at Liberty State Park who were evacuated described as walking wounded they were evacuated by ferry and other means there are about 600 as of about 15 minutes ago in local hospitals that we account for, 600 people that are being treated in local hospitals. And there are 150 uh, in particular that were critical that were moved by EMS. New York City has 170 hospitals. So we have a lot of hospitals and we're utilizing all of them. Probably the one that was the hardest hit was St. Vincent's Hospital. And I would like to just single them out and commend them. Because as I was rushing down there, after the first plane hit, and before the second, they were already deploying people on the street. I could see the doctors and nurses outside getting ready to receive people. And that was before the second plane actually hit the World Trade Center. What was, what was, your, experience, was your experience down there? I, I also blood donations. We have several sites for blood donations. 153 East 53rd Street, 
66th and Amsterdam, which is the Red Cross, and 310 East 67th Street. Uh, we, if people want to do something and they can donate blood, that, that's going to help not just today, but tomorrow and the next day. This, uh, this relief effort is going to take uh, some time. Mr. Mayor, you experience? were one of the first people down there. Can you describe the scene in your own words, what you saw down there? I don't know that I'm really able to describe it. It was the most horrific scene I've ever seen in my whole life. Uh, we saw the, the uh, World Trade Center uh, in flames, a big gaping hole all the way on the top of it. We could see people jumping from the top of the building. Um, and then uh, we, we went into uh, Barclay Street, 75 Barclay Street, I think it was, and we were there when the building collapsed, and it collapsed in part on 75 Barclay Street. So we were trapped in the building for maybe 10 or 15 minutes trying to get out different exits. And we finally went through a basement and came out 100 Park, Park Place. Did you ever fear for your own safety, sir? Sure, yeah. What went through your mind? I don't think anything went through my mind other than uh, uh, making sure that we all remained calm and found an exit and just tried to figure out the most intelligent thing to do. Probably the same thing that went through the minds of uh, 10,000 other New Yorkers who uh, I could see on the streets. And I really have to commend them. If you really want to know what New Yorkers were all about, you just watch the way in which they handled themselves. They didn't panic. They moved deliberately. They moved swiftly. But they didn't hurt each other. They helped each other. I mean, these are just the most wonderful people in the world. Do we know anything about the composition of that dust that Blanket Sloman had? Is there any asbestos or any hazardous material in that dust? I, uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Mr. Mayor, are there any reports of a gas explosion related to this? Are you aware of that? There was a gas leak or possible... So we don't believe that we, do, we, do, we, do not, we don't believe that's the case. Mr. Mayor, Mayor can you tell us anything about uh, where the planes the come from, I, where uh, the, the aircraft came from? Bill Diamond reminds me that we've turned off the gas in the city, in the city buildings, just to be certain. Can you tell us a precaution. About where these aircraft came from? There was a report that may have been hijacked in uh, Boston. I don't, I don't, I, I, I think we should leave, I think we should leave that up to the federal government to, to re yes, we do have some information, but I think we should leave that up to the federal government to release that, in, that information. Our focus is on the relief efforts. And Governor, do you what think about the security for the rest of the on the part of the United States for what happened here in this country, both in New York, Washington, and other places? The first step right now, Marsha, is to make sure we do everything to help those people who need our uh, support, and they're, whether they're injured or uh, still uh, trapped in buildings. Uh, the second thing is to make sure at the same time we're providing the maximum security against possible additional incidents. Uh, but clearly, this is an attack upon America, it's an attack upon our freedom and our way of life, and we must retaliate and go after those who perpetuated this heinous crime against the people of America. Mayor, this is Cheryl, just compared to Pearl Harbor. Cheryl, 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 tell us what the Cheryl doing. What this has this has been compared to, I'll do both. I'll do this both. has been compared to Pearl Harbor. Do you consider this, this to be is a, this, is, this is a vicious, unprovoked, uh, horrible attack on innocent uh, men, women, and children. It's one of the most heinous acts Probably, certainly in, in, in world history. And um, as the governor said, and, uh, and I said to the president, we fully and completely support him in any action that he has to take uh, in order to uh, make an example out of the people who are responsible for this. Is it an act of war in your mind? I don't know that I, I, don't know that I want to use those words. I think the president is the one that has to respond. And I think what he has to know is that all of us in New York support him and uh, support him completely in the efforts that he's going to have to make over the next couple of days, week, and to make a point that, uh, that people can't do this. You can't attack innocent men, women, and children. Uh, and ultimately, I'm totally confident that American democracy and the American rule of law will prevail. And the people of New York are going to help to demonstrate that over the next couple of days. How many people Anybody take Carol? responsibility for this? Any group take responsibility at this time? And what is the city doing to safeguard the citizens now that something like this has happened? Well, uh, first of all, I don't know if anyone has taken responsibility for it at this time. And secondly, the, the uh, New York City Police Department is fully deployed, not just in the rescue effort, but all throughout the city of New York, uh, offering as much protection and as much security as we're capable of for the citizens of the city. And uh, at this point, I believe that the people in New York City can demonstrate our resolve and our support for all of the people that were viciously attacked today by going about their lives and showing everyone that vicious, cowardly terrorists can't stop us from being a free country and a place that uh, functions. And we'll do everything we can to make that point. Jennifer Steinauer, Jennifer Steinauer, please. Just a half, can, can you please, please tell, tell us what's going to happen to the New York primary? 
<laughs> this morning, I, I issued an order suspending the primary across the state. There will be no primary today, and we'll reschedule it once we get through this. How many people Jennifer, would you like us to do municipal services right now? What's going on with the subway and the schools, the courts? The subway, the, the, the schools, uh, the, the chancellor, uh, I, I, I commend the chancellor. He was on the phone a number of times with us. He coordinated very, very carefully what, what would happen. He thought it out, and he came up with a very good plan, which was essentially to keep the schools open, to keep the children in school so we didn't have a large number of children in, in the different boroughs that would be released from school. They're being, uh, they're being released, uh, not, I, I shouldn't say as normal, but basically on the normal schedule. Uh, if parents aren't there to pick up the young children, then the children will be taken to uh, a center and the parents will be notified to come and pick them up. The children who have metro cards who normally travel on the subway will be able to do that. The subways are functioning in four of the five boroughs and uh, can we get an update, Joe, on how the subway is doing all, in Manhattan? All the lettered lines are working. And in Manhattan? In Manhattan, lines, all the lettered lines all are working. All the lettered lines are working, including in Manhattan. And throughout the rest of the city, public transportation is, is normal. So the children should be able to return from school in the normal fashion. And if any children don't have parents to pick them up, then we'll hold them, let the parents know, and then the parents can come Mr. and pick Mayor, them up. Mr. Mayor, you mentioned you were on Barclay Street. What's the radius of damage that's been affected? Uh, how many other side streets around the world? I don't think we know yet. Uh, th that The whole area of Lower Manhattan has been uh, very much affected by it. Uh, how, how, many, how, many how many police and fire are involved? Like how many uh, all NYPD off-duty officers that they come in? They're like all, all NYPD and FDNY uh, officers are on, on duty now. And we're going to need all of them, and we're and again, thanks to the governor and uh, the way in which the state reacted, we will have uh, 15, 1600 National Guard to relieve them over over a period of time, so we can get some relief for them. If anybody's Sir. looking for someone that may have been in the World Trade Center or in and around that area, what should they do? How can they get it? We're going to give you numbers so that we can try to help coordinate that. Individual businesses have already done that, but we will we will as soon as we can uh, find some time from the uh, relief efforts, give you a number in which people can call and then we can direct them to the right place. Are the National Guard loading or anything like that? Sir? Any lawlessness? Uh, Th there have been no reports of lawlessness. No the governor of New York State, Governor George Pataki, the mayor, Mayor Giuliani, between him, the police commissioner just over on the right side of the picture there, the fire commissioner, the police commissioner more than anybody else being uh, almost a restraining influence there, trying to, to say both to the governor and to the mayor, be, be careful what you say here, we don't have we don't have information on this, that, and the other thing. And on this question of casualties, it is the mayor who is attested to what everybody's got going, rushing around in their minds at the moment, more casualties, more than anyone can bear, but not willing to make perfect sense, not willing at this point to put a number on the people who they believe um, have been killed and or injured. Uh, the mayor did say that in one of the parks in the lower part of Manhattan, 1,500 people were regarded as as walking wounded, uh, they were um, aware of 600 people in local hospitals, and New York City has 170 hospitals, and as the mayor said, uh, every one of them is available under these circumstances. And there were 150 critical conditions which were taken out, which were medevaced out, or taken out under other circumstances, some of them going across uh, the river to New Jersey. And in one case, according to the Canadian television network, uh, saying had been airlifted as far away as Canada, uh, in order to uh, to get special medical care. Canada has a very strong, uh, several very strong centers in burn treatment. So it may be one of the reasons that, that, pass that uh, patients have gone uh, up that far. The mayor returning again to this thing which has clearly moved him, I think, more than anything else today, uh, getting down there and seeing the two trade towers before they collapsed on themselves and seeing the fires burning up high, and he said it every time, and seeing the people jumping from the top of the trade towers, um, driven uh, to their deaths by the encroaching fire in the, in the rooms in which they no longer felt they were particularly safe. And Governor Pataki, uh, I think the first person today to say in the clearest language has got to be retaliation. Lots of people said, if you find out who has done this, you've got to be held accountable. Uh, mayor being reluctant to say whether or not the country was in a state of war, um, which is a technical thing, I think, for him in many ways. Um, but that's pretty much, I think, the summary of their, of the highlights of their news conference, in which there seems to be um, a real coordination 
between the local and the state and the federal. And we have here with us um, a man who should know whether or not it's working, Jerry Hauer, who's the former head of New York City Mayor's Office of Emergency Management. And the last time I saw you was in that place on the west side of Manhattan, which you had designed for just an event, or maybe an event not just like this. Yeah, th this certainly is uh, uh, an incredible event, Peter. Um, I don't think in our wildest imagination uh, you could think about a day where uh, simultaneous attacks, you know, we all think about it, we plan for it, but uh, to have something like this occur is, is uh, uh, certainly, um, uh, I view it as an attack mm -hmm. on our nation. But, um, but was it, I understand your, I understand your emotional state, I like sure. everybody's the same, I think we're all the same. Sure. Did you never consider that this was a possibility? Well, we, um, we consider, and as we plan for New York City, we plan for massive events. Um, in point of fact, one of the things that we did when I was still heading up OEM, was we put in place um, uh, memorandums of understanding with New Jersey, with Connecticut, Nassau, Suffolk County, uh, to ensure that um, the, uh, there was enough medical care available, that uh, we had ambulances, police, firefighters, because we, uh, we had to plan for uh, horrific types of events. Uh, and as I told you when you were down, uh, we planned for uh, various types of incidents, mm. chemical and biological uh, types of attacks, for um, uh, explosive types of uh, attacks. Mm. Um, you know, this, this is clearly uh, an, an, just a, a devastating uh, type mm. of an incident here in the city. The Office of Emergency Management Office, that bunker, it's a pretty elegant bunker, and nor is it underground. It was second or third floor, right. I think. That's out of operation at the moment. Yeah, my understanding That's is... That's something you never planned for. Yeah, well, in fact, we did. Uh, oh. The alternate uh, was to go to police headquarters or to another location um, in the event uh, that the command center was um, uh, inactivated for some reason or uh, rendered useless. Um, my Do you know what has happened to it today? Do you know yeah. precisely what's happened? I talked to some folks down there, and my understanding is that a lot of the debris has fallen and uh, has blocked uh, the access to the building. Um, I've heard some uh, reports that the, they're concerned about the structural stability of the building, uh, but um, I, I have not been able to confirm that. But as part of our plan, uh, there were backups. Um, you always have black backups mm. in your planning, mm. and uh, that's what the city is doing today. Now, you've had to walk to get here today, and that's perfectly sure. understandable. We're on the west side of Manhattan, and, and things are that difficult. But do you have a sense of how it's going? And we've heard the mayor's appraisal and accept it as an honest one. Do you have any sense of how the system's working, and do you have any sense of how many people are still trapped or dead? Well, I, uh, first of all, I think that um, uh, things are working um, uh, as they should. I think that, you know, when you've got uh, the best police and fire department uh, anywhere in the world, um, it, they are doing um, everything to try and rescue people, to try and uh, get near the building. But you've got to also realize the dynamics in a situation like this change a bit when you have a number of police and firefighters injured as well. Sure. And that's what we saw this morning. Uh, the, the, uh, I was listening to the fire radio this morning when the building collapsed and they were uh, uh, screaming for help because firefighters were trapped. So the, the, the emotion changes a bit, but these are extremely professional people. Mm -hmm. These are uh, very heroic people. They will do everything they can uh, to uh, try and get in and rescue anybody that could potentially be alive in that building recognizing that there is a potential for additional collapse. What about the prospect, as the governor's announced, of the National Guard being called into New York for an act of terrorism? Is this anything you ever envisioned, and what will they do? Well, in fact, it, 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 that's the question, uh, John, what, what they'll do. I, I would imagine that they will help support uh, the, the police department, the fire department, uh, provide logistical support, manpower, help with search and rescue. Whether or not they'll be used for law enforcement purposes, uh, traffic control, things like that, I think uh, I, I've not been privy to those discussions, so I, I don't know. But that's certainly possible. Leading up to the millennium, you personally designed a series of exercises where a disaster would unfold and they would respond to it. A tabletop exercise, a field sure. exercise, and then another disaster, yep. and then another, to make it more and more difficult to stretch the resources to the limit. 
Was that worst case scenario design that you, that you put together to see if the city could handle such a momentous disaster anything close to this or have a component like this? Yeah, you know, as we were planning for the millennium, we were planning for uh, millions of people in Times Square and for the potential of something happening there. Um, and we had to look at where all those resources would come so from. So did you have in your in your design, did you have a truck bomb go off and then something else and then something else happened? We had a sequence of events, both um, explosions, chemicals, biological incidents, and we looked at various types of um, terrorist events. And, uh, you know, I think that what you're seeing uh, here today is the result of uh, having uh, the New York City Fire Department, New York City Police Department, um, well prepared, but again, uh, I don't care where you are anywhere in the country, anywhere You're in the world. Uh, an incident like this is difficult and certainly stresses um, any system um, anywhere in the world. And then when you have a number of injuries to police and firefighters, it really does um, change the dynamics. Did you ever there. imagine in your various scenarios that a building, not to mention two separate buildings, sure. basically, in case of the trade towers, would collapse on one another? We, uh, we did plan for building collapse for bombings, um, uh, and uh, uh, that was part of uh, our routine planning. Uh, is, there some, is there some hint there of what the, the, the operation now faces in terms of what you went through? Well, w what happens from here on out is uh, a very slow process because, mm. first of all, you've got to put the fire out, and my understanding is uh, there's gas lines feeding the fire, and uh, it, it is not out. Uh, so before you can really start doing a search and rescue in the middle of the building or, or even recovering uh, those uh, victims, uh, you've mm. got to get that fire out. Yeah. Uh, the, the mayor did just say a moment ago the gas has been turned off in city buildings. That would seem to be uh, to have alleviated one very pressing problem for much of the morning. Yes, um, but uh, we still see that it's burning. Um, we see that um, uh, it continues to burn and uh, you can do some search and rescue um, uh, around the periphery of what's burning, but to actually get into the area that's burning, uh, this is this is going to be a long-term uh, process. John, now you mentioned something uh, about continuity of government contingency plans. What are we seeing in New York and in Washington, where the officials are not where we're accustomed to seeing them? Not in the White House, not operating out of City Hall. Uh, have they gone to ground? You have to in a situa situation like this when you view that the, the country has been attacked. Um, you have to have alternative, si alternative sites for, uh, for the mayor, uh, for the governor to operate from, to continue government. Uh, On the assumption that their regular sites are potential targets? Oh, sure. You, you have to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, I would imagine that's uh, what's happening in Washington as well. Uh, they Good afternoon. This is Maureen Bunyan in the ABC7 newsroom. Uh, you are looking at a live picture of the Pentagon, which is still on fire. There apparently uh, is smoke coming out. Uh, obviously, is smoke coming out. We assume it is still on fire, uh, with officials trying to get that blaze contained uh, since uh, this morning's uh, terrorist attack on the building. It has now been five hours since that terrorist attack, since a plane slammed into the Pentagon. This was the scene at approximately 10 o'clock this morning when that plane struck the Pentagon. It penetrated the outer wall and then made its way into the, uh, the inner corridor at the Pentagon. As you might imagine, at that moment, all people were told to evacuate the Pentagon, which they did. The rescue efforts have been underway now since then. We have some video now of the people that are being evacuated, both medically and otherwise. We are not receiving detailed information at this point as to just what the full numbers are, just what the full damage was. We know that the Pentagon itself staffs 20,000 people. No idea at this point just how many people may have been inside at the time. And Dell, uh, here's the situation in the skies over the United States at this moment. Uh, the Federal Aviation uh, 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 FAA says that all of commercial aircraft flights have now reached their destinations. No additional takeoffs are being allowed in the aftermath of today's attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. 
And the FAA also says that no troubles have been reported with any more flights across the United States. And obviously there are those in our area that are trying to get information about loved ones who may have been on those flights. The American Airlines information number is there on your screen. It is 1-800-245-0999. And also it is believed that two of the flights may have been United Airlines flights. 1-800-932-8555 is the number you can call for United Airlines information, and we will keep uh, putting those up for you throughout the afternoon. And also here in the district, the district has been declared a state of emergency. The mayor made that declaration earlier this afternoon at a press conference. Here's some of what he had to say then. Again, you, you, we're, we're uh, declaring a state of emergency in order to put everyone on alert, in order to uh, uh, ensure that we have the highest level of preparedness. Obviously, if something were to happen, God forbid, and we pray, pray that it won't, uh, we will be fully prepared uh, to then execute uh, the necessary contingency plans. And the mayor says he will have further news conferences this afternoon at 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock to bring us up to date on the situation in the district. We also need to update you right now to the extent of the state of emergency in the district as to what you can and you can't do. There are several road closings that we need to tell you about. Route 50, 66, 29, and the GW Parkway are all closed inbound from Virginia. They are open only for medical personnel. Once again, inbound into to the district. Routes 50, 66, 29, and the GW Parkway are all closed inbound. Route 1 is also closed outbound from D.C. And Route 395 northbound, we are told, which is outbound, is also closed. And Dell, uh, some more traffic information for you folks. Uh, VRE says it now has very limited service this afternoon. Mark train service remains suspended. It is running buses at some of the stations, but, uh, and the buses are not on any schedule, but the train service is suspended. And we want to reiterate that this has been a two-pronged terrorist attack. Of course, the worse and more severe attack happening in New York City. And then there is the attack on the Pentagon itself. We are coordinating our efforts with ABC News to bring you the most information that we possibly can. We're going to return to ABC News and Peter Jennings right now. Of the White House. Um, John McCrethy, who covers the Pentagon, national security, and a good deal of terrorism and international intelligence issues for us is at the Pentagon. John, what have you got? Uh, a whole plate full of things, Peter. First of all, uh, we've been talking throughout the day about possible ship movements, American ship movements. It is true that two aircraft carriers, five other combatants, and a hospital ship are now all heading north uh, along the Atlantic seaboard toward New York. No decision has yet been made about exactly what to do with those ships when they get there, but of course aircraft carriers have a very large hospital capability, so they could be used for that. I think it is a, a responsive measure. Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, after the attack on the Pentagon, went immediately to the gash that you see behind me here when the very first destruction was, uh, was detected uh, and helped pull some people out of the rubble. He is now in what is called the National Military Command Center in the Pentagon, and he intends to stay there indefinitely uh, until all forces around the world have been secured. All forces uh, around the globe at this point are at ThreatCon Delta, which is the highest uh, level of threat condition that American troops can be in. Um, one of the difficulties with the fire and the rescue effort here in the Pentagon, Peter, is uh, we have seen continuous outbreaks of fires within the different levels of the Pentagon, and it has been extremely difficult for search and rescue people to get inside the Pentagon. It was five hours before the first people were able to get into some of the rubble uh, to try to begin to pull out people who may have been trapped. Uh, it, the fire in the Pentagon was described as an inferno by those people who were in some of the worst areas. Uh, the evacuation in parts of the Pentagon was very orderly. Some of it was complete chaos, as you might expect. Okay, John, thanks very much. John McCrethy at the Pentagon. We just take a quick look at John there. <clears throat> Um, Jack, are you there for a second? I want yeah, to, want to put Peter. John on camera for a second because you, earlier today you described, you just turn around and take a look at that gash in the Pentagon there and describe again for us, you think it's what, 200 feet wide, two to 300 feet wide? It is uh, at least two or 300 feet wide, Peter. Uh, just imagine a very large commercial aircraft ramming into this mm. space. Uh, the Pentagon is built like a blockhouse, as you know, during World War II. 
Uh, it is a very substantial building, and this aircraft, traveling at between 150 and 200 miles an hour, penetrated deeply into the, uh, the rings of the Pentagon, almost to the center. Uh, the destruction on the five floors that are above ground is considerable. Uh, the, one of the admirals was briefing us earlier that uh, he felt that the section that was hit uh, was one of the areas that was being repaired. We now believe that is not true. Um, it is an area that was very fully staffed, primarily with Navy and Marine Corps personnel, but also the Defense Intelligence Agency. Okay, thanks very much, John McCarthy of the Pentagon. We'll come back to you. On the phone with us at the moment is the former CIA Director James Woolsey. Mr. Woolsey, there's so much to ask you about at a moment like this in terms of your experience, but um, as our political director, or actually that's not true, as a former senior White House official said a short while ago to one of us, there's going to be a hellacious amount of finger pointing at the moment. What's, ha what's gone wrong here? Well, one thing that's gone wrong, Peter, I think, is that for some years now, uh, we have adopted a theory that terrorism first was uh, likely just to be uh, sort of a pickup team, these loose associations of uh, terrorists inspired, say, by the blind shake in New York. This was the thought in the two bombings, uh, one attempted, one real in New York uh, back in the early 90s. And then uh, uh, the Clinton administration veered off into saying everything looked like it might be uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, it's important that we realize there is a real possibility when you have something this devastating and well coordinated that there could be state action of some sort behind it. Now, I don't know that that's the case, and I won't say that it's the case, uh, but there is at least a plausible case that there was Iraqi government involvement in the World Trade Center bombing back in 1993. Uh, this all has to do with the identity, the true identity of Ramsey Youssef, who uh, was the mastermind who's in prison uh, out in Colorado now at his sentencing. The judge said, we still don't really know uh, who you are. And uh, if there was a chance that there was Iraqi government involvement in that, since Youssef was the mastermind of the World Trade Center and of a bombing plot in the Pacific, uh, which he was working on when he was caught, to have a lot of American uh, airlines in the Pacific blown up, uh, what happened today is a sort of amalgam of the earlier two Ramsey Yusuf uh, plots. Um, it's at least, I think, interesting uh, that that's the case. And, uh, and uh, if some of the observers, Laurie Milroy and others, are correct, that there's a reasonable chance that he was, in fact, involved with the Iraqi government, uh, there could also be a chance that the Iraqi government is involved here, even if bin Laden or other terrorist groups are as well. Uh, can, can I just ask you uh, just a couple of really elementary questions about intelligence? Y you've just done something on the air which strikes me as what intelligence officers do when they sit down to try to figure out what the heck is going on. Is that, is that in fact, what you're trying to do at the moment? You called it an amalgam of two plots. Is that, how it, is that how it works at the moment? Well, this is nothing but circumstantial uh, evidence that I've been talking about, but it's interesting circumstantial uh, information anyway. And yes, that's the sort of thing that I think intelligence officers need to do. Part of the problem with the World Trade Center bombing back in 93 is that most of the information about it uh, was under grand jury secrecy until uh, the trial, and after that not many people uh, paid attention to it. So even most of the federal government had no access to it except outside the FBI now, and parts of justice. Now you mentioned, uh, you mentioned governments and individual organizations or operations. Don't governments traditionally leak information more than, than independent or semi-independent terrorist cells? If there were a government involved, is it, is it not inconceivable that the United States didn't pick up something? I think it's uh, possible that uh, a government could be involved and not uh, be picked up, especially if it was operating very carefully as the Iraqis or conceivably the Iranians might uh, under these circumstances. Uh, it is normally somewhat easier to learn what's going on inside a government than a, a terrorist group, particularly one that uh, doesn't uh, uh, use many communications uh, and the like and uh, does everything within just a very small number of people. Uh, but it's not impossible that terrorist groups could work together with the government. Uh, that uh, the Iraqi government has been quite closely involved with a number of the Sunni uh, uh, terrorist uh, groups, and uh, and on some matters has uh, had contact with Go Bin ahead. Laden. So, 
I'm sorry, Mr. Olsey, I think I just lost you. No, I sat down on some Our matter. at the moment, and I hope we'll get him back on the telephone. The former director of the CIA, James Woolsey, on the phone, uh, agreeing that there's going to be a heck of a lot of finger-pointing at the FBI, at the, at the Department of Defense, uh, and at the CIA. No, I have my FBI. Thank you very much. Um, I just lost the director of the CIA. Okay, thank you very much. Um, because, as this former official in the, in, in the White House points out, people are going to demand massive retaliation. Mr. Woolsey ra raises... Uh, quite uh, two quite fascinating uh, possibilities. One, that there is a terrorist organization or group involved with a government, that there is, as there has been believed in the past, a terrorist operation within the Iranian political establishment, which perhaps even other parts of the Iranian political establishment didn't know about, um, and similarly true, though much likely for them to be operating in ignorance of Saddam Hussein uh, inside Iraq as well. Uh, but the reason that... Um, and I bring John Miller back briefly in on this again. The reason he suggests an amalgam, um, Mr. Woolsey does, of two footprints is because of the potential, never perfectly proved, that Ramza Yusuf, who has been on trial and convicted of the first trade tower attack, did seem to have some tenuous connection with Iraq. And that this is a mixture of, of the two plots right. that were, were his two um, big capers. Right. Uh, one, the plot to blow up numerous airlines on the Pacific route uh, targeting American tourists. The other, um, the other to uh, blow up the World Trade Center. Here, planes, uh, American carriers have been used to attack the World Trade Center. Okay, uh, I, I, I as, apologize. Uh, no, as, as, as Mr. Woolsey pointed out, the difficulty with Ramzi Youssef and really getting to the bottom of the World Trade Center was while he escaped as the mastermind and while he was captured in a, a guest house funded by bin Laden, nobody ever knew who sent him in the first place uh, or what his real nationality was or even what his real name was, which set him apart from all the other people connected with those cases. Truly a mystery man, still in prison here in America. Yeah, somebody said a few, uh, a little while ago, too, uh, in terms of everything we're looking at now, suspects, there's no good options on the table in this regard whatsoever. Let's try to keep up with the running developments of the day. Lisa Stark is with us from Seattle. She covers aviation for us. And Lisa, when we last, uh, when we last commented on the status of this plane, we have at least one, I beg your pardon, at least two of them in the process of being hijacked. Right, Peter. Here's here's what we here's the latest information we know right now. Uh, we know obviously the two American planes were lost. Flight 11 from Boston to L.A. That is one of the planes that went into the World Trade Tower. Flight 77 from Dulles to Los Angeles. We believe that that may have been the plane that went into the Pentagon. The two United planes, United 93. That is the plane that crashed south of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And now United 175, that plane, the plane from Boston to Los Angeles, a government source has confirmed that that was the second plane that went into one of the World Trade Towers in New York. I'm also being told by government sources, and again, these things change throughout the day, Peter, and I want to caution people, but this mm -hmm. is what we know now. A government source tells me that on American Airlines Flight 11, again, that was the flight from Boston to Los Angeles that went into the Trade Tower, that a flight attendant on that plane was apparently able to call the American Airlines Operations Center to tell them that two flight attendants had been stabbed and that the perpetrators had broken into the flight deck. We've also been told that a passenger aboard one of the United flights, United Flight 93, the one that crashed in Pennsylvania, a passenger on that flight was able to call 911, apparently, and let them know that the plane was being hijacked. Again, this information from government right. sources, and we don't know if it will hold up throughout the day, but that's what we are being told at this I, time. I very much appreciate you bringing us up to date. There's one thing that I don't, I'm never quite clear on yet, and that may be just because of where I'm sitting. Do we know... American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles was a 767, is that correct? correct? Yes. Um, United Airlines 175, which went into the World Trade Center, that was a, 767 a 767 as well. As well. The American aircraft plane, which we're a little uncertain about the crashing into the Pentagon, was an American, was it Boeing 757? Correct. And the, it was also a 757 that crashed near Johnstown. Exactly. So, so we have t two very popular and very widely used and very important aircraft in these two airlines uh, being used. Lisa, thanks very much indeed. Uh, on the phone from Washington with us now is the former Secretary of State, James Baker. Are you there, Mr. Baker? I'm here, Peter. Um, 
So what would you do? Well, it's a pretty tough one, Peter. It's uh, everybody, of course, uh, is in is in deep sorrow and shock. Uh, it seems to me that this is something we've been worried about for a long time. We've been able, fortunately, to uh, foreclose it uh, up to now. We may be entering a bit of a new era. We may have to do a bit more to preempt these types of events. We may need to get some better human intelligence to penetrate some of these groups uh, before acts like this can be can be carried out. Uh, we may need to do even more to beef up, obviously, I suppose we need to do even more to beef up our airport security. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot uh, along those lines, I think, that needs to be done, and, and uh, mostly, I think, strengthen our intelligence capabilities. You are the second person, uh, 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 second senior former government official to say to us today to imply very clearly that human intelligence um, in those areas of the world which are to some extent breeding grounds of terrorism are plainly weak. Well, they are weak, Peter. We took, you know, we, we went on a real uh, witch hunt with our CIA back in the early uh, mid-70s. We had hearings. I won't mention the name of the, uh, of the legislator who conducted those hearings, but they, in effect, uh, resulted in our eliminating a lot of our human intelligence capabilities. It's a dirty business when you're when you have human intelligence, you're doing business with the, the kinds of people that will, that will commit uh, these acts. Uh, sometimes the first test of a, of a human intelligence agent, the, the first test they send them out on is to go out and kill somebody. So it's pretty tough for America to, uh, to, to get into that, and we got out of it. But it may be that we have to get into that kind of business. Uh, Mr. Secretary, why don't you just name the legislator, because you're just going to make cause more trouble for me to go to the file and look it up. Who, who held these hearings, and what's the point you're trying to make? That well, there's they were the church committee hearings, and what I did, what I think we did uh, as a consequence of those hearings was to, in effect, unilaterally disarm in terms of our in intelligence capabilities. Now, we have the best, you know, we have the best uh, technological intelligence gathering operations and capabilities in the world, but we need this human intelligence to penetrate groups like the group that must have carried out this, uh, these operations. I have only a vague recollection of this, but I think the point you're making is that there are some forces, political and otherwise in the United States, who believe that getting down and dirty with potential terrorists around the world is not something we should be doing, that we should do it all technically, therefore not put people at risk? That's correct. That was the thinking, and that's pretty much the, uh, pretty much the policy we've followed mm. since then, and I think we need to get back into the down and dirty business so we can penetrate these groups. and hopefully prevent these types of things from happening in the future. Mr. Baker, I don't want to get ahead of things, and I'm sure you do not either, but if there is, uh, and as somebody said earlier, there are no good options out there at the moment, but do you believe that the United States is, if it finds out that a state is involved, going to have to go to war in an active way against that state? Well, first of all, I don't believe we're going to find out that a state is involved. Right. I cannot really, frankly, conceive of a state doing this. There could be, I suppose, some indirect assistance from a state or groups within a state, and I don't think that's going to be the case. But if it were the case, I think we need to do uh, whatever, whatever we reasonably and responsibly can to protect the American people, whatever that involves. Now, this is always the toughest question for somebody who has been in office but is not currently. How much easier is it to say what you do now that you're not in government? In other words, were you still, were you the man, were you the Secretary of State, in the Bush administration at, at the moment. Now, would you not feel rather constrained by modern circumstances as to what you could do? Well, I don't know. I mean, there, you know, we have, we, we, frankly, uh, Peter, we have some uh, laws on our books that we ought to take a look at. One of them is simply a presidential executive order that says the United States doesn't go out and assassinate people. I think there was a very good reason behind that, but I dare say that you would have about 99 percent, uh, if not 100 percent, public support across the United States today if we found out that one terrorist group was responsible for this, for these incidents. Uh, you would have 100 percent support almost for for uh, taking care of that of the person who leads that group. One of the difficulties, of course. Mr. Baker, is that in a, in a situation like this, we end up fighting like the terrorists to some extent, right? Well, that, that, that is unfortunately the case. That's mm -hmm. true. But, but it may be that that's the only way we can really mm -hmm. take care of the problem. You know, the sure? president said today, he made a statement I think was absolutely the right statement. He said, he said uh, America is under attack, uh, under terrorist attack, and mm -hmm. he said we are going to hunt down and punish 
those we find responsible for this. And uh, that, to my way of thinking, means doing whatever is required. Mr. Baker, thanks very much for the time. Thank you. James Peter. Baker, the former Secretary of State, also widely known in the country as the man who uh, did as much as he did to uh, win Florida for George Bush at the last uh, presidential election, but a longtime member of the American political and foreign policy establishment and who knows how complicated this is and who makes a very open, you'll hear this a lot in the next few days, not enough human intelligence and we'll review who that legislator was. Tony Cordesman, uh, our military analyst. Um, are you listening to Mr. Baker? Is he making sense? He is, Peter, but I think we need to have an important caution here. Human intelligence isn't as simple as it sounds. The actual agents can take years to develop Historically, they've often been unreliable, and the more hostile the ideology is, the more uncertain the collection. Human intelligence is also analysis. Our analytic side is weak. The CIA has had hiring freezes. There is so little money for CIA and for DIA that most of the country analysts have never been to the countries they're actually analyzing, much less talked to many of the elements within them. And as Secretary Baker pointed out, if you're going to go into operations, that's different from human intelligence, and our operations capability has been allowed to decline for nearly a decade. Thank you, Tony. The game has changed a good deal today, yeah. so let us get back. Yes, John. Before Sorry. Jerry Howard leaves us right. and he's promised to come back, okay. um, all of the discussions we've had raised the question to me, and I know Jerry's been more fully briefed on these national security agencies than in uh, matters than any of us have. How many of these attacks have we known about and been able to prevent? How many that we've heard about? How many that we haven't heard about? And have any of them been on this scale? Uh, uh, that's difficult to answer, John, because a lot, of that, um, a lot of that material is classified. A lot of that is kept classified. But uh, there clearly are a number of threats that are, occur in this country uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, uh, some of them are, are hoaxes. Some of them are credible. Uh, some of them are quite, quite credible. Um, and uh, the, the spectrum varies. And um, they've, um, they've had uh, and some we've been very fortunate with, as we were right before the millennium with uh, uh, the, uh, the... intrusion the, from Canada? Yeah, the... Mm -hmm. but, that, but that was one that was the work of an alert agent. How many have we actually prevented through intelligence, which is, is kind of what Mr. Wolsey and Mr. Baker have been talking yeah, about? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure anybody has a good number on that. I, uh, that's something that I think that uh, would difficult, be difficult uh, to put your finger on at this point, I, you know, and I'd be interesting to get that from the FBI. I'm not sure mm -hmm. that I've ever heard a number on how many we've actually um, uh, thwarted um, Have uh, you ever picked up the phone in your emergency management center and had someone on the other end who said we're going to blow up something? Um, we actually did receive a number of threats. What was uh, it like? Um, did, we had um, uh, some letters come in and we turned them over to the FBI. Um, by and large, we uh, felt that uh, the majority of them were hoaxes, mm. uh, but uh, we relied on the FBI for their, um, uh, their intelligence, for their um, uh, analysis mm. of threats. Uh, we relied on the Police Department Intelligence Division, um, and uh, by and large, uh, with the exception of uh, one or two that uh, were a little more credible than others, most of them were pretty um, lame hoaxes. I remember two of those that were quite serious. In, uh, in 94 and 95, uh, when I was with the Police Department, we received information from the FBI that there was going to be a truck bomb attack within 48 hours on the New York Stock Exchange. We responded by surrounding it literally with sanitation sand trucks um, and blocking the street and eventually set up a cordon which has still not come down. The other was uh, a planned attack on the uh, Israeli mission to the United Nations, uh, which has been surrounded by cement blocks, uh, first the sand trucks and, and ever since ever again. Since. Uh, our thanks to Jerry Hauer, the former head of the New York Mayor's Office of Emergency Management and Operations. And as we said at the beginning, it's an office which is not operating in the place that Jerry Howard set it up, which was right adjacent uh, to the World Trade Center, and it has been blocked off, put out of commission in one way or another by the horrendous, horrendous uh, devastation which has occurred in that part of town today. And we don't want to lose sight of it for a second in all this discussion about, about intelligence and terrorism. Uh, so I want to go back to George Stephanopoulos uh, on the at who's, who's closer to the building than anybody else, and then Bill Blakemore. Uh, they are both watching 
uh, the search and rescue operations um, uh, and, and uh, both report now. George? Well, Peter, we still don't know that it is a search and rescue operation yet. Just uh, a little while ago, one of the volunteers who tried to go down there and help reported back and said, when you actually got to the scene, and you see it behind me, that cloud of black smoke, when you actually got to the scene at the World Trade Center, what was most remarkable, what was most amazing, what was most horrifying is that basically nothing was happening. They couldn't go into the building and actually perform any real rescue operations. And he also described the scene very close to the World Trade Center, soot and silt up to his waist. He said it was hell. We have also talked to some firefighters who've gotten fairly close to the scene. They've now set up a special command center over here at Manhattan Borough Community College here on the west side where they're relieving each other. One fireman said that he was buried underneath all the dirt and debris, had to dig himself out, but still didn't know what had happened to his six partners George, who had gone into the building and near the building. George, can I just interrupt you for a sec? I'll come right back to you. But Ann Compton, who's been with the president all day, is on, on the phone from Nebraska. And we don't want to lose her if we can have her. Annie, can you hear me? Yes, Peter, I can. What and are you doing in Nebraska? Well, uh, we didn't know where we were till we landed. President Bush is here at the home of the Strategic Command. This is the area, this is the base where those big doomsday aircraft are kept. And he has disappeared down the rabbit hole, Peter, uh, down through a red brick uh, small building. He and what skeleton staff are with him uh, down into an underground bunker where Ari Fleischer tells me the president is going to chair a National Security Council meeting by teleconference. Uh, we're also told that the president has been on the phone several times with the vice president who is able to work out of a command center uh, at the White House itself in one of the secure areas below in the White House. Annie, your description of the president going down the rabbit hole, going into a very secure uh, compound bunker in, in, in Nebraska at Offutt Air Force Base suggests that people in his entourage believe there has been a threat today or a potential threat to the highest political leadership in the country. Is that correct? Well, and I asked exactly that question. They say there was no hint of any warning of the attacks that came on the East Coast today. But as you know, they always take the precaution, especially once the Pentagon was hit, that the president might be a target as well. And uh, that is why he has come to as secure a place as he could, uh, where he is trying to marshal the forces. He's also talking to some of the civilian leaders on the ground, including Mayor Giuliani and Governor Pataki. Um, but we were told there was no direct threat to him and no advance warning. And that in itself, Peter, is distressing to the uh, very small number of staff of the president here at Offutt. So, so the procedures are in place and, and they do what they do, right? Well, you know, in, in 27 years of covering presidents and crises, we have never played the kind of hunted game that uh, was played today, where we would take off in the plane and not know where we were going to land. And then once we landed in Louisiana, where we were literally told not to use cell phones so our location couldn't be pinpointed, to take off again uh, and head to uh, the center. It, it does feel like a cat and mouse game. Ari Fleischer, when I asked him if the president feels in jeopardy or hunted, he said the president understands that this is kind of the precaution that is necessary at a time like this and that he's anxious to get back to Washington. And, and for example, when you phoned us just a moment ago, thank goodness you did, did you have to ask permission to do it? Uh, no, because it, it is hard to hide a great big airplane like Air Force One. And when we were coming in, I could tell we were over flat area, a fairly <laughs> urban area. And uh, I guessed it was Nebraska, knowing that uh, we hadn't been that far out of Louisiana. And indeed, as we came down over the field, I saw a satellite, a TV satellite truck out on the highway. <laughs> And sure enough, on our screens inside the plane, we watched ourselves land. The local media was already here figuring this is where the President of the United States and the Commander-in-Chief would land. Because it's part of the old Strategic Air Defense Command. Exactly right. It has the facilities, the secure facilities here, where the President can still be, as what Ari tells me is... I'm Del Walters reporting live from the ABC7 News Studios, where we continue to cut in on every half hour to bring you up to date on the situation unfolding at the Pentagon. We now know a little bit more about the fire. ABC News is reporting that it is literally an inferno inside, and also the District of Columbia Fire Department, we understand, has now sent the equivalent of three alarms worth of personnel and equipment to help Arlington and Pentagon firefighters just deal with the fire after the plane crashed into it this morning. 
Joining Dell, I'm Kathleen Matthews, and we're also getting confirmation now that the plane that crashed into the Pentagon was actually the flight that took off from Dulles Airport earlier this morning. Now, it's been five and a half hours since the plane crashed into the Pentagon. As you can see, a scene of tremendous building carnage there. Associated Press is now quoting anonymous law enforcement officials that say the plane that crashed into the Pentagon was American Airlines Flight 77. It had taken off from Dulles Airport and was bound for Los Angeles. Angeles. That airline was carrying 58 people, 58 passengers, four flight attendants, and two pilots. ABC 7 News reporter Daryl Carver is live at the Pentagon right now and brings us up to date on everything that's been going on there this morning. Daryl? Kathleen, I want to set the scene for you for just a little bit. If we can take a look at the Pentagon right now, the fire here is still burning at this hour. We have been told that members of the Fairfax County Urban Rescue Team, that elite rescue team, is awaiting entry, but however, they are still waiting for the fire to be put out. We've been told it is a scene of tremendous carnage inside of there. Most of the damage at this point, from what we understand, is in the E-ring or the outer ring of the Pentagon. As you can see, there are still fire crews being rushed in there. There are still emergency workers all throughout this scene. We're still trying to get a few more details on what the situation is at this point inside. And when we get those details, we will pass them on to you. For now, reporting live from the Pentagon, Daryl Carver, ABC 7 News. Back to you. Daryl, thank you very much. We want to update you on the injuries and also some more information with regards to the Pentagon plane crash. We now understand that it did not hit uh, a portion of the Pentagon that may have been under construction. And indeed, there were people. It was heavily occupied at the time. Now let's take a look at some of the injuries reports that we are receiving. Virginia Hospital Center is reporting at this hour that they have received 30 injured parties. Washington Hospital Center says that they have received five critical people, five people in critical condition. George Washington Hospital says that they have received two people, both of whom are in the emergency room. And Alexandria Anova Hospital, this is information that we just received, says it is treating 11 people, nine people all told, or nine people are in fair condition, one is in critical condition, and one person is in good condition. We will continue to uh, uh, cut into ABC News to bring you the very latest on the local situation. We'll be back again at 4 o'clock. Meanwhile, we join ABC News in progress. Some, some small indications and I, that, that the, the broader evacuation of the senior staff of the White House that is always planned for in emergencies, as you hinted at, from a relic from the Cold War days, has also gone into effect. I spoke with the, the spouse on, of the George, senior White on, House. Hang on, George. Hang on, George. I apologize. I'm only interrupting you because you're so... Okay, you don't have those sirens behind you. Go ahead. The sirens behind me. Sorry. I, I spoke earlier, just a little while ago, to the spouse of a senior White House official who received a call simply from the Secret Service saying, uh, your spouse is safe, uh, is in a secure location right now. I remember from my early days, Peter, in the White House, several senior White House staff are given cards and have evacuation plans for places to go in cases of a national emergency. And as I said, it does seem to be, there does seem to be some indication that that may have been put into effect. I would just add one more note. You, Ann was talking about the possibility of the president doing now a teleconference with his, his senior national security right. officials. There are facilities in the White House, not the normal situation room, which everyone has seen in the past, has seen pictures of, but there is a second situation room behind the, the primary situation room, which has video conferencing capabilities. The, the director of the Pentagon, the defense chief, can speak from the National Military Command Center at the Pentagon. The uh, sec Secretary of State can speak from the State Department, the president from wherever he is. And they'll have this capability to video conference throughout this crisis. In my time at the White House, it was used in, af in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, in the aftermath of the TWA Flight 800 bombing. And, and that would be the way they would stay in contact through the afternoon. Uh, uh, just a couple of, uh, of, of short questions. Um, g given where the president has gone from Florida to Louisiana to Nebraska, and given that we hear from the political staff that he'd like, they'd like him to come back to Washington, does the president have any say at the moment, basically, if the Secret Service says go left or go right or go here or go there? Well, the president has the ability to overrule them if he wants, but I think in this situation, Peter, he, he would follow their directions, obviously pushing them 
uh, to try to get back as soon as as soon as he could, if that was really what his political advisors wanted. But but he would he would take their direction on this one. Sometimes you can fight the Secret Service on you know how long you're going to spend in a rope line. I don't think you'd do it on this. Okie dokie. And the other question is, in terms of Dick Cheney, the vice president, is in the White House now. Just from a purely operational point of view, if you were trying to run things at the moment, would you like to be in the White House or in a bunker in Nebraska? Or would it make any difference? Um, well, it, it doesn't. I, I think right now, Peter, it doesn't make any difference. Air Force One in this bunker in Nebraska has complete communications all across the board. And as I said, my guess is that Vice President Cheney is in that second situation room. A camera is trained on him. He can see the president. The president can see him. They can see Secretary Rumsfeld, Secretary State Powell. It's as if they're meeting in one room. Now tell me, let's, re let's return to the, the immediate business at hand. Uh, I, I, every time I check in with you, or we check in with you, I hear sirens virtually right underneath you. What's going on right underneath you? Well, right underneath, I'm at Canal Street and the Avenue of Americas, which is about 20 blocks away from the World Trade Center there. Every once in a while, right outside my window right now, there are about four police vans and a police car. Um, they're, they're, but the police seem to just be stationing there, almost resting right now. The area right around us is quite quiet. About an hour ago, two hours ago, there were hordes of people walking uptown. That's pretty much stopped. Now, Peter, I got to tell you, it's very strange. You look down on the sidewalk, and you just have people strolling uh, in their summer clothes up in this neighborhood right here. But again, from what we've heard of that situation down by the World Trade Center, it's horrific. It's kind of eerily silent. The, the firemen are, are relieving each other every 15 minutes or so. They come out, they get showered down with fire hoses to get all the soot off, and then they go right back in and get to work. And, and just remind me one more time, George, the, you know, our, the, the layman's notion of a bunker is one thing out in Nebraska, and I assume the White House has another notion of bunker. What does it mean down the rabbit hole into the bunker? Well, in the bunker would just be certainly underground, a secure situation room. Um, but, but the important point, Peter, is that wherever that bunker is, um, and it's reinforced by guards and concrete and all that, the president is in full communication with his entire national security team, and, and he can direct them at a moment's notice. And I think the big question that they're going to have to address now as they gather the facts, as they try and figure out who's responsible for this, uh, even though they want to get the president back to Washington as soon as possible, and I'm sure they'll do that, they won't want him to go before the country again until he has more to say, and probably until he can say what actions he's going to take um, in response to this. Okay, thanks, George Stephanopoulos, uh, who, as he pointed out, was somewhat isolated from the violence there because as close as they'll let you broadcast at this point uh, but you can still see the smoke uh, coming up um, it's felt all over the country a number of newspapers around the country are now putting out special editions of the day I remember when the Challenger exploded we were on television for many 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 hours uh, and which does to some extent isolate you from uh, what is happening you become a conveyor belt for information going back to the hotel and realizing that the New York Times and the Washington Post had then put out 30 some odd page editions uh, in terms of the Challenger disaster, John, and it just, it just reminds you that you can be isolated from something that is so overwhelming. And, and George Stephanopoulos acknowledges he is not as close to the violence and tragedy like ABC's Bill Blakemore is somewhat closer. Um, Bill, can you hear me? Bill Blakemore? Okay, we'll come back to Bill Blakemore, but Bill Blakemore has you know, we want to be as close as we can and not get in anybody's way. And I was pointing out that newspapers across the country publishing these, these special editions. Uh, there's not been a special edition of this magnitude probably since the Challenger disaster before that, Neil Armstrong walking in the moon, or in some cases, newspapers are putting out the first major special edition they've done since John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, many of the papers will clear, clearly use terror uh, in their banner headlines. Uh, certainly the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel was one that did that with... Uh, with a subheading saying, Attacks Rip Trade Center, Pentagon, America's Soul. And I think a great many people in the country feel that is precisely what has happened today, that the, that the trade towers, as we've said many times, these, these absolute symbols of the United States in so many ways, right there on the edge of Manhattan, first city in the new world, um, the great advertisement to the rest of the world of commerce and success and outward mobility and all that stuff. And those two trade towers are simply no longer there. And then the attack on the Pentagon uh, at the very heart of the, of the establishment, the, the military government establishment today, um, and the deep psychological damage that this or wound 
if not long-term damage this is going to do to the country. And then we learned just a short while ago that that, that um, United Airlines jet that was carrying 45 people, which crashed near Johnstown in Pennsylvania today, was, at least according to one congressman, James Moran, Democrat from Virginia, who had had a Marine Corps briefing in Washington. He believes that that aircraft was intended originally intending by its hijackers to go to Camp David, the presidential retreat in the mountains of Maryland. And the crash site actually turns out to be about 85 miles northwest of Camp David. So no one should be surprised, perhaps no one is, um, at, the, at the ripple effect um, at every level of government, not to mention in everybody's soul today, um, from this initial attack on the trade towers. Uh, one of our reporters, Ellen Davis, reports, by the way, from the American Red Cross in New York City. They've actually had so many volunteers for blood uh, that about uh, 1,200 people showed up at the, at the blood donation center in New York City, and they actually have enough blood for now, except for people with type O and RH negative blood, because they have a shortage of those. But in terms of every, in all other types of blood, they seem to be in pretty good shape. John Miller, what are you finding on the telephone? Uh, basically, still that... Uh they are just beginning to try and mount a rescue operation in the Trade Center, um, that they are still trying to assess how many people are trapped inside, that they're still trying to collate the number of people that they removed um, to so many different hospitals in two states. Um, and, and, and now, because our burn centers here in New York, of which there are only three, have been overwhelmed uh, even in Canada. So um, they're really just beginning what's going to be an operation um, that's going to take uh, not days, but weeks, uh, more likely months. Let's go, thank you, John. Let's go to ABC's Bill Blakemore, who I said is in lower Manhattan and closer even than George Stephanopoulos was able to get. Bill, do you hear me? I do, Peter. Go ahead. There's an enormous search and rescue operation being mounted here for what's clearly going to be many days of grim work. We're just north of the wreckage and the smoke still coming out on the West Side Highway, right next to the Hudson River. Hundreds of firemen are reassembling and restaging here after their first partial defeat this morning, and they know that many of their colleagues are missing with the civilians in the wreckage. I've talked to several of them who were in one of the towers when the other one was collapsing, who barely got out. They're not quite sure how and can't even begin to talk about it. Uh, uh, tables have been set up in the street here by some of the officers who are helping them figure out who's going to go in when they can. There's a triage center that's been set up in the Manhattan Community College uh, where bodies and people and survivors are going to be brought as they begin to figure out how badly they're injured. And we can tell because they still can't go in, they're still milling around in the hot sun here, that it's going to take a long time before they can even begin to assess how many people there are who need their help in search and rescue, which is uh, going to go on for some time. The streets just behind us uh, are quite different. Uh, there's almost an eerie war scene type of feeling because much of this uh, part of the West Village has emptied out. On this very clear hot day, there are occasionally jet fighters circling overhead, so there's even just a touch of the feeling of uh, covering a war. But for the most part, uh, everybody is still looking at this enormous wreckage and just beginning to absorb what it is, and these firemen are eager and ready to get in there as they begin to gather themselves and dust themselves off from, uh, from their first uh, foray in this morning. Bill, th this is an excellent report. I just have this one question, and it may just simply be my own inability to grasp it visually. Are they actually getting into either of the former towers of the Trade Center, or are they still working on the outside perimeter? Uh, I cannot tell you the exact answer to that. Uh, many of them are still waiting on the outside of the perimeter to figure out how to get into the general area. When the North Tower collapsed, uh, parts of the top of it fell over all the way over here to the river. And so they're still trying to sort out through the smoke just exactly where they can get into. They are not letting the media get anywhere near the actual base um, of the two towers themselves. Uh, but there's just a general sense of these uh, accumulating hundreds of firemen that they're they're ready to go in. They're waiting to find where an opening will be. Okay, thanks very much, Bill Blakemore. ABC's Don Daler did manage to get, I think, pretty close to the building uh, at one point early day. Don, are you there? Yes, Peter, I'm here. I'm, I'm just back to uh, about four blocks away, but uh, I was, uh, I escorted a federal agent through the, uh, up to the side of the World Trade Center itself, 
and can tell you it, it is the, probably the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. There is total devastation, but beyond that, there um, there's no non-gruesome way to describe this, but there were our bodies and body parts um, on top of some buildings next to where the World Trade Center stood that in the streets. There is uh, still a number of fires going on in buildings surrounding it, including the there is a, uh, the Marriott building appears to be, uh, be on fire. There's a building directly behind the federal office building. I can't identify which building it is, but it's a taller building. The police and the firemen are, uh, are getting away from that area. They're afraid that that building will collapse as well. There have been a couple building collapses or portions of them collapsing from the flames. So there are some buildings that they are just letting burn uh, to collapse because it's too dangerous for them to fight it right now. Don't. Thanks very much, Don. And now here is the, uh, we're going to go to a briefing now on behalf of the, the political wing of the president's, I'm sorry. Just have a very brief statement, and I want Chief Jester to talk about the search and rescue efforts underway. No surprise, we have very, very few details. We'll tell you what we can at this stage, but we have very few details. Um, this is a terrible day. It is a tragic day for America. Our thoughts and prayers are with the injured and their families and the casualties. We're taking every appropriate step and precaution to prevent further attacks. We're making every effort to take care of the injured still in the building. And we're taking every appropriate measure to determine who is responsible. The Secretary of Defense- And at President Bush's direction, we are implementing it. We began to implement it immediately after the first attack in New York this morning. We contacted American forces and embassies throughout the world and place them on high alert. The United States Secret Service immediately secured the President, the Vice President, and the Speaker of the House, and they are all safe. They have also secured members of the National Security Team, the President's Cabinet, and senior staff. As you know, President Bush was in Sarasota, Florida when the first attack occurred this morning. Air Force One has now landed at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, and the President is in a secure location. He is in continuous communication with the Vice President and key members of his Cabinet and National Security Team. Vice President Cheney and our National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice are in a secure facility at the White House. I have just come from there the Secretary of Transportation and other members of our White House senior staff are gathered at a command center there, and we are coordinating with other branches of our federal government. The Secretary of Defense remains at the Pentagon, and the Secretary of State is en route back to Washington from his trip to South America. President Bush is conducting a meeting of the National Security Council as we speak. They are meeting President Bush from his location and other members from different locations in Washington and other locations. As many of you have been reporting, the Federal Aviation Administration ordered all airports closed and all planes which were in the air were directed to land at the nearest airport. International flights were diverted to alternate locations outside of the United States. Transportation Secretary Mineta has directed the Federal Aviation Administration to suspend operations until at least noon tomorrow. So no airline flights will operate until at least then and until the FAA announces that operations will be resumed. Secretary Mineta has also issued orders controlling the movement of all vessels in United States navigable waters. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has activated eight urban search and rescue task forces in New York, and four of these highly trained teams are at work here in Washington at the Pentagon. Every federal agency has implemented continuity of operations plans to make sure the government continues to function effectively. While the markets closed today because of the situation in Manhattan, the United States financial system has continued to operate. Banks have been open all day. The Federal Reserve has operated regularly and continuously. The Department of Health and Human Services has mobilized medical personnel and supplies to provide help to local authorities who are working 
so diligently to respond and try to help the victims of these terrible attacks. President Bush has committed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to identify and bring to swift justice those responsible for these despicable attacks. The Department of Justice is setting up a hotline for families who fear that their relatives may have been victims of one of these attacks, and we will be announcing that telephone number shortly. Our fellow citizens and our freedom came under attack today, and no one should doubt America's resolve. President Bush and all our country's leaders thank the many Americans who are helping with rescue and relief efforts. We ask our fellow Americans for your prayers for the victims, for their families, for the rescue workers, and for our country. Thank you all very much, and we will continue to update you as information is available and confirmed. Karen Hughes, Karen Hughes, the uh, president. I, I must say, John Miller, that there's not an enormous amount of news in there if we've been following this, th this event all day. No, even the White House seems to be having difficulty gleaning the facts, which officials in New York City just don't seem to know. Yeah. In terms of level of casualties, yeah. number of people killed. And, it, and it's enormously, enormously, well, we're going to go to the, our White House correspondent, Claire Shipman, one of our White House correspondents, Claire Shipman, at the moment, uh, to see what's going on. But it's an, I, I'm very deeply sympathetic with, the, with the, uh, the difficulty it is to get down to street level, either at the Pentagon uh, or certainly in New York City, and understand the chaos and the tragedy that has, has, has appeared at ground level. Those of us sitting in newsrooms, um, bringing in, interpreting, analyzing information at a variety of levels, uh, are, are not doing a good enough job, because probably an impossible job to do to try to to have ourselves and you understand just um, what happened when that building fell in on each other. Listening to Bill Blakemore a short while ago and Don Daly, very helpful in terms of trying to understand it. But there is a there is a delay in in everything. There's a delay in government at the federal, state, and the national level. Airlines, of course, all across the country closed down. And it's, and it's true with news coverage as well, as best we can sense from here, that it's hard to get back from the immediate scene of this um, enough of a sort of texture to help us understand how what enormous this is. Maybe you don't need it. Maybe you already appreciate that. But that's our sense uh, from here. But there's Karen Hughes uh, making... Uh, the president has appeared, remember, uh, twice. Claire Shipman ready? Claire? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. Oh, you, you better, you, but much better you than me bring us up to date on what's happening in the presidential establishment both there and elsewhere. Well, let me tell you what we know so far. You obviously just heard a statement from Karen Hughes that seemed designed to try to express to the country that the government is still up and running. Uh, the, the political advisors that you've, missed, you've mentioned a couple of times would very much like to see the president get back to Washington when it's safe so that he can address the country. But in the meantime, they certainly want to give the impression that everything is under control, that the vice president is at the White House, Condoleezza Rice is at the White House, the Federal Reserve is still operating, banks are open, HHS is mobilized. And, and I think that was the point she is trying to get across. We've been told that the president may be back as early as this evening. The AP was also reporting he's considering some sort of address to the nation this evening, but again, it may be that he will want to have something very specific to be able to tell the public before that happens. Colin Powell, we're told, is on his way back from Peru. It's not clear where he will head. At this moment, what has happened in terms of the Secret Service is that their plan has gone into effect for this sort of emergency. The first time, we're told, that a plan like this has been implemented in, in recent history, of course. But what it means is they have all of their protectees accounted for. They're satisfied with that now. Now we're told they're in level two where they're assessing the threat. And they will then decide things, for example, as to whether Colin Powell can go back and safely work at the State Department and whether the president can come back to Washington. In the meantime, as you probably know, there's in a state of emergency declared in the city of Washington and in the state of Virginia, allowing both of those places to be able to mobilize um, military and police forces a as needed, Peter. Thanks very much, uh, Claire Shipman from Washington. It is a, it's very difficult to keep your hands on the political establishment today, in part because we rely on government uh, so often in cases like this to tell us what is going on in their various departments. And 
it has been very difficult today to uh, get, the, for example, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Administration uh, got involved I in this today. But it's hard because of the communications problems all across the country to have a real appreciation of what they are participating. The most direct uh, communication we've had has been with, uh, with New York City on the ground. That is other than in terms of uh, the president's movements from Florida to Louisiana and now on to Nebraska where he is going to stay for the indefinite future, though political, political staff keep saying he'd really like to come back to Washington. There is something interesting in the laundry list of, of things that Karen Hughes, counselor to the president, said in the briefing we just looked at, which is um, one is that uh, airspace will remain uh, shut down under government control until noon tomorrow and that the movements of ships uh, around the coast will be regulated by the government. That suggests, um, I mean, we're talking about not a few hours, we're talking about uh, halfway into the next day. That suggests that there's a real feeling in the intelligence community and, and in Washington that this may not be over, that they don't want to let go of, of the assets like air traffic that they think um, could unleash even more attacks. I, I wonder, John, if there is a real feeling in the intelligence community that may not be over or God, we didn't know any of this was going on. Maybe there's something else there that we don't have the vaguest idea about. Precisely. I mean, it seems to be an abundance of caution um, and some degree of fear. Okay. Now, we're joined by ABC's Betsy Stark, who covers business and economics for us. I, you add to this extraordinary notion of how much the national life has been interrupted today by an act of, or several, act, two acts of terrorism. Anyway, um, start first with who's what businesses were in the World Trade Center we've talked to people before about the number of people in the Trade Center yeah and what else has happened Peter it's astounding um, how much the Twin Towers are part of the of the life of the financial district 10 percent of all the office space in lower Manhattan is accounted for in those Twin Towers 155 businesses 50,000 workers as you've said before uh, including some of the the, the major uh, financial firms Morgan Stanley Stanley, the investment bank, uh, has uh, 50 floors in, uh, in Tower One. 12, 50? 50 floors, I believe is right. 12.5% of the space in that tower uh, occupied by Morgan Stanley. Several, the, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, uh, which mm -hmm. manage bridges and tunnels, the airports, the harbor, uh, a major tenant, 9% of the space there. Several major insurance firms, Empire Blue Cross, Marsh and McLennan, and uh, among the banks, uh, Deutsche Bank, Bank of America, a uh, couple of big trading firms, Credit Suisse First Boston, and uh, Oppenheimer Funds, which uh, is a firm that uh, manages several mutual funds. So uh, lots, of, uh, lots of the big names on Wall Street were in those uh, Twin Towers. And in terms, the markets were closed today. The markets were closed, stock markets, uh, stock markets uh, throughout the country. Uh, trading was halted in some of the foreign markets. The, the, uh... We interrupt ABC News with this local 4 o'clock news update as you take a live look at the Pentagon six hours after what uh, law enforcement sources say was a Boeing 757 American Airlines flight that crashed into this symbol of U.S. military might. You're looking... Sorry, Kathleen, uh, that was a scene from earlier today. Uh, nearly an hour ago, uh, rescue people were, rescue personnel were still trying to get people out of the building. Uh, flames were still coming out, and um, we understand that uh, this has gone to three alarm blaze and that fire officials from all over the Washington region have been called in to help fight the blaze. There are people still inside, uh, and uh, rescue attempts are still being made to get some of those people out. Now, patients have been taken to hospitals throughout the area. Not only has there been tremendous building carnage, but human cost as well. And we want to bring you up to date on where some of those folks have been taken. First of all, Virginia Hospital Center is reporting they've received 30 injured from the Pentagon. Washington Hospital Center, five critical injuries. George Washington Hospital, two are now in the emergency room. And Alexandria Inova Hospital reports that they have received five patients in fair condition, one in critical, one in good. And again, as Maureen said, uh, the these uh, numbers continue to mount as the afternoon progresses. We also have some more information uh, from uh, Paris Glen Denning in Maryland. The governor says that the head of the state police in Maryland got a list of 11 sites across the country that were apparent targets of these terrorism attacks. Two of those sites were in 
uh, Maryland, the Baltimore World Trade Center, and the state capitol in Annapolis. Of course, uh, those sites have not been hit, but we're just sharing that information with you. Also, Congressman uh, James Moran in uh, uh, Virginia says he received information today that that plane that crashed in Pennsylvania, here's some uh, video of that site, may have been headed for the presidential retreat at Camp David. Apparently, uh, Mr. Moran says that apparently this hijacked plane went down in western Pennsylvania. It was meant to crash at Camp David, which of course is the presidential retreat. You know, to understand the magnitude of this, you have to imagine something like the Oklahoma City uh, bombing, where you had a major federal building, such as the Pentagon, combined with a 757 airplane crash. That conveys the magnitude of what we're confronting here in the nation's capital. We'll continue to break in at about uh, 4 30. We'll be back with more news. And meanwhile, we want to join ABC News in progress. Casualties uh, were like, um, and he said, more than anyone can bear, more than anyone can bear. And I think that's the clear casualty. Uh, the dead and the wounded people that we are going to uh, we're going to uh, we're going to have today but as Betsy has just uh, made clear in terms of business and in human beings including I had no idea that Morgan Stanley had 50 stories of the World Trade Center um, these statistics you see that we put up on television from time to time are the just the sort of bare cold background uh, to life <coughs> and death stories which have taken place today but the impact of this has gone so far beyond New York City. And, and just as you, as you look at, that's a live shot of New York City now, a live picture of, of what's happening down inside that dreadful little rectangle of violence which is hidden behind the glamour and success stories of the buildings to the right and to the left. The Federal Avi Aviation Administration, as you know, we shot all airports nationwide. The Greyhound bus service canceled all of its, or the Greyhound bus company canceled all of its services in the Northeast. Um, Amtrak, the, the railroad, uh, temporarily suspended train service all along the Northeast corridor between Boston and Washington. And the U.S. section of the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is between northern New York State for the most part <clears throat> and Ontario, between the U.S. and the Canadian borders there, has been closed. Uh, the tunnels between Detroit and Windsor on the Canadian side of the Detroit River closed to car traffic. Um, and security just went bang up several levels at all U.S. Canadian border crossings in large measure because there has been a penetration across the U.S. Canadian border before. Um, one of the ones they caught when an alert agent, as we've said several times today, picked up a guy on his way where he thought to bomb the Seattle Space Needle. Turned out he was really interested in setting off a bomb inside Los Angeles International Airport. The space shuttle operations were halted today. 12,000 employees of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida were actually sent home. And at the Naval Weapons Station in Goose Creek, South Carolina, workers were evacuated and sent there. Again, evacuations and people being sent home from the very heart uh, of the military establishment. Betsy Stark has just told us that all U.S. financial markets were closed. United Nations building was evacuated here in New York City. Uh, General Motors, General Motors in Detroit gave all 6,000 employees who work in the Renaissance Center, one of those centers built to try to rejuvenate downtown Detroit, were all told to go home today. And the Ford Motor Company closed its world headquarters in Dearborn in Michigan. The IRS in various places closed. The popular skyscrapers uh, were closed and or evacuated in, in, all, in, in, in cities uh, all across the country. I think you probably already heard us say, if you've been with us for much of today, that the New York primary election uh, was canceled here in New York, and Governor Pataki said they'll simply reschedule it when they get another handle on normal life uh, in, in, in the days ahead. And tourist attractions, I have a list of tourist attractions. Knott's Bray Farm in California, the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, and the Library Tower in Los Angeles, the Liberty Bell Independence Hall, the Space Needle, Walt Disney World, they all closed down today. What, what better way, even though it's just a list of things, or it is a list of things, an understanding that both at home and overseas, embassies at overseas were evacuated, embassies were closed. Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, forbid civilian aircraft from flying around London. So these two attacks on the Trade Tower and the one in the Pentagon and the, and the possibility of 
uh, of an attack on Camp David, we now believe, in the aircraft that crashed not far from Johnstown in Pennsylvania, all just phew, had this extraordinary impact all over the world because people feared something else was going to happen and may still fear that something else is going to happen. Listen, just listen to some of what has happened today. I saw something hit the second tower, and when I saw that, it just was, everything rumbled, and I saw all this fire just shoot out in the sky, and stuff started just falling like, like it was raining, and I, I was by myself, and I just ran. I started seeing people um, just, Jumping out of the window, like at the 96 floor, it just started uh, one at a time from different parts of the building. I just started seeing people just drop, drop, and drop. I saw a man walking up the block, and I asked him, "Was this covered in soot?" And my first question was, "Did they get a lot of people out?" And the look in his eye, he just shook his head. I mean, he was in a daze. We lost all visibility, and we assisted people getting out. It was very difficult to get out of where, uh, the police desk area. Um, and then I went back in, and we were, we were carrying an injured person out, myself and about four firemen. And um, unfortunately, that's when the building two collapsed. I happened to dive underneath the ESU uh, vehicle, and I'm not sure what happened to the firemen. The I, was, I, was, I, was, um, I was trapped for about 15 minutes under the truck. It just rained building, OK? And, and I was buried alive for 15 minutes until I scrambled out. We're just putting a microphone on a young man who's joined me here in our newsroom in New York uh, named Kevin Sudovy, who is a young publisher. You can take that visitor sign probably off your, off your shirt as well. Um, and I don't know much about you except that you're a publisher and you have been shooting some video today which you have brought with you. Can you give me a sense of what it is? Well, when you see it, I mean, basically I was right, right there. I went there. I, somebody called me up. I was in Brooklyn and uh, my photographer last night shot it and I, I wanted to see if she was... I tried to call her, but all the phones were jammed. So I went to Manhattan to see her and then I went straight to the, um, to the site and they weren't letting me, anybody in, but I had a motorcycle, so I went straight in. I kept going through all the levels of security and I just went around and then next thing I know, like standing right there, like where everybody, the fire people, everybody just, everybody just sitting there, like they didn't, there's nothing they can do. You're talking about point. the Trade Tower, are you? Yeah, and, you didn't see and, the footage. And somebody was photographing at the Trade Tower last night? Yeah, I had, she shot the last, probably the last photo ever shot at the Twi Trade Center. Okay, let's have a look at what you have and do you mind uh, just taking us just through it as we watch it on the air? How much, how much video is there here, do you know? Uh, this is, this is footage. Oh my goodness me! This that's is the uh, that's the um, all that's standing of the twin towers right now in the background. That's all that's standing. That's it. That's all that's left. So you are literally right inside. Um, what, what time did you actually photograph? I don't even know. That, that was here. actually I rode my motorcycle right up from there. That was like about that was about an hour ago. Not even. And this is right at the center of where the trade right, towers right stood you can until. See, like when you see the firemen, they just there's nothing they can do. It's just like amazing. You must have been frightened at the very least to be there. Uh, I mean, I was just I was just thinking to myself how what a powerful uh, act of ignorance it was. Really, I mean, just, it's amazing. And this is the building I adjacent to. That's a twin tower. Like, that right. was a twin tower. That was the other part. And then we went up into more into there. You know, I, re I just thought to myself, I can smell it. But in fact, what yeah, I can do is smell your yeah. shirt. Yeah. You've brought the smell of this disaster with you on your T-shirt. Were there other people in there? There's any? I don't see any any uh, anybody sort of. You know, no, I was when I was with one other person. I ran into there who actually somebody I know, and he was ph photographing as well. And that was just us two, and then the firemen. It's funny, I ran into my friend right there, who's also taking pictures. He should be somewhere. They probably edited him out. It's absolutely... Look at that. That's all that's left. 
That's, that's Do you know whether it. that's the South Tower or the North Tower? That's the South Tower. And you saw no sign of life in here no, whatsoever? No, I went, I went all the way right there. Like, I don't know if they edited it out yet, but there's a big <coughs> hole going down to the ground. There's nobody. And then we ran into somebody else because we hadn't seen anybody. Nobody. But the firemen said, you know, that there's been a lot of people dead, like a lot of firemen died. Because there were firemen in the building at the time trying to help people evacuate from the building. Yeah. They said two, 200 people died. I thought the fireman I saw too said 200 people died already. And this, this wall here, this is from part of the tower yeah, itself? Yeah, that's the south tower, the, the, the lobby. And it's all the smoke and there's still fire going on in there right now. Are you walking across? Yeah, see, you're, you're walking yeah, across, and that's your yeah. friend also yeah. with, the, yeah. with the photograph. And the yeah. building on the right that occasionally appears in, 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 is in a building adjacent? Yeah, and it's just gouged. Like, the parts of the Twin Tower just gouged out the building. It's, see, that's the this concourse is... below. That's going down like 20 feet or so. But that's, that's the part that's crazy. It's just that's all that's left. So. Did you hear anything while you were in there? Just like cracklings and pops and stuff. See, that's, that's the guy who's been looking for his friends, and he didn't find anybody either. And do we know who this person is? No, he, he was speaking uh, Russian. Really? Looking through the, through the devastation. And this now is what? This is a party, actually. So. Last night? No, it's a while ago. But. Mm. Well, where was the party in? Uh, that was in uh, PS1. Oh, so, so you just simply decided to go in there to see what you could what you could photograph. Yeah, I wanted it because I. It's funny because the name of my magazine is Prophecy, and we had just shot the Twin Towers last night. My photographer Amy had just been shooting it with a four x five fo uh, format last night, and I hadn't spoken to her yet. And then my friend called me this morning and said, "Did you hear what happened?" And I said, "No." And then, so I went to like I said, I went to the city to see Amy because I couldn't reach her. All the phones were down. And so I went to, uh, I went right to, uh, to the site. Were you, were you doing a feature on the Twin Towers, were you? Well, basically, I was photographing the Twin Towers for, for the power of the Twin Towers, architecturally and, like, metaphorically, what they stood for. And then, you know, these people, you know, wanted to destroy them. I was kind of, you know, I was, uh, I was observing them more. We had been shooting it for over a week. Really? And it's ended in this vulnerable place? Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I just get one other thing clear? You managed to get right onto the site itself, right onto the top of, of, of one of the two towers. Right. But I couldn't see any police. I couldn't see any fire department. Well, they were all back there. We went, I went right into it. They were all, like, just around it. Did you have any sense when you were walking on it that it was too dangerous to be on? No. Well, you know, they were the f when, we, when we first started walking in, the fire people were like, no, don't go. But we just went in. And you we never wanted heard, to see. And you never heard a sound except the sound of Yeah, there was no people, cracking. there was no nothing. There was just glass breaking and stuff like that. Hmm. Well, Kevin, thank you for this. Kevin Sudavi, he's a publisher of a magazine called Prophecy. And he, thanks very much, Kevin, for coming. Anything else you can think of, just... I mean, I just wanted to say, I think that it's a powerful act of, of ignorance at the end of the day, because this country is so full with so many different types of people. And I, I can understand, um, you know, people and their frustrations with capitalism and, and other, just capitalism. I can understand people's frustration. But to, to, to do that type of destruction to people they don't even know, it's just, like I said, it's powerful. I understand they're trying to make, get a message across, but it's also powerfully ignorant. In my opinion, that's all I can say. I think it's a thing that I think I think it's a thing that many people in the country agree with today, uh, that it was an act of terror and an act of ignorance, and and which the government has said repeatedly today it'll try to get to the bottom of, but nobody's very hopeful about I that. I mean, it's obvious that the that there needs to be a better dialogue between, you know, these people and what they need done, and what what we're doing, and uh, they're they're bringing the uh, the field to a whole nother level, mm -hmm. but. Um, I, like I said, I understand to an extent, but it needs to go further than I think than what they're doing. Well, we're grateful as a news organization that you decided to bring that video in here. Thanks very much, Kevin Sudeby, because it gives us the closest, the most intimate sense we have seen yet of what it is like at ground zero in terms of the building collapsing in on itself. And I think that George Stephanopoulos can add to the status of the building, and also, George, to the current police activity. I must, weren't you a bit surprised to see nobody in there besides young Mr. Sudovy? 
Nobody at all. It really was surprising, although it did accord with what we had heard earlier, Peter, and now we've just heard from our, one of our reporters, Lucy Kerrigan, who's gotten quite close, that the police are actually pulling back from the scene right now. The police and other rescue personnel are pulling back from the scene because they're concerned about two things. Number one, all of the asbestos in the air coming out from that smoke from the collapsing building, and secondly, the possibility of other buildings collapsing in the area. So they've actually pulled away now. Um, from ground zero, if you will. Secondly, Peter, another, another grim note. Um, we have now heard that Chelsea Piers, which is a large several block long athletic complex over here on the west side at 17th Street and 11th Avenue, has now been turned into an, a temporary hospital and morgue here in Manhattan. It's the first temporary hospital and morgue that's been set up. There are now 30 ambulances operating out of there, and that will be one of the major sites here on the uh, lower west side. Thanks very much, George. Actually, we're now looking at some more footage that Kevin Sotheby's taking. Kevin, just tell us where this is. What is this? This is on the, uh, on the West End Highway, and um, I can't remember the other street. You can't tell. This. You really can't tell, but it's right there where the South Tower was, where the Marriott was. The Marriott Hotel, yeah. the Marriott uh, Hotel headquarters there, and and you're you're still focused very much on the on the Trade Towers itself, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, and on the rubble, it's just amazing. It's the cars, the ambulances are all crushed, lights are still going, horns are still being, you know, are still blowing. Is there, is there, a, did, did you pick up there was some sense of activity here, that there was some sense of purpose, or just people overwhelmed by what had happened? You mean the uh, fire department? Fire department, the police, There's nothing the other they could do. They, were, they said that there were already 200 firemen dead. They were just, you know, it was futile. It's, they said uh, it's bigger than their... There's not enough people. There's just a handful of people there. Because so many firemen were working to get other people out when I mean, this actually none, happened. Yeah. I mean, you need an army of people to... to and of course, the city will have an army of people before long because the National Guard is coming in. Uh, it's very interesting what the, the mayor said some time ago. He said people need relief, desperately want relief. At the same time, they don't want relief because they don't want to leave the job they are doing uh, because in many cases they are... Uh, looking for and or supporting their friends and the colleagues. And, and that's a, a bit of a review there of some of the material that, that uh, Kevin Sotheby shot uh, earlier, and which we're very glad to have. Um, I'm just looking at, at one more report from our foreign desk here this morning that a KAL plane, Chuck Lustig, a KAL plane, KAL, you mean the Korean? Korean Airlines plane? Thanks very much. A Korean Airlines plane was forced down by U.S. and Canadian forces over White Horse Bay in Canada earlier today. The Canadian Television reports that forces on the ground stormed the plane, and we have no other details at this time. But there's another <coughs> aberrant incident uh, today happening in, in Canada. U.S. military throughout the world. Uh, we've said before are on the highest state of alert so from what's 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 spread out from here um, has just been quite extraordinary in terms of putting everybody in the world uh, most u.s military forces on threat condition delta which is the highest uh, uh, condition uh, that the military the highest alert the military can be on um, but as, as any number of people have reported today, any notion that the U.S. was invincible died in this, uh, in, in this rubble. Um, listening, to some of the, listening to some of the politicians talk today, Senator Chuck Hagel of Nebraska, where the president is at the moment, uh, said America is forever changed and America is in for a long fight, which I think people in the, in the, in the fight against uh, terrorism understand and have understood for a very long time. But Somebody else said this is a huge wake-up call for the United States, both former Secretary of State Baker and I think the former director of the CIA said that, uh, that there, was, there was just not enough human intelligence on behalf of the United States in these organizations and cells around the world. John McCrethy, our Pentagon correspondent, has just come from a Pentagon briefing. And um, so we'll pick you up, John. John, yeah, what are you hearing? Uh, Peter, one of the things they wanted to do and do very publicly is to deal with the rumor that had been circulating for several hours that uh, the fourth civilian jetliner that was hijacked was shot down by American uh, aircraft. They are denying that flatly. They say it is absolutely not true, Peter.
John, I apologize. I was distracted. And so for the benefit of anybody else was distracted, the media mind repeating that. I'm sorry. They are denying the rumor that had been circulating for several hours that the U.S. military shot down one of the civilian jetliners. They are saying that is absolutely oh. not true. Okay, thank you, John. You caught me off balance because, in fact, I'd never heard the rumor in the first place and not heard, and not heard the report whatsoever. Now, you've been in a briefing. What else did you hear? Um, well, they're not saying a whole heck of a lot. What they are saying is that they now have accounted for the presence uh, of all of the Joint Chiefs, the service secretaries, uh, and of course the Secretary of Defense. Those are people who have been accounted for. Um, what we are now learning is that um, a new part of the Pentagon that uh, is, has just been occupied was one of the areas that was terribly hit. Uh, we believe there are going to be quite a few casualties from the Army, the Navy, and the Marine Corps in particular, uh, as well as the Defense Intelligence Agency. Do you have any, under any idea what the num quite a number of casualties means? Uh, no idea whatsoever, Peter. Uh, you consider the density uh, in the Pentagon. There are 20 to 24,000 people that work there. Uh, it took out one huge slice of it. Uh, so you have to do your own arithmetic. Uh, if you look at the size of the gash over my shoulder, uh, you have to believe that there are many, many hundreds of people who died. And what have the briefers had to say this afternoon, John, about the state of alert in the, uh, in the world generally, with all U.S. forces on such a state of alert? I'm sorry, before you go to that, we're just looking at a picture which gives us, I think, the best view yet, if this is an accurate drawing, um, of... of of what the degree of damage or penetration of the plane will have been to the Pentagon. I'm not sure that's absolutely accurate, but by the way, ABC's Ann Compton tells us the president may be on the move again, and ABC's Charlie Gibson has information as well. Charlie? Well, Peter, there's going to be hundreds, I guess, and we don't know the number of personal stories that are going to come out of this, people who have died in the World Trade Center or at the Pentagon or on the airplanes that were hijacked and crashed in various places. We now understand the wife of Ted Olson. He is the Solicitor General of the United States. Mm -hmm. America came to know him because he's the man who argued the President's case in front of the Supreme Court, George W. Bush's case in front of the Supreme Court. He was not yet President when the case of the Florida election was being disputed before the Supreme Court. Ted Olson's wife, Barbara, who is a former federal prosecutor herself. She was on the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. We had heard this from friends of the family. Regrettably, it has now been confirmed. She apparently was able to make a phone call to her husband, the Solicitor General, Ted Olson, and tell him they were being hijacked, that all of those on board the plane, that is American Airlines Flight 77, that had taken off from Dulles Airport heading for Los Angeles this morning, a 757, uh, that had 64 people aboard. All of the passengers had been herded into the back of the plane. Uh, she was able to get a call out saying they were in the process of being hijacked, and then shortly after that, uh, the plane crashed into the Pentagon. Uh, she was herself, as I say, a former federal prosecutor. She had also become familiar, I think, to many uh, in the viewing audience of television as a commentator recently over the situation of Gary Condit. Indeed, I'd had a chance uh, to talk with her a couple of times on Good Morning America just in the past couple of weeks. So we're going to hear hundreds of these stories of people who were killed in, in the various venues that were affected today. But uh, this one, obviously, is very painful, the wife of the Solicitor General of the United States. Peter. Thanks very much, Charlie. Uh, and I, I think in the whole day, this is the first name we've had of anybody who's died. The first name, the first personality, even to hundreds and thousands of families around the country. The names and personalities are all from many familiar people they fear are in trouble, who know they're in trouble, who've been confirmed they're in trouble. The desperation of people at some remote, at, at a distance from people in trouble is just a horrendous thing to report. But I believe that's the first name we've had all day of being able to identify somebody, Barbara Olson, who, as Charlie says, was very often on television, the wife of the Solicitor General, Ted Olson, uh, who died in the suicide attack on the Pentagon. John McCrethy, you still there? It's Peter. Yeah. John, come back to the briefing, if you would. I'm, I'm not sure we've heard everything from you on the briefing itself. Uh, they just are expressing their frustration and at the difficulty of getting rescue workers inside the Pentagon, Peter. 
uh, part of the building is still on fire, uh, and the fire is moving to sections of the Pentagon uh, along roofs and along various pipes. Uh, so they're having a real difficulty getting in there even to search for bodies at this early time. That is what they are focused on at this point. I will tell you, Peter, that Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, and most of the chiefs uh, have been in the National Military Command Center all day uh, since this terrorist strike. Uh, and you have to leave it up to your own imagination, the kinds of things that they are contemplating uh, in their hours uh, after the strike. Okay, John, thank you very much indeed. John McCrethy, who's been at the Pentagon all day and was in the other side of the Pentagon <clears throat> when this aircraft was crashed into the Pentagon today. We now know with all of the passengers on board, at least in this one phone call, herded to the back of the plane, uh, who went from being passengers to hostages in, in, in a matter of, of seconds and minutes. Um, and John, who was working on the other side of the Pentagon, has said a couple of times that just on the other side of the Pentagon, you just felt this huge, just knew exactly that something had gone by. And when he first described the, the width of the gash and the height of the gash, six stories high, 200 feet wide, uh, which you can't appreciate on television, quite frankly, as much as you think you can. And, and we've had several reports in from Martha Raddatz at the State Department, um, which I think most of, the, most of them we've had on the air so far, which was the State Department ordered U.S. embassies around the world to close for the day, but it's up to the individual embassy, given, on the, given the situation that they think uh, is appropriate in their region. Many have closed for the day. Uh, Secretary of State Powell, who's been in Colombia, uh, is on his way home tonight, but we do not know actually where he is at, at the moment. I told you just a moment ago that Ann Compton, who's been with President Bush all day, uh, believes that he is on the move, or they are on the move again, and one can only believe. I shouldn't say that. One can only, we didn't think they were going to go to Nebraska. We can only imagine that there's this pressure to get the president back to the nation's capital. And um, the State Department was evacuated at the time. Uh, this world, there's actually been a worldwide caution about terrorist activity out and about uh, universally uh, since the 7th of September, but it had absolutely nothing, nothing whatsoever to do uh, with what happened in New York City and in Washington today and what potentially happened, we we're told, at Camp David based on the information from one passenger who called 911 from the United Airlines that crashed near Johnstown, which said that they were headed in the direction of of, of Camp David. The New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange have both announced that they will not trade tomorrow and they will make a decision tomorrow on when trading will resume. The country has, in many ways, come to a halt, not completely by any means, because every politician has spoken and had a chance to speak today has made the point that if you, if you change too much in the country, you're doing exactly what the terrorists and their allies would like you to do. Linda Douglas on Capitol Hill. Linda. Good afternoon. This is Maureen Bundyan with Dell Walters at ABC7. We are showing you a live picture of the fire, which is still going on at the Pentagon this afternoon. Uh, this is in the wake of this terrible, terrible terrorist incident uh, early this morning. Uh, so far, there have not been uh, accounts of all the personnel in the Pentagon. Rescue efforts of those who are injured and in that building uh, still going on, as you can see. And uh, just a little while ago, there was a briefing outside the Pentagon about the situation there. Let's uh, show you what, uh, what the Pentagon officials had to say. Uh, right now, they're still working on the fire. We have smoke throughout the, the uh, building. We're fortunate in this part of the building in that the part of the, where the plane hit, one part of it was just beginning to be occupied. As areas had just been renovated. So part of it was occupied, but not all of it. As I just told you, the Navy and the Marine Corps say that not everyone in the Pentagon has been accounted for so far. If you work in the Pentagon, they want you to call this toll-free number. That's for both civilian and military workers. Please call this number, 1-877-663-6772, and let the Pentagon officials know that you are all right and accounted for. Dell? And, Maureen, uh, we just received the special late edition of the Washington Post. The headline reads, Terror Hits Pentagon World Trade Center. Uh, we'll get a shot of it on camera three here. But uh, that is the way that it is officially being recorded, history being recorded as of this day. Undoubtedly, this is one of those days where people will say, 
I was standing at such and such a place when it happened. We want to bring you up to date also on the number of injuries that are taking place. We have some graphics that we'll bring up on the screen. We are receiving reports that 31 injured parties have been taken to Virginia Hospital Center. Another five people are listed in critical condition at the Washington Hospital Center. George Washington Hospital has two people still in the emergency room at this point. Alexandria Anova Hospital, we are being told, has 10 people there. Uh, actually, we are being told that is 14 people, 10 of them in fair condition, one in critical condition, and three in stable. Perhaps if there is any bright side to all of this so far, and I repeat, it is early, but so far we have received no word of any fatalities yet. Yeah, thank you. We uh, go back to ABC News with Peter Jennings right now, of course, but uh, we'll have more for you on ABC 7 News at 5 o'clock this evening. Taken out of the city to a secret location. They had just been moved down the street. Yes, that's right. We have been told that they were taken out of the city. Helicopters came and picked them up on the ground, some of them. We don't know which ones got into the helicopters because it was just too far away for us to see and took them out of, uh, out of uh, Washington. But okay. it could be to someplace very close. Thanks very much, Linda Douglas. We're going to go to Lynn Schur and talk about the aircraft involved today in just a minute. Before we do, just want to give you some other examples of how this has affected the country as a whole. The Emmys. Uh, which were going to be held in Los Angeles, the Latin Grammys, which rescheduled uh, uh, their award ceremonies uh, for tomorrow night. I think the Latin Grammys uh, have now canceled or postponed their particular celebrations. We told you earlier or about some of the other examples, but uh, aside from looking at that list on the screen itself, think of this. Aside from the work stoppages, this is the first time this is the first time since D-Day in 1944 that organized baseball has wiped out a whole day of regular season play. First time since D-Day in, in 1944, the landing of the Allied forces on the beaches at Normandy, which led ultimately to the liberation of Europe um, from the Germans. It's the first time since 1944 that organized baseball has done that. And there were couple, all of the television shows in New York City, which... <clears throat> David Letterman show the and I, and others on CBS which all get um, television audiences popular audiences coming from around the country they've all canceled their if their tapings they'll be either in reruns uh, tonight this is true of the late night show on on NBC um, malls across the country malls across you some of you who live out around about the country you all know this better than we do but malls around the country I simply lock their doors and people couldn't go and shop in the malls today. It was this feeling that anywhere there were people gathered, uh, that there was a measure of vulnerability which we had seen uh, in New York City. <clears throat> now, the mayor of New York City, Rudolph Giuliani, says at the moment that at least 2,100 people have been injured and 600 of them taken to hospitals and that there are 15 hundred walking wounded who have been taken to uh, Liberty State Park, which is on the other side of the New York Harbor there, uh, where the Hudson River meets the harbor. It, it may be live, but I'm not quite sure what you're looking at. Is this from the New Jersey side? This is from Liberty State Park, uh, looking, I assume, across the New York Harbor uh, at an earlier point today, because the smoke is not as thick now as it was. That's live. That's a live photograph, and that is that dark smoke is still coming from the trade tower itself. Thank you. Um, as for the attack on the Pentagon, the Virginia Hospital Center in Arlington, Virginia, reports uh, there have been as many 31 people injured there and admitted to the hospital, including two who are in surgery. <clears throat> and, and most other patients are in intensive care, are in, in intensive care, or are being treated for smoke uh, immolation. I'm joined by Tom Humphreys. But I don't know much more about you, Mr. Humphreys, than that. You were in the World Trade Center on the 57th floor. Yes. And you walked out. Yes. So take us from the beginning, would you? Well, I was sitting at my desk working on a uh, speech I was supposed to give this afternoon. And you... the building was rocked by an explosion. And Which tower were you in? I was in Tower 1. Right. And the next thing I knew, I saw flaming debris uh, cascading down uh, the side of the building. And um, I was in the 93 bombing, right. and I knew this one was a, was a lot worse. So uh, we went out on the floor and basically... You worked for a business in the building? I worked for a law firm in the building. Right. Mm -hmm. And basically, 
went on the floor, uh, tried to figure out what was going on, uh, figure out whether we should evacuate or not. Uh, about five minutes into that, we decided that it was best to get out. You were in the south. You were in the south tower. Uh, we were in the north. That's oh, right, the north tower. North tower, right. which is one world <clears throat> trade. Right. Uh, decided that it was time to get out. Our office manager heard that the plane had been uh, that the building had been hit by an aircraft at the 90th floor. So we assumed that that the problem was above us, and uh, that we could evacuate. And that's what folks did. Did you think at the moment that it was a terrorist attack? Did you think it was I an had, accident? Did you have the biggest I, idea? I had hmm. some idea there was a bombing. Having been in the uh, 93 uh, incident, that kind of explosion just doesn't happen normally. I didn't know what it was, um, but uh, when I heard there was a plane that hit, I thought that made some sense. And, and I thought that it was very unlikely that, a, that any kind of plane would hit the Trade Center uh, accidentally, hmm. you know, on a clear day. So, uh, was there, uh, how, uh, how immediate, how deep was the concern in your colleagues and, and out on the common halls? It, was there panic at all? No, that's the, the one thing what, what, what I found is, is no panic. Uh, people are concerned. People are a little apprehensive uh, and they want to know what to do. Um, but uh, both on the floor and then uh, down the stairwell, there's no panic. And in fact, people were helping other people uh, to an mm. incredible degree. Were the stairwells lighted? Yes, this time they were. Last time they weren't. Th this time the stairwells were lighted. There was some smoke, but that was, uh, it wasn't nearly as bad. Was there emergency lighting? Uh, yeah, there was. Um, there was no other, you know, there were no fire or police personnel. Uh, at that point, you're on your own. Now, you came and down from the 57th floor. Were yes. other people coming down from the floors above yeah, you and below you? they were coming you? down uh, <clears throat> from the floors above. There were some injured people that came down, apparently, from you know, floors where this had happened. And so uh, we saw them as well. And how long did it take you to get out of the building? You know, I, I estimate it took me 45 minutes uh, or more to get out of the building. And, and in the time that you were coming down, there was another aircraft hit the southern. Yeah, tower. I was on the 44th floor trying to get down, and, and we heard another you know, explosion. We didn't know what it was. We again saw flaming debris. And uh, uh, I now know that that's, you know, that was the second aircraft that hit. I think so. you maybe know where I'm going. You were on the you were on the 90th floor. It took you 45 minutes. 57th floor. floor. There were people coming down from floors above you. Right. Is it your sense that in at least your tower, before the tower collapsed, everybody or a large number of percentage of people managed to be evacuated? I, th I think a lot of people got up. First of all, it was uh, 8:45 in the morning, so that's relatively mm -hmm. early by New York standards. Right. Uh, and then secondly, the the first uh, plane that hit. Uh, there seemed to, there was time to get out. I think even had that, there were a lot of people still in that building, including the fire and police personnel that were trying to come up. So, but, but my sense is that uh, I know on our floor, a lot of people got out. And as you came down, were you joined by people on other floors? Is it a common yeah. evacuation yeah. passage it's, down through well, the Well, the problem was there was only one stairwell open. Uh, the, other, the other stairwells were blocked by smoke. And so you had one narrow stairwell, which is what led to the delay in the evacuation. And that's, you know, that's why it took so long to get out. We've told people in the rest of the country, fairly regular, the 50,000 people who work in the two trade centers. Yeah. And you say 8.45 in the morning is a little late for New York City. Is, do you, well, do you it's have a little any, early. Sorry, a little early. Yeah. Uh, do, you have, do you have a feeling that a lot of people hadn't gone into the building at this point? Uh, I know in our offices, you know, we're a law firm. We start at 9.30, and, and a lot of people were not there yet. Uh, some of the businesses which operate on an earlier schedule, I'm sure everybody was there. Right. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the, the building wasn't as full as it could have been. If, if it had been two hours later, yeah. uh, it would have been much worse. And did, did you notice uh, today as you went to work or as you came out that it was more sparsely populated? Uh, it, it was about the same. I mean, right. it, was, uh, it was about a normal day. I, I must confess I'm say. amazed at how calm you are, having been through not only the 1993 bombing, but this and walked down by yourself, and you seem perfectly calm. Well, I'm... Happy to be here. Right. <laughs> so, and, 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 and how did people behave as you were evacuating? People, I mean, that, that was, it, I saw it again eight years ago and I saw it today. People were incredibly calm and they were helping other people. I fear that some of the people that were helping other people didn't make it out of that building uh, because, you know, they stayed behind and uh, fire personnel. Uh, so, but, but people, there was no panic that I saw. And in that environment, you have a narrow stairwell, a lot of people, you don't know what's going on. It's, it's a recipe for disaster, and the people are, are very, very calm.
Could you tell at all from your perspective on the 57th floor that when the aircraft hits, which we think is about the 90th mm -hmm. floor, at least right. in the very top part of the right. building, how many floors were actually damaged at the time, or did people talk at all about the degree of damage that had been done just by the plane hitting before the building collapsed? It was a little hard to tell. You, you had some people coming down from the higher floors. Um, so you people know. were able to get from the higher floors down through yeah. the damaged part of the yeah. building? Well, uh, that I don't know. Yeah, okay. My sense is that they came down from floors under 90 and were able to get down above 90. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, I know that in Tower 2, I talked to someone from Tower 2, and they were able to get down from uh, around the 88th floor. Uh, they were evacuating. When our tower was hit, they were evacuating, and then their tower was hit. Uh, and even so, they were able to get down because they were on the right side of the building. Right. So. And, and were you there when first Tower 2 and then Tower 1 collapsed? Uh, well, I, was, I just had exited the building, and I was out on Church Street. And uh, tower, uh, uh, the way I saw it, Tower 2 came down. The South Tower came the down South first. Tower. And... Uh, I, I did. I did see that. Yeah, and and then I assume you ran. I ran like hell. Yeah, we've seen we've seen the video of people just yeah. running like yeah. hell in in every direction to get as far yeah. away as possible. And I think the tragedy is that the the, the police and fire personnel that were trying to help people out of that building were other. right at ground zero when that happened. So you have to give them a lot of credit. And as somebody said, we've said several times today, when the, when the folks are running one way, the police and yeah. the fire department mm -hmm. are running and are running the that's other way, trying, absolutely true. trying to help. Anything, uh, anything else aside from your survival, which strikes you with this several hours after we went through this horrible experience? Well, I mean, you know, it, I think everybody in this country believes we've got to find the people that did it, and we've got to deal with them. And, you know, there is, I felt this way in 1993, and I think there is no stronger emotion. Uh, and, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, this cannot happen in this country. Many thanks, Tom. Really appreciate you helping us to understand. That's Tom Humphreys, who works in a law firm in the Trade Tower. He was in the, in the North Tower on the 57th floor, and he walked out, and you've heard his story. And ABC's Charlie Gibson uh, has been trying to get a handle on some of the other stories which are similar. Charlie? Well, Peter, we've been trying to keep track of the injury situation as it exists. Obviously, the numbers of those who have died today, it's going to be some time before we have any estimates and properly people in New York and in Washington around the Pentagon are not commenting. They shouldn't because we don't have any concept. But as you reported a few moments ago, Mayor Giuliani uh, did talk about the numbers of injured saying at least, and these are very rough numbers, at least 2,100 people injured, 600 taken to hospitals, 1,500 walking wounded, he said, many of whom have been evacuated to New Jersey's Liberty State Park right across uh, the river, the Hudson River, from where the World Trade Centers were. And we have some further reports. Uh, ABC's Cynthia McFadden, who has been down in that area all day long, says that a triage center has been set up on the Chelsea Piers in New York City. Now, the Chelsea Piers is not a hospital area at all. It's an area of, that used to be uh, shipping piers along the Hudson River and lower Manhattan and uh, is now used for recreational purposes. There are tennis courts and golf driving ranges and uh, other things there, uh, meeting rooms, that kind of thing. It's a commercial operation. But uh, a triage center has been set up there and 50 makeshift operating rooms are being prepped and hundreds of ambulances are there waiting to take injured away from that facility but they are doing treatment of people right uh, on the site or nearby uh, at Chelsea Piers. Reports from some of the hospitals uh, that are taking the injured. St. Vincent's Hospital here in New York uh, the numbers again very rough but an estimate of over 200 that have been taken in there three dead 18 in critical condition and the most chilling quote that you can hear a Dr. Stephen Stern there at St. Vincent's Hospital quoted as saying hundreds of people, hundreds of people coming in have been burned from head to toe. Bellevue Hospital reporting more than 100 patients brought in, two dead. Uh, Beth Israel reporting earlier that 70 patients had been brought in. There are some um, estimates from hospitals in Virginia near the Pentagon uh, of dozens of people having been brought in there. And the I guess the heartening note in all this, uh, hospitals around New York who, that are not in the immediate vicinity of the World Trade Centers, um, people saying hundreds of donors are reportedly lined up to give blood outside Beth Israel Medical Center and some others uh, here in New York City. Uh, and, 
and what I guess is a precursor of what is going to be the kinds of terrible news that we're going to get over the next few days. A spokesman at the medical examiner's office in New York City, the coroner's office, says that for now all of the bodies uh, that are being brought in, dead bodies, will go to the medical examiner's office on First Avenue here in New York. They say they have room for several hundred bodies and they are making room for more space since they anticipate more bodies will be brought in. Uh, one other note to mention, uh, at 4.30 this afternoon Eastern Time, the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, says that it has activated all 10 of FEMA's regional headquarters around the country, uh, including those on the East Coast and then all the way west uh, as far as San Francisco and the state of Washington. They have activated all of those uh, regional headquarters, activated the Federal Response Plan, which uh, FEMA says brings together 28 federal agencies and the American Red Cross, and 12 urban search and rescue teams are being dispatched. Eight of them are being sent here to New York and four to Washington, all deployed uh, to search for victims of what has happened today. And the Health and Human Services Department uh, has activated a national medical emergency system. It's really an unprecedented move, uh, but it could dispatch nearly 7,000 volunteer doctors, nurses, pharmacists, other medical staff to areas that have been affected by today's attacks. So that brings you up somewhat to date on uh, what's being done in terms of those who have been injured and provisions now being made for those who've been killed today. Peter? Thank you, Charlie, very much. Uh, uh, just to uh, uh, try to keep the sort of sense or the proportion of casualties into some kind of... Uh, in some kind of perspective, uh, the gentleman with whom we've just been talking, who worked in a law firm in the Northern Tower, uh, said that after the first aircraft uh, hit in, in, in that tower, which is 8.48 Eastern Time, this is one of those where were you when moments, I'm just utterly convinced will be that way in, in, term, in historical terms, where were you when the first aircraft and then the second aircraft uh, cr crashed or were crashed into the Twin Trade Towers in New York City on this day, uh, the 11th of the month. And there's a timeline. If it's eight hours now since uh, since this happened, and where Mayor Giuliani speaks just a few minutes ago, uh, they know of 2,100 people injured. And you see the pictures that the young man brought us from from the absolute bottom, ground zero location, uh, where the where the tower not only crashed on itself but then crashed down into the ground. There wasn't a sound there except the sound of flames licking up from underground and there was no sign of any person and 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 we know as we've said it many times that, that the fire department and the police department were going inwards not outwards when all of this happened it's just absolutely impossible to get a grasp on very interested in 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 the gentleman we spoke to a little while ago from the law firm tom forgotten i'm probably gotten his last name say it out loud Thank you, Tom Humphreys. Tom Humphreys, who said that it was his impression, at least in his building, in, in the North Tower, that a lot of people got out of that or had not arrived at work because it was, as he said, by New York standards, just a little earlier than people were accustomed. But, but when this young man, Mr. Sabiz, uh, brought his, his video that he'd taken, he's on his, just got on his motorbike up and then walked in uh, to, to this scene on the ground, it is to realize that everybody's being kept, as Bill Lakemore subsequently confirmed for us, being kept at a distance from this at the side. And that's what's left on the left of the facade of the North Tower. ABC's Bob Jamison is downtown now. And Bob, we're looking at the pictures that have been brought to us by this young producer of a magazine. Can you just talk in general terms as you like? Well, generally speaking, Peter, uh, as the smoke uh, blows back and forth and uh, for a moment or two doesn't obscure both of the two World Trade Center buildings, you see so little. It's a, it's a tremendously eerie feeling to be in Lower Manhattan, looking down toward the tip of the island and seeing very few people, no traffic, uh, the smoke continuing to billow from these buildings, and nothing where there were once these two landmarks that drew everyone's attention, whether you drove or flew or came to New York by boat. Uh, but. Peter, there is a new concern, according to authorities, at this moment here in Lower Manhattan, and that is the growing fear that another building in the World Trade Center complex, which was not struck by an airplane, is in danger of collapsing. That is number seven World Trade Center, somewhat shorter, somewhat uh, with somewhat fewer stories than uh, numbers one and two. 
there is a fire burning vigorously in the lower floors of that building, threatening the foundation. And the building was already damaged some six hours ago now uh, when the North Tower collapsed. And part of that process of the building collapsing struck and damaged number seven World Trade Center. So it's already was already at some risk before this fire grew as vigorously as it has. Uh, the authorities have now moved people several blocks away from that building and we're just watching and waiting to see what happens. Bob, is number seven World Trade Center, and I see you've now managed to come down to, to, to the ground, which suggests things loosen up a little bit. Um, is that where the mayor's emergency headquarters are? Peter, I don't, I, I honestly oh. don't know, but I will tell you that number seven is just behind number two. Uh, I'm in Tribeca now, and uh, you're seeing mostly smoke from the remnants of number one and number two, but there somewhere in that smoke is number seven. I don't know how big uh, number seven, the World Trade Center is, is it, uh, but uh, my recollection is a fairly low building, isn't it? Or is... y yes, I, I would guess, and I I'm sorry to have to make a guess, that it is only about half as tall as number two. Okay. That, uh, that well, seems to me what, well, we'll what it find, appeared to be. We'll find out soon enough. I appreciate it, Bob. Thanks very much, Bob Jameson, who, as this day unveils, manages to get closer and closer. In a minute, we're going to talk to... Uh, to a freelance photographer who got really close today, but he's making a phone call at the moment. Take your time, Evan, and we'll come back to you. I can see where you've been just by the state of your equipment at this moment. Uh, but uh, as it has been about eight hours now, let us try to, to bring you up today with the horrendous sights and sounds of this attack on the United States and its citizens today. Here's ABC's John Donvan. We want to tell you what we know as we know it, but we just got a report in that there's been some sort of explosion at the first the thing World any Trade television Center camera saw this morning was this just before nine o'clock, roughly 15 minutes earlier, an American Airlines jet hijacked from Boston had crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. There were 92 people on board. It did not appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my God. Oh my God. That looks like a second plane. As just I did not see a plane go in. That, that Minutes later, the second plane, plane, the second tower. The, the, fireball the fireball ate up the aircraft. Explosion. It was a United Airlines flight, a 767 from Boston right to Los Angeles. The there had been 65 so people on board. Like some sort of a concerted... I was happened to look on the first tower, and I actually saw people waving where the first plane crashed through, and then it was unbelievable seeing this second jet come crashing into the second tower. What is going on? <laughs> New York City was staggered. As soon as he got hit, I was thrown to a window. So I was very lucky to get out. There's a lot of people that didn't get out. There's a lot of people coming down the stairs, burnt up. It's, it's, it's bad. And still it wasn't over. This was the southern tower falling in on itself. It was now roughly an hour since the first attack. Meanwhile, it was beginning here in Washington. Another hijacked plane hits the Pentagon. U.S. officials are saying there was no warning, no indicators of any kind of a likely terrorist attack. Uh, number two, they say Pentagon officials uh, within the intelligence and the counterterrorism offices are now looking at this very intensely. ABC reporters across the city are beginning to hear the word terrorism. Uh, it seems obvious unofficially to people here that it was a terrorist attack, uh, but they obviously can't reach any firm conclusions at this point. So the Pentagon is engaged, and I'm sure law enforcement is, uh, but they, they say they had no warnings. Report piles on report. Okay, there's been an explosion of some kind. Uh, that shook the ground of the Capitol. Uh, we all heard it. Everybody ran for cover. We don't know where it was. We don't see the smoke yet. Everybody's saying, get back. We're running. We're running. We're running. We're running. They're screaming at us to get back. On television, it looked like it was happening all over. 10.28 a.m., New York City, and in the shadow of the one remaining tower, a snatch of conversation between a reporter and a rescuer. Why are they pulling us out of here? Because the angel tower is leaning. The North Tower is Fight, march quick. Oh my God, there it goes! Uh, 
I looked up as soon as we got across the street. I looked up. I saw the building start, the tower start to buckle. I just turned and ran, ducked down, put a jacket over my head. Three or four of us huddled together, and uh, it was just black everywhere. Washington, the White House is evacuated. The Office of Personnel Management says all federal office buildings in the Washington area have been evacuated and closed. The employees sent home immediately. The evacuation order creates instant gridlock in downtown Washington. The president was not in the city. He was in Florida visiting a school. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Officials at this end are not confirming that the president's plane is going to, to Andrews. We don't know if it's going to Andrews or some other location. All I've said is that he will convene a National Security Council meeting, and we don't know where that will take place either. Obviously, they want to keep a lot of people guessing as, as to the president's whereabouts. Now it was lunchtime, and yet more terrible news is coming in. Another United Airliner with 45 people on board has crashed south of Pittsburgh, presumably another victim of terrorism. We talked to a couple of people who actually witnessed the plane going down and said it was quite devastating, went right down into the woods. They saw all sorts of debris flying out into the woods and into the trees, and it, uh, it's quite a, quite a devastating scene from what we're told. At this point, it is hard to believe we're still in the same day that began with this picture. National Guard units are out. Washington is shut down. Airports in the U.S. and Canada are closed. And the death toll, still uncountable, is also unimaginable. John Donvan, ABC News, Washington. Excellent report from John Donvan pulling together uh, this day, which has so much immediacy, so much history, such magnitude to it, and touches every American. And as I turn around on occasion to look at the, the computer screen behind me, I find emails coming in from people in other countries, um, uh, Canada and Europe included, uh, from friends and from families and colleagues, all expressing this, this deep empathy and sympathy for people here today uh, who had friends and acquaintances, but just seeming at, at whatever distance to appreciate uh, what is happening, even though they were not close to it. Um, we're now joined by a young man who was very close to it again. This is Evan Fairbanks. He's a freelance photographer. Uh, interestingly enough, you and I were just talking about journalist emotions uh, at a time like this, and the last thing journalists can afford to do is to fall prey to their emotions at a time like this because it's too hard in the middle of a story. But you were very close this morning and photographing on assignment for a church when things began to happen. So we're going to show your videotape, if we may, though. You're, are you principally sure. a still photographer? Uh, both? Still and video. Okay. Can we just look at what your first video is and explain it to us? Um, I walked out of Trinity Church after we had a, a, a blackout in our studio, and one of the studio managers grabbed one of our cameras when we knew what was happening. And I went out and was shooting Aftermath. Good God. And I suddenly saw a plane flying into my viewfinder and said, gee, it's kind of close for that to be here now and then realize what happened yeah. and uh... we'll run this again because I think this is the this is when we run that again Roger Goodman that's Roger Goodman our director because this is we've seen footage before of people on the run and I understand that that's your shadow as you went by a storefront yeah, it was it's the first time I've seen that and, and was there absolute panic Im immediately could instantly it was just pandemonium um, nobody knew what to do uh, there was no clear thinking. People were just reacting to kind of save themselves and, and the people around them. And this is such a moment. You're in the same location when the building comes down. I, I had been taken downstairs by Port Authority police who knew that I had this videotape. And we were moving actually to go back to the Trinity Church to make them a dub of the tape in a format that they could use on a VHS tape. And uh, suddenly I heard one of the guys say, hey, Evan, watch out. Hang on just a second. If you look in the upper, look, at, this now is frozen. And this is, I, this is an angle of this attack that we have not seen before. At the top of the building on your left, out of the left, will come the building. And watch how the aircraft penetrates the building. Go ahead. Completely in one side and out the other. It just or disappeared. It disappeared. And it, it just slammed right into it and was completely engulfed. We felt this kind of a sonic boom as if it were an earthquake. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Terrorism against our nation will not stand.
And about the time I saw the plane, I watched it come in very low over the trees, and it just dipped down, came down right over 395, right into the Pentagon. May God bless the victims, their families, and America. This is a special report from ABC 7 News, America Under Attack. New York's mayor calls it one of the most heinous acts in the world's history. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Del Walters. And I'm Kathleen Matthews. This is a day that will ultimately change our lives, a horrific sequence of events with a profound effect on the Washington area. And that's what we're going to focus on during this special report. We start with ABC 7 News reporter Carol Costello, who looks at the events of the past eight hours. I don't know if you guys really realized what the date is today. It's 9-11, which is 9-1-1. Don't know if it means anything, but it's very creepy. But September 11th will now be one of those terrible days when we will always remember where we were, like the day the Challenger exploded or President Kennedy was shot. Let me take you back now to 8.45 this morning. It was around 8.45, a beautiful, clear day in New York. Then, a horrible accident. Well, we just got a report in that there's been some sort of explosion at the World Trade Center. But minutes later, we learned it was no accident. There's another one. I'm taking a look. Oh, oh, oh my God! God. Oh, jeez! Oh, oh, my God! Take another look. A second plane with people on board flies directly into the South Tower. New York emergency crews watch in vain as people trapped by the flames beg for their help. It couldn't come. By 9.30, the president in Sarasota, Florida, confirms what we already know. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. And now if you join me in a moment of silence, But it wasn't over. By 9.40, a third plane crashes through the Pentagon. Suddenly, our own city is in crisis as thousands of terrified people flee the district. Government offices are closed. Schools are shut down. Unless you have specific business, stay off the streets right now. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. Twenty minutes later, at 10 o'clock, the first tower of the World Trade Center collapses. At the same time, United Flight 93 crashes 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. 38 minutes later, another explosion levels the second tower of the World Trade Center. Nation. By 1 o'clock, the president, now in Louisiana, Contested. threatens action. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. And it will be a test, an emotional, painful one, as New York, Washington, the country, mourned thousands of Americans killed by a faceless enemy. And right now, two aircraft carriers out of Norfolk, the John F. Kennedy and the Roosevelt, are headed to New York Harbor. Now, we understand the president has flown into Nebraska now. He will be heading back to Washington. Right now, there are still no claims of responsibility officially, but we have word from two different sources that the man behind this attack is Osama bin Laden. Dell, Kathleen. Carol, thank you very much. Ground zero in our area is the Pentagon, where the search for victims continues at this very hour. The plane landed on the northwest side of the Pentagon near the heliport. ABC 7 News reporter Daryl Carver continues our coverage from there. Daryl. Dell, the best thing we can do right now is actually show you some of the damage and some of what else is out here. There has been a lot of heavy equipment moved into the scene for the rescue efforts that are soon to get underway. Also, we've been told that the Fairfax County Elite Search and Rescue Team is also on the scene preparing to work once the fire is put out inside. What they have ahead of them, as well as all these other rescue workers, is a massive recovery effort. Early on, heavy flames and smoke could be seen from Route 27. Fire crews began immediately working on the blaze. We've been told that you can see pieces of the plane in the corridors of the Pentagon's outer E ring. Military personnel and civilians are said to be on the scene to help remove the injured and dead. We've also been told that the Secretary of Defense is on the scene and working closely with Pentagon officials. One witness describes to us what he heard at 9.30 this morning. 
did not hear the first crash, but I did hear the second explosion that occurred. There was another explosion that occurred, and we could hear it in Crystal City quite, quite profoundly. We were in a meeting there, and we could hear it quite profoundly. We wasn't sure if that was another attack or if it was a gas main that occurred there, but we could see the clouds coming all over and, of course, the, the odor. The impact was on the outer ring, which is the E ring. The, it looks, it appears though, the plane went in up to the E, D, and to the C ring. Not all the way through the C ring. Now, if you are Navy or Marine Corps personnel assigned to the Pentagon, the Pentagon wants to hear from you. The number is 877-663-6772. Number again, 1-877-663-6772. Now, joining me live out here is Jim Clark, our own Jim Clark, who is a veteran of the scene here in Washington. Have you ever seen a day quite like this? No, Darrell, I have not. I have uh, weathered many a crisis here at the Pentagon in my years as a reporter here, but I've never seen anything quite like this. You know, a short while ago, the Assistant Defense Secretary Victoria Clark called this a terrible day for America. One would be hard put, very hard put, to find a better description. These coordinated terrorist strikes hit the symbols of our economic and military power, and they most likely have killed and wounded hundreds of our fellow Americans reminiscent of another terrible day, the attack on Pearl Harbor. President Bush is somewhere in a secure command post conferring with his aides, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, Vice President Cheney. He promises we will hunt down and punish those responsible for this. It seems likely there will be a swift response. No waiting to sift through all the debris here at the Pentagon. The Colbar Towers attack, the attack on the USS Cole were terrible, but this is far worse. Likely targets will be those known to harbor terrorists like Osama bin Laden, but it could go beyond that to a broad range of the usual suspects. It is important, they say at times like this, to respond, but also important to hit the right targets. And you can bet the CIA, the DIA, and the FBI are busy right at this time working to help do that. Defense Secretary Rumsfeld is here in the Pentagon. He is said to be conferring with top brass. All of the Joint Chiefs have been located. All of the Defense Secretaries are here, none of them injured. Right now, the number one priority here is to try to find and rescue any survivors who may still be trapped in this burning section of the Pentagon. Good news, it seems to be in the last few minutes they've been able to put down some of the fire here, which appeared to be spreading through the attic. Back to you. Okay, Jim, thanks very much. Now, as we've reported, the plane that crashed into the Pentagon took off from Dulles Airport. ABC 7 News reporter Susan Roberts joins us live on the telephone from a nearby hotel where the victims' families are gathering. Susan, what's the scene there? Hi, Kathleen Dell. Well, a command center for the victims' families of American Airlines flight number 77 has been set up here at the Dulles Marriott, just right across the street from the Dulles Airport. American Airlines, as you said, has confirmed to us in a statement that 58 passengers, four flight attendants, and two pilots were on board the lost plane that crashed at the Pentagon. Those victims' families will be escorted to a private area here at the hotel. So far, we have not seen any of them just yet. Now, at Dulles Airport today, the FBI did do a sweep of the airport looking for any signs or clues as to exactly what might have happened. Throughout the day, we did see F-15 fighter planes flying over the airport as well. Like all of the airports in the country today, Dulles was shut down. A dozen or so airline employees are still scattered throughout the airport this evening. Flags have been lowered at Dulles as they have been all throughout the nation today. Now, the hotel here tonight is at full capacity with people who are trying to fly, were trying to fly out of here, as well as those who were rerouted here. You know, it is a very somber uh, scene out here. Um, the Red Cross is set up. Uh, they're anticipating having to greet these families tonight. It's going to be a very, very long and emotional night. We are in Fairfax County at the Dulles Marriott. Del, Kathleen. Susan, thank you very much. We want to update you on another situation that is developing. The large number of injuries means that there is a shortage of blood. And today, as ABC 7 News reporter Don Hudson shows us, people in our area immediately jumped up to try and help. It's the least we can do. Betty Pyle is one of hundreds of local citizens who have been moved to action because of this terrorist tragedy. It just, it's so 
unbelievable and it seems so helpless to do nothing so I have good blood I'm healthy for many this really is an unfortunate opportunity to try to help in some little way there's never enough blood and you always say to yourself oh yeah I need to get blood I need to get blood I need to get blood but you never do it so today there's a real need for blood and for some giving blood also means giving up a lot of time at this point in the line it might take three maybe even four hours but those we talk to say it's worth it if we can just do a little bit it just even to help the people who are going to be impacted by the blood that's used today, then we might as well. In Northwest Washington, Don Hudson, ABC 7 News. Coming up to you, Don. The American Red Cross has extended hours for blood donations at two other locations. The Fairfax Donor Center, you can see the information on your screen there, at 22810 Old Lee Highway, Suite 200, and the Rockville Donor Center at 11820 Park Lawn Drive. The donor heart lines, which are being overloaded, we are being told, are 1-800-GIVE-LIFE and 1-888-BLOOD-88. If you call, the Red Cross asks you please to be patient. Now, the attacks today, especially the attack here at the Pentagon, led to dozens of local school cancellations. ABC 7 News reporter Greta Cruz is in our newsroom right now to update families on what they can expect tomorrow. Greta, what's the latest there? Well, Kathleen, even our children have been affected by all of this. Now, some of the schools closed early today, none of them directly affected by the attacks, of course. But mirroring the overall anxiety and uncertainty in the Washington area, here's what we have right now. These colleges and universities have canceled their classes for tonight. American University, Bowie State, Catholic University, College of Southern Maryland, Columbia Union College, Georgetown University, George Mason University, George Washington University and Law Center, Howard University, Johns Hopkins University, which includes the Baltimore and Washington area campuses, Marymount University, Montgomery College, National Lewis University, University of Phoenix, Maryland, Potomac College, Southern Maryland Higher Education Center, Southeastern University, Stratford College, Trinity College, and also UDC. No classes tonight. Also, local school districts have also canceled evening activities. You should check with your local district. But at this point, the only schools who have notified us that they will be closed tomorrow are Anne Arundel County Public Schools, closed tomorrow, the schools associated with the National Cathedral, which of course includes St. Albans, NCS, and Beauvoir, Potomac School in McLean, and St. Stephen's and St. Agnes in Alexandria. Now some of the schools plan to have counselors on hand to help with the kids. A few other cancel uh, cancellations to pass along. The Kennedy Center has canceled evening performances tonight. All Major League Baseball games canceled tonight, including the O's, and D.C. United soccer game for tomorrow night also canceled. Some of the malls around here were even closed today. Pentagon City, Tyson's, Montgomery Mall, all underscoring just how deeply this tragedy has touched virtually every facet of life here. Back to you. Greta, thank you very much. And we want to reiterate that the cancellations that Greta just mentioned, you can see at the top of the screen, they will be here throughout the hour. Now, those injured in the Pentagon attack were taken to several area hospitals, including Virginia Hospital Center in Arlington. And that's where ABC 7 News reporter Dale Solly is standing by live now with the details there. Dale? Dell, the numbers have been changing, the numbers of people brought in through the course of the day, and unfortunately those numbers, as one might well expect, continue to go up. Just a few moments ago, three more EMS personnel were brought in. That brings to 36 people. 36 people have been brought here. Uh, 14 of them have been admitted. A hospital spokesman told us just a few moments ago that eight of them are currently in intensive care. For everyone here, it has been a harrowing day. This is the Pentagon's official hospital, and the military bombing victims poured in by ambulance and private vehicles alike, stunned survivors of America's Day of Terror. Once we saw the plane and I yelled, that's the last time I saw the plane. We were going the other direction, and uh, there, was no, uh, there was no doubt that uh, it was going to hit the building. And what went through your mind at the time? Uh, fortunately, nothing metallic. Uh, the Pentagon set out a call for blood donors as extra supplies of the stuff arrived. The hospital has implemented its disaster plan, calling in extra medical personnel to handle the crush of new patients. The folks that ended up in the intensive care unit were, were patients who had uh, smoke inhalation predominantly. There were also some trauma uh, in their injuries as well, um, a femur fracture you're already aware of. Uh, several folks were intubated, which means they're placed on respirators or breathing machines. 
and those patients that was done because of significant smoke inhalation. Some of the injuries are life-threatening, others are cuts and bruises and the shock of what they went through. It is much the same at other area hospitals as well. At uh, Washington Hospital Center at Georgetown uh, at Inova Fairfax, much the same scene as well. I will also tell you, Dell and Kathleen, that within the last few moments, we have learned that Arlington County has now declared a state of emergency. And what that does is uh, clear county officials to call for federal assistance. We've not heard any word as far as National Guard's troops, but they have, in fact, declared a state of emergency here in Arlington County as well. So again, the numbers continue to go up. We will continue to stay here, and we will keep you posted. Reporting live in Arlington. Dale Solly, ABC 7 News. Back to you. Dale, thank you. And Arlington County joins a growing list of counties and states that have done similar things. States of emergency are in effect in the district, Virginia, and in the state of Maryland tonight. Maryland Governor Paris Glendinning says that state police there have received some credible threats. Maryland State Police got a list, they say, of 11 sites across the nation that were targets, including the state capitol in Annapolis. The state house, according to the governor, has been evacuated and two of the targeted buildings, we are being told, have been searched. After the Pentagon attack, Virginia Governor Jim Gilmore declared a state of emergency in Virginia, but he says no other Virginia site is known to be threatened. Kathleen? Well, as Dell said, Mayor Anthony Williams declared a state of emergency in the district following this morning's attacks. ABC 7 News reporter Gil Pennybacher is live at D.C.'s Office of Emergency Management with more on how the city is responding. What's the latest from there, Gail? The latest is that the mayor is holding a news conference right now inside the Reeves Center. Kathleen, he is giving the public an update about every hour on the status of this state of emergency. He made the announcement shortly after 1 o'clock this afternoon. It includes enlisting the help of the D.C. National Guard. And ABC 7 News has learned that includes F-16s from the D.C. Air National Guard patrolling the city and having orders to shoot down any unauthorized aircraft. In the meantime, the mayor has been calling for calm in this city despite this state of emergency. And again, you, we're, we're uh, declaring a state of emergency in order to put everyone on alert, in order to uh, ensure that we have the highest level of preparedness. Obviously, if something were to happen, God forbid, and we pray, pray that it won't, uh, we will be fully prepared uh, to then execute uh, the necessary contingency plans. And of course, the mayor says he will keep the public updated on the status of the state of emergency. At this point, D.C. public schools will go to school tomorrow, and D.C. public office buildings will be open. They are in a lockdown status here tonight at the Reeves Center. Reporting live from Washington, D.C., Gail Pennybacher, ABC 7 News. Gail, thanks very much. In order to get people home, area traffic lights were reprogrammed to afternoon rush, and that happened sometime before noon. That's right. Many other roads were actually closed except to emergency vehicles. Now, for more on the traffic situation, we turn to Metro Traffic's Kim Alexander. Tell us what's going on, Kim. A uh, serial scene on a very serial day. Uh, apparently, the mayor's office has just reopened the 14th Street Bridge. You can see a few cars starting to travel across. The state of emergency did the effective uh, job of clearing the streets. Uh, really, downtown, there's not a whole lot going on. Go over to the map, and I'll show you some road closures that we've been dealing with all day. Uh, we had uh, the area around the White House. Okay, we won't go to the map. We've had the area around the U.S. Capitol exit. There we are. The U.S. Capitol building and the White House. The streets were all closed. Apparently, the mayor is uh, picking up some of those road closures, but as far as we know, the George Washington Parkway southbound heading towards uh, National Airport remains closed. Uh, the Memorial Bridge apparently and the Key Bridge have been just opened. Uh, the state of emergency is still under effect, and if it's at all possible, they're suggesting that you don't drive around downtown this evening. The roads around the Pentagon and National Airport obviously still are closed, and we have no way of knowing how long that's going to be in effect. Back to you. Okay. Thank you, Cam. Well, Metro remained uh, open all day, although several of the stations were actually closed. And we're joined on the phone right now by Metro spokeswoman Cheryl Johnson. And Cheryl, first of all, how did the, the evacuation, the people leaving the city, how did that transition take place? Was it orderly? As far as we know, of course, we did get a lot of uh, extra people returning into our system this morning and very early afternoon because, of course, the federal government and the D.C. governments were shut down. Uh, as a matter of fact, we know that we had approximately 90,000 more people entering our system to return home by 12.30 this afternoon, and that's 90,000 more than we would have seen, say, last Tuesday. What were the stations that were closed, Cheryl, and how did you handle that? We were uh, <clears throat> sending trains through the Pentagon Metro Station and through the National Airport Station 
but we were not stopping at those stations to provide service to those stations. We shut down the Pentagon station at uh, 9.45 this morning and the National Airport station at 11.57 a.m. Will those stations be reopened tomorrow, and will Metro be running on a normal schedule tomorrow? We plan to have uh, service tomorrow, the level and kind of service. We don't know at this time because we will be conferring with other agencies, governmental bodies, and uh, to find out just what is going to happen in terms of federal employees returning to work. I just heard you guys announce that the mayor had said, of course, D.C. government employees will be returning to work. So we know we will have some service. What we don't know is, will the Pentagon Station and the National Airport Station remain closed or will they be open? But we should know later on this evening. Cheryl, we'll continue to check in with you. Thanks for the update. And the nation's air traffic, while we were talking about the rails, let's talk about the skies. The nation's air traffic came to a virtual standstill just minutes after the crashes as all planes nationwide were grounded. And at this hour, the airports remain closed. ABC 7 News reporter Sam Ford is live outside National Airport. He has more on that part of the story. Sam? Yes, Dell. Well, a spokesperson for the FAA said that they knew before the first plane hit the first World Trade Center tower that the plane had been hijacked. And within an hour, they had called for a national ground stop that was imposed at 9.30 this morning, closing off all air traffic around the country. And the FAA says it will remain in effect until at least noon tomorrow. The civilian aircraft in this country are grounded with the exception, the FAA said, of a few international flights that had not yet arrived. And of course, Reagan National is closed. No flights at all. Within minutes of the crash into the Pentagon, officials ordered the evacuation of nearby Reagan National Airport, where the smoke from the crash was clearly visible. Minutes later, passengers and employees streamed out. It was watching on the TV in there about the Trade Center and uh, didn't walk out here and see the Pentagon, so I'm sure it's because uh, of terrorist attacks. Groups gathered at the extremities of the airport, away from the main terminal building. One man had arrived earlier from New York, had left by cab, and been brought back. We're driving by the Pentagon when the explosion occurred. Oh, really? And, yeah. So, uh, you cab... on your way here to the airport? No, actually, in a meeting downtown, and the cab driver turned around and said he wasn't going to go down there. So, uh, left me off here, so now I've got to figure out how to get to a motel, like it's like. The airport remained closed except for one small VIP jet, which was escorted to National by a jet fighter. Jet fighters occasionally flew over the airport and Pentagon area. On the George Washington National Parkway, pedestrians streamed near the airport like refugees. Some were evacuees from the Pentagon who'd walked two and a half miles. Left the Pentagon. We passed most of the kids in the nursery and they, they were fine. They were keeping them together. Um, we got on this path and we were trying to walk down to Old Town, but they just closed the path by National Airport. And again, a national ground stop, which means that civilian aircraft are grounded in this country until at least noon tomorrow. And, and I would say that I have some relatives in the Midwest, in Kansas, who they tell me the news there is that a number of the transatlantic flights had to come down right away, and you have lots of airport planes stacked up at places like Wichita and Great Bend. Reporting live from Reagan National Airport, Sam Ford, ABC 7 News. Sam, thank you very much. Well, joining us now to uh, help us understand how the government will investigate this and also respond to the attacks is Robert McFarlane. He's the uh, National Security Advisor to President Reagan. And Mr. McFarlane, this was obviously, uh, you know, the product of a well-planned act of terrorism. You told me earlier you believe Osama bin Laden is behind it. What makes you sure of that? Well, Kathleen, an attack like this is, requires an extremely sophisticated network of communications and the financial means and hardware to position people to be able to carry out the coordinated attack that occurred today. There are only one or two cells with the financial means and the skills and training opportunities to be able to pull something like this off. And uh, Bin Laden is one of the key figures. I asked you earlier on this, this same topic how long it would take for a terrorist group to plan such an attack. And I was actually amazed at your answer because I thought the time period was short. You told me six months. 
Something like this must be rehearsed, planned, contingencies considered, and communications in redundant uh, places established, and uh, it is not an easy thing to do. I want to take you back to 1993 and the first attack on the World Trade Center buildings uh, in which bin Laden and some of his, um, uh, you know, people who worked for him around the world claimed responsibility. Do you see this as finishing up that business? Is that how you view this, this attack today? Well, I think that bin Laden personally would want to demonstrate a, a vindication of this earlier attack and a demonstration to the world of what he will allege is the impotence of the American government. Uh, bin Laden has a fanatical zeal to try to discredit our own government and all Western influence from throughout his region, and yet that 93 attack is something that he wanted to, to, uh, to finish. And of course we have to remind ourselves he was also behind the attacks on the embassies in Africa couple of years ago. I want to ask a question I think that is on the minds of a lot of our viewers. There are a lot of them, but as you're, we were coming in this morning, it, it hit us all the same way. One attack, two attack, then in our own backyard. Can we believe with any degree of certainty that with regards to the attacks, we're out of the woods? We cannot be absolutely certain. Uh, it seems likely that the, the sites that were hit were very purposefully hit to first vindicate the earlier attack and secondly to expose vulnerability of our government here and that has been done clearly. Uh, well, for 25 years the dilemma of American government in trying to preserve freedom of movement for our own people is to deal with this and the fact is that we cannot. Uh, if we're going to cope with this kind of thing in the future we have to go to the source of where it's planned and to go after those who are planning. And briefly, when should we expect to see from the president from a national security standpoint as to the way the plans are planned out when you hold your briefings? Well, the president has done today what a continuity of government plan requires, and he's done exactly the right thing. But he'll convene the National Security Council, and you can expect that there will be a firm plan of action here within a matter of days. Mr. McFarland, thank you very much. Well, as uh, soon as the attack on the Pentagon became known, there was a traffic chaos downtown with uh, the mass exodus out of the city. And ABC 7 News reporter Suzanne Kennedy is live from the mall on more with all that, how that proceeded. Suzanne? Kathleen, it is much like a ghost town down here on the National Mall as it has been for several hours. For the most part, the only people down here are a few tourists who are trying to salvage what is left of this historic and very sad day. Hours ago, thousands of workers who are employees here in the district fled from the heart of this city. It was a mass exodus the likes of which Washington, D.C. has never seen before. It's just chaos. Traffic is just moving at a minimum. It's been gridlock. It's like a snow day. Thousands of people fled the district in the hours immediately following the Pentagon attack. Scared residents trying to get to safety. I'm walking to Chevy Chase to get to a friend's house so then I can get to Rockville. So it's just any way you can get out, basically. Our, our, our managers were just saying, go home, get out, be safe. District police tried its best to control streets clogged with cars. <laughs> Emergency vehicles screamed through traffic to aid those in danger. This is scary and it's important and this is a very devastating kind of uh, attack on ev for everybody. Pretty numbing kind of thing. You just don't know what to do. You just head, head home. And that was the plan for many, who while stuck in gridlock, took a moment to contemplate the magnitude of this day. It felt like we're watching Pearl Harbor. You know, seeing an attack on America this big and who knows what we're gonna do next. The question now for all of those workers who left the district barely halfway through this workday is what will tomorrow be like? Will people be hesitant to return to their offices? We may not have the answer to that question definitively until tomorrow morning's rush hour. Reporting live from the National Mall, Suzanne Kennedy, ABC 7 News. Back to you. Suzanne, thanks very much. We were talking throughout the day. This is a story that's tough enough for us to report to you. but. 
those of us that are parents, what are you supposed to tell your children? Well, we're joined now by child psychiatrist Peter Bregan for some help. I know my own children who see so much news yeah, because right. of my job called up and there was such a tentativeness and nervousness in their voice as they were evacuated from school because that really brought home for, for them the impact of this. In any kind of disaster, the most important thing is the child's relationship with the parents. The feeling the parents are secure, the parents will be there to take care of you, that the parents have some kind of basic answers. It's a time to get closer to your kids. And, and the most difficult things for children under any kind of stress is to feel separated, to feel the parents are overwhelmed, feel the parents can't talk to them. So this is a very good time even working as hard as you are to stay in touch with your children and talk to them on the phone and let them know you're okay and they're okay. Is there going to be a psychological impact on the parents as well? This is the first generation that has not lived through, you know, people that are in their 20s now don't remember Vietnam. They've heard it talked about. They don't remember Pearl Harbor. They've read about it. This is the Pearl Harbor for the baby boomer generation of post-Vietnam. Well, and if we think about Pearl Harbor, it gave meaning to this country. It brought the country together. The country was in a depression at the time. And I think one of the ways that parents should approach this event is to bring them together with their children, to tell them about America, to tell them that this is something that we endure because we stand for values, that we stand for freedom, make it into something positive. You know, the TV was reporting yesterday that a lot of young people don't even know when the Declaration of Independence was signed. Now's the time to talk to your children about what this country stands for, to put it in a context and give it some meaning. This is a story that's going to be inescapable. If turning on any uh, news channel, you'll see it. Washington Post has just come out with a special edition in which this is the incredible banner headline. We're hearing, uh, I'm going to hold that up just a little bit longer. We're going to hear, uh, we are hearing just now that they are talking about a death toll of at least 100 people at the Pentagon. Um, and should you talk about the story in terms of those kinds of details with children? Well, I think you should keep your child company with the story in whatever terms the child's beginning to learn about it. So you want to be asking your kid, what have you heard and what do you know? And then respond to that. And keep in mind that what you want to communicate is that we're still in the safest country in the world, that your child's safe, and that you are safe, and that your relationship is safe, because that's where children ultimately get their security. Based on your past experience, how long does it take, though, before you feel safe? Parents can tell children that you're right. safe, but even for those of us that are living for, through this, how long is it going to be before we feel safe? Well, I think... To feel meaningful maybe is the better answer. I'm glad to be here today. I feel a lot safer here because I'm making a contribution. I'm with people I care about. It's a time for people to connect in every way they can, and in particular with their children. It's probably why we've seen so many people donating blood, too, because people do yes, want to get involved and feel exactly. like they can help. Well, yes. thank you very much for joining us today. Dr. Peter Bregan. Before we return to ABC's coverage of today's events, we want to look at some very telling pictures from New York City. Well, it was really a picture-perfect, beautiful morning in Manhattan with commuters heading for the city as usual and also the city beginning to go about its business. Then the skyline there changed forever. Between 8.45 and 9.03 this morning, two planes crashed into the towers of the World Trade Center, setting them both ablaze before both collapsed in clouds of dust and ash. And then a plane that took off from Dulles would soon crash into the Pentagon. And the death toll here in Washington and New York is still unknown. But New York Mayor Giuliani says his sense is that it is a horrendous number of lives lost. We will be back for a local update at 6 o'clock and then throughout the evening. You can also get the latest information from our website at WJLA.com. But for now, we're going to go back to ABC News coverage and Peter Jennings. Thank you for joining us. Possibility that someone who did this had some time in a, in a simulator. There is a high likelihood uh, that if you were going to plan this again over a period of time, a year or two, uh, that you could, if you were the planning organization, find a way to get your pilots that you want to train into a simulator someplace in the world. There are a lot of 757 and 767 training, or a lot of it available. And, uh, you know, our people train air crews from all over the world, our people meaning in the United States. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily have any clue of what was in their hearts or what they were planning to do if they came in the door from a legitimate carrier or even a private operator of a 757, because there are some private ones out there. Thank you, John. Is there anything else you need By to add? Way, uh, Please, go ahead. 
Yeah, just one other thing. I, this is an unusual situation, and one of the little flags in this, Peter, at this early stage is the fact that we're talking about only 757s and 767s. That is the only combination of big airplanes that have what we call a common type rating. In other words, if you're rated in one, you can fly the other. The cockpits are almost identical. And that may be of no consequence here. It may have simply been coincidental, but it also raises a little flag that maybe we are dealing with somebody who planned this on the basis of having trained for this type of airplane. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed, which uh, certainly speaks to the point that uh, any number of analysts of terrorism, somebody said this morning nobody wants to be described as an expert on terrorism today, as analysts of uh, terrorism and terrorism activity, and who try to monitor it around the world as effectively as they can have said, uh, this was today a very sophisticated operation. We do know now, we believe, that about a hundred people are believed to have been killed or injured in today's attack on the Pentagon. And as John McCrethy from the Pentagon has said to us on several occasions, there is no guarantee that that is the final number. But currently, the information from the Pentagon is that a hundred people are believed to have been killed or injured in today's attack. And you recall that Mayor Giuliani of New York, the closest he has come to, uh, to giving uh, casualty figures, which he's very understandably reluctant to do, that 2,100 people were injured, 600 taken to hospital, 1,500 walking wounded taken to Liberty State Park, which is on the other side of the Hudson River, actually in New Jersey, uh, where the Statue of Liberty, all this in full, full view of the Statue uh, of Liberty, um, and, that, and that various hospitals from New York City all the way to Canada are treating people today who have been somehow injured in this. Now, I want to talk to Lynn Schur, who has been following the, the aircraft all day. That is the American and United Airlines planes involved in these incidents. Lynn? Uh, as you well know, the only video that we've seen of an actual crash was of that second flight. That was the United flight that, uh, that crashed into the second World Trade Tower. What we're going to show you now is some very crude animation of the first flight. That was American Airlines 11. That's the flight from Boston to Los Angeles that went into the first World Trade Tower. What this is is animation based on the track of the plane, uh, data coming from the FAA. You're going to hear Walter Cross, the programmer, uh, describing it. Uh, the flight took an immediate hard left turn due south. Uh, the speed initially decreased uh, by over 100 miles an hour and then uh, increased to over 500. And then as it approached the New York area, it uh, slowed to uh, uh, all the way down to about 300 knots. So it's, and then tragically it impacted in the World Trade Center. American 11 was indeed the first flight. We have confirmed that of the two. And that again, that was the voice of Walter Cross, the programmer who put that animation together. What that shows you is this flight on its way to Los Angeles headed due west and then made that very sharp turn. Mr. Cross also told us that there was an indication of some air violence right before that left-hand turn. Violent changes in airspeed as the plane went off track to head into the World Trade Towers. On that flight, 92 people, not counting the hijacker. And Peter, I've done some very quick calculations. Of course, all of the planes involved in today's incidents were headed to California. Uh, three of them to Los Angeles, one to San Francisco, two had left Boston, one from Dulles, one from Newark Airport. Total number of passengers and crew, 266 people, not of course counting the hijackers. Peter? Thanks very much, Lynn. And, and the, the, the issue of taking off from Boston and Dulles and all headed for, for California, John uh, Miller, uh, raised the subject before, raised the issue before, of whether or not, there well, lots of reasons, and again, we'd be speculating, but he makes the point that, that aircraft taking off from Boston and Dulles outside Washington to go to California would have full loads of fuel on them, thereby creating a far greater explosive potential without having had to have explosives on board and getting them past U.S. security, either at Dulles, Air, Air, at Dulles Airport or at, at Boston. 266 people on the aircraft alone today who have died in this attack on the United States and on the American people. Now, in our control room, somebody says there is a... Let me go first to Bill Blakemore and then perhaps to Joe Torres. 
um, of WABC, our affiliate in New York. Bill Blake, were you there? And I gather you saw number seven come down. Yes, I did, Peter. I'm standing right on the West Side Highway. The skyline of the financial district has changed again. Just a few minutes ago, I was talking to some people. I was facing north. I saw a shock in their face, heard screams spun around, and then we just watched the building fall in it on itself. I believe we have a little bit of tape here. That's, uh, Peter, it was uh, an astonishing thing because the, the civilians who were standing around here were all amazed, but things have become so bizarre down here that the hundreds of firemen who were standing around looked at it, felt a bit shocked, but then just said, well, we're going to have even more work to do. Uh, associate producer Lucy Kerrigan had been over near that building just a little bit earlier, and the policeman had told her that they feared the building was going to come down, that they were evacuating people from around it, so that's one little bit of good news is that there may have been fewer casualties from this latest collapse than there otherwise might have been because they knew of the potential. But it's now um, still a very hot day here. The uh, search and rescue operation is mounting even larger. There are dozens and dozens of fire trucks backed up on the West Side Highway, police trucks. There are what look like hundreds of volunteers who have showed up who have been marshaled by the Red Cross, all with masks to avoid breathing in dusk, but nobody can go in yet. We're still looking at buildings that are on fire down in the center of the financial district, and it's clearly a great deal of devastation. It's uh, not too strong a word at all. It's going to take a while even to assess how bad it is. B Bill, do you have any idea whether or not other buildings in the immediate area are vulnerable at the moment, whether there's concern about any other building as there was about this additional one after the towers? Well, from the angle I'm looking at, um, we can see one other building still on fire, and it seems to be on fire through the length of it. I would estimate that's like a 30 or 40, about a 30 or 40 story building. Uh, the problem for any one of us, of course, is that because of the other buildings down here still standing, which are so tall, you can't get a very clean view of the whole thing from the ground. But there's at least one, and it's clearly uh, going to go on into the night. There's a lot of black smoke pouring out of that building now. Thank you, Bill. Just, we just stay with this photograph for this graphic for just a second. Well, no, there's number seven coming down. When you think that, that, that part of the component of news coverage around the country every year is the excitement and the fun that people get watching an old building being demolished and they wired very carefully for days and it's a very careful operation in order to make sure that a building comes down safely. I think the last one we saw was when they brought down one of the old casinos in Las Vegas. I mean, this is just stunning to see these things come down inside in the case of the two, the north and south. Uh, towers there of the World Trade Center, you know, come down within a couple of hours as a result of the structural damage, weakening that was done when these aircraft hit them. And now, number seven, the World Trade Center, which is, which is 47 stories tall. We're talking with the World Trade Center north and south, 110 stories tall. Um, an eerie experience to be in them at, at the best of times. They sway in the wind and. and and, and people uh, and long had experiences with them, but, but those, and as Bill Blakemore said just a moment ago, the, the, the landscape of New York City has changed one again. And in this instance, it's not New York City, it's not New Yorker cities, it's everybody in the country's city at this moment, because this was an attack on, these, on the United States, no question about it. Everybody said it all day, a declaration of, of war, an act of war against the United States. We've had a number of politicians and commentators, us included, who were reminded that the last time there was an attack like this on the United States was Pearl Harbor, which, in, which finally induced the United States to get fully involved in, in, World, war, in World War II. And we're going to go on all day, and we'll continue throughout the night trying to get some grasp of this. What do we know at the moment? The president is on his way back to Washington. Uh, and uh, we, we're not certain whether he's going to be helicoptered in from Andrews Air Force Base, which is tradition, but the security apparatus is concerned, and so he may come in a motorcade. I can't remember the last time a president went to, went or came from Andrews Air Force Base in a, in a motorcade, even a pres maybe the last time was Bill Clinton. No, I don't even think Bill Clinton at the end of his inauguration went out, but, but there's another example. And the president wants to speak to the nation. And Linda Douglas reports from Capitol Hill that that the, uh, that the leadership in Congress today, tonight, <coughs> wants to have. You have who on the telephone? I didn't know that. I did not know that. I apologize. Thank you. First time I've heard about it. Judge Webster? Yes, Peter. 
I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know you were on the phone. No, this it's is... been very interesting, and I'm, I'm glad to listen. Thank you, sir. This is Judge William Webster, the former director of, of the FBI, on the phone, one of the... And the and, and, and the CIA as well, as, as my friend John Miller points out. Judge Webster, I, maybe you could help us understand many things, but at, at, at the outset, when this happened today, does this overwhelm the FBI and drive the CIA, CIA into some kind of turmoil at the same time? When it happened today, is that your question? Yes, sir. Uh, it seemed to me that they responded uh, quickly. Uh, the FBI's uh, emergency uh, operations centers were in place. Uh, CIA, of course, is going back to its uh, to its intelligence and uh, see what uh, what they had, what they didn't have. Uh, I think what you usually find in a situation like that is grim determination to do a good job. I don't think it's any kind of uh, frustration or uh, frenzy. And as you have watched these events unfold today and perhaps even talk to your colleagues, your former colleagues in the FBI and the CIA. What's your appreciation of this as a whole event? Well, it's an extraordinary event and it, uh, it brings uh, home what we've been saying about the change of terrorism in the last 20 years as it moves from fewer numbers, uh, trying to uh, make a political point to uh, doing extreme damage uh, and uh, this reached a high level of capacity to do damage in that way, and it needs to be addressed as such. Uh, when you think about what has happened today and the tremendous uh, tragedy and calamity, uh, it didn't involve nuclear weapons, it didn't involve biological weapons, uh, it didn't involve equipment, artillery, scuds, or anything. It involved the ability to steal four or five airplanes uh, and to uh, and to send them on a course of destruction. Uh, that's within the capacity of non-governmental organizations uh, such as the kind you've been talking about. And do you believe, Judge Webster, because there's a lot of <coughs> armchair observation today, and I don't mean to include you in that, a lot of armchair observation from many of us, do you believe that this in any way, shape, or form could have been prepared for, if not prevented? You'd like to think that you could prepare for every kind of calamity, but you also like to think that we live in a society that we're very proud of in terms of the freedoms we enjoy, and the freedoms of travel is one of those. Uh, freedom from, uh, from uh, violence is another one to the extent that we can know about it. Knowing is the difficult thing. In, in my years of experience, terrorism was the most difficult because of the cellular nature, cellular nature of uh, decision-making at the top, even the people who are in the organization would not know until the last minute what was going to take place. I hope we can develop uh, better means of uh, profiling the kinds of, uh, of, of uh, people who could do damage, and I'm not talking about highway racial profiling, or anything. I'm talking about looking for people that fit profiles of, of behavior. Uh, that would be more helpful. As I listen to you say that, Judge Webster, I think about Timothy McVeigh. Nobody had Timothy McVeigh down as a profile. No, they didn't. <laughs> in, they had... in Oklahoma City. And many of the profiles we do seem to be the obvious ones. Uh, yep. yeah, pick on a member of a developing nation because the nation is antagonistic, or the group because it's antagonistic to the United States. I mean, is this the most efficient way to do it? No, no. I think uh, that was just one of the things that we're trying to say, should, do, should we tighten up? It's not clear to me that we don't know enough yet to draw any firm conclusions about whether or not people were able to w walk on board those airplanes with weapons that pass through the screening devices. We just don't know yet. We shouldn't draw conclusions about that. But I think we have to, we have to be sure that we have done everything we can to know in advance. Getting there before the bomb goes off is the ultimate objective. And uh, it requires a lot of cooperation now internationally. We have to share information with uh, our friends around the world about movements of people who are believed to be bent on violence. It's, it's a very tough assignment, uh, and it's one in which we can see now we're going to have to have uh, tighten our, uh, our belts because I think, again, when the uh, reports of the, the, uh, the, the casualties is finally released, it's going to be a lot more than anybody expected and probably... Uh, will be more or at least approximate the size. We haven't had anything like it since Pearl Harbor. Judge Webster, I don't mean to make you the target of criticism today. It's not my intention at all. But as I listen to you talk about we've got to tighten our belt and our defenses, it, it's what we hear after almost every incident of terrorism. And I wonder what you think as you've listened and watched today, 
what you think more could be done that the United States hasn't been doing up until now that is humanly possible in a free society? I think we've been, I think we've been very educated and sophisticated in knowing what we needed to do. The counter-terrorist counter centers that have been formed to be sure that information is properly recognized and passed along to the people. Those are things that can, in an evolutionary way, can be improved. Human intelligence, of course, is what everyone will call for now, and we should have it. Uh, but we shouldn't fool ourselves that it's something we can automatically take off the shelf and put in place in terrorist organizations. At the, to at the time that human intelligence, human, you call it in your trade, was, yes. was, was downgraded as part of the national effort against terrorism, were you supportive of it being downgraded? Now, actually, that was before I came on board. It seems to me that we've been trying ever since 1978 to improve, uh, or at least 1980, to improve the quality of human intelligence. And in some cases, we were very successful. I recall the the ability in the Armenian terrorist incidents in the early 19, late 1970s and 80s, we were able to get there and interdict the bombs, one in San Francisco, one in Los Angeles, uh, one uh, with explosives en route to New York, and the other in Canada. Uh, we know what we need to do, and in some cases we can do it, but we're dealing with some very, very powerful and sophisticated competition here. Judge Webster, I just have, I'm very grateful for you joined us. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, but I have one more question for you. Whenever there's, a, whenever there's a debate or a discussion about the freedom of Americans and the freedom of movement Americans should enjoy under these circumstances, the director of the FBI is always right there at the center. And there's always a debate that there's always an inclination to think that you and the FBI, you want to make it tougher for Americans to move about because it's easier for you to do your job under those circumstances. What's your message to the American people today about retaining their freedoms in the face of this kind of enemy? I think the message is that we can't have a pendulum swinging back and forth from repression to uh, anarchy. And I think we've done a pretty good job of finding that center, which uh, Edmund Burke 300 years ago called ordered liberty. Mm -hmm. We need to have liberty, but it has to be one accompanied by order. And professionals are very willing to do their job under court orders and the appropriate procedures. All that they ask is that they not be unduly burdened uh, by uh, restrictions that, that in, in times like this get in the way of finding the culprits and bringing them to justice. Judge Webster, thank you very much for giving us the time. We'd like to hear from you later on. So. We're very grateful to you at the moment. Thank you. Two things the judge said Thank which... You, welcome, sir. Uh, two things uh, the judge says which just leap off the page, John Miller, to me. Clearly, one is the Edmund Burke quote when he talks about liberty. It has to be ordered liberty. And the other, in terms of talking about the capacity of the terrorists today, said there were no scuds involved. There was just the capacity to steal four planes. And <clears throat> we had talked earlier about airline security. How do you get a gun on an airplane? Um, unconfirmed reports from these cellular phone calls that were made to 911 from one of the flights uh, saying that uh, a flight attendant had been stabbed. Uh, perhaps they didn't have a gun. Um, certainly the, uh, the GAO and the General Accounting Office of right. Congress uh, and the FAA and uh, airline securities consultants have demonstrated over and over again that uh, if you're careful enough and you plan it, you can get a weapon onto a plane. And they've demonstrated exactly how, which I won't describe here for obvious reasons. Right. So um, this is security that's designed to harden the target, the airplane. Um, certainly, uh, there's no such thing as total security there. And terrorism, I mean, if you look at this most incredible, unprecedented, historic act of terrorism, mm -hmm. it still harkens back to what we see in the World Trade Center, Oklahoma City, the embassy bombings. Uh, we talk about the level of sophistication in planning, maybe, but the actual act is usually very low tech. A bomb made of uh, fertilizer. Uh, fertilizer and fuel oil, things you can look up and buy on the internet, uh, hijacking an airplane, uh, perhaps even with sharpened instruments. Um, now, the aspect that there may have been people trained to fly these planes, mm. that's a new wrinkle. That is a new uh, Certainly on, on conventional hijacking. I can give you an update from the scene as please, things are developing please. there. Um, if there can be any good news about a day like today, the collapse of Seven World Trade Center, the building they were so worried about injuring rescue workers, has freed up um, rescue workers to now go into the area. And they are moving in in groups of 20 and 50 as their teams are designated. 
Um, so the, the lead... principal danger, the principal danger to the rescue and recovery the, teams has been eliminated. The so biggest danger has literally removed itself. Right. Um, one of the first teams going in is uh, a team of tow trucks, which is literally going to pull uh, rigs that are uh, fire trucks, police trucks that are buried in rubble out of the way so that they can clear a path and bring in other vehicles. And uh, they've requested uh, a number of dogs. Additionally, 100 just, doctors... Just, I'm sorry to keep interrupting. Sure. Explain why they want dogs. Um, they, uh, they want bloodhounds, cadaver dogs, the kind of dogs that can climb up in the rubble with them and, and catch the scent of people um, that they can dig for in such a, such a big pile of rubble. It is a strange name for specialty, but there are indeed things called cadaver, cadaver dogs. Anybody who called it the Condit investigation know that they were used in, and et cetera. Come on, right. Uh, 100 doctors, 100 nurses are, are standing by uh, the main police facility that is now the command post for the NYPD, mm -hmm. not police headquarters, but a, an off-site location further up in the Midtown, um, has them standing by waiting for, the, for somewhere to send them. And uh, essentially, this, uh, this long operation, uh, which will be the longest night for New York's rescue workers, has just begun. And thank you, John. And Cynthia McFadden, uh, I believe, is now at Chelsea Piers, a large sports entertainment complex on the west side of Manhattan, or at least close to it, which, Cynthia, I, is, was described earlier as a makeshift morgue. Is that really what it's going to be? No, it's not, Peter. What they've decided to do here is make this the triage center. We've been told that all victims now who are taken out of the blast site are going to be taken here first. They'll be tagged before they got, get here, uh, determine what the severity of their condition is, and then once they arrive here, uh, it'll be, they'll be treated initially and then sent on to other hospitals. I should also tell you that inside this has been described to me, I, you can see behind me, uh, ambulances. What you can't see probably is that there are probably 200 or 250 ambulances lined up here on the west side highways uh, waiting. These are empty ambulances waiting to distribute patients or potential victims all over the tri-state area to hospitals. And Peter. Inside, uh, it's been described, we, we got a look inside earlier, it really looks like a MASH unit. It's 50 operating suites set up, hundreds of doctors and nurses here to treat the wounded. They have been here, standing here for hours now. There are no patients here yet. Uh, the latest estimate is that there won't be any people here for several more hours. Mm. Uh, what we're told is, and I was just listening to John Miller, uh, part of the problem initially was that when the first rescue workers went in, and we've talked to some of them who have, some, some of the second wave of rescue workers, the first wave of rescue workers who went in were trapped, many of them killed by the second blast. And so when the second workers came out, many of whom are now here, um, uh, they, they wouldn't allow anyone back in the area, which is why there aren't any mm. patients here at the moment. Well, I, I, Cynthia, let me just go a little farther with that. You say 250 ambulances are standing around waiting to pull people out. You'd be talking about pulling people out of the rubble at this point. Uh, the mayor said, the mayor reminded people across the country, there are 170 hospitals in New York City, and aside from St. Vincent's, the principal nearest hospital, <laughs> which lost, among other things, its emergency power, I think, and lost its gas operating facility at the time, wasn't it, John? Uh, that was uh, Beekman downtown, or New York infirmary, that right. lost its steam power. Uh, St. Vincent's then actually had to bear the brunt of this. And, and so people have gone directly to the hospital. I don't quite understand, C Cynthia, the, the who's going to come to Chelsea Piers unless, until they begin to rescue people, hopefully, from the rubble itself. Peter, the, the initial thought, and of course, as you know, we've, we've, been to, we've been to Bellevue today, a couple of other places. There have been hundreds of people at area hospitals, as you note, but they don't believe that anywhere near the full weight of this has yet been uncovered, that there are, are hundreds and thousands of people who have been injured in this blast, and that's the people that they expect to bring here. Okay. The, uh, St. Vincent's is saturated at this point. They're intending, now, whether this happens, but the emergency medical services that's running this medical operation intends to bring no more patients directly to hospitals. They will all be brought here first for medical attention and for triage out to other hospitals. I have declared a state of emergency in the District of Columbia. I ask your cooperation and full support during this critical period. America Under Attack, a special report from ABC 7 News. 
This has been a day of epic tragedy for the United States. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Kathleen Matthews. And I'm Maureen Bunyan. Tonight there is still no telling how many hundreds or thousands of people have been killed in what is no doubt the worst act of terrorism on American soil. It began just before 9 o'clock this morning in New York City when two planes crashed into the World Trade Center. Around 10 o'clock, another plane hit the Pentagon, killing about 100 people. And a fourth plane crashed in Pennsylvania. ABC 7 News reporter Carol Costello takes a look at the terrible chain of events. Do you know who all these people are? See no evil, hear no evil. How come you left the state police? You know, you got a chance right now to walk away. <laughs> 